Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 10.30 a.m. public mm -hmm. portion of the closed session of the August 27th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council mem members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for a closed session. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Present. Lover? Present. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? I'm not hearing it currently. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any of the items on closed session agenda? Me? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to our courtyard conference room where the council will go into its closed session. We're ready. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 12.15, now 12.25 p.m. session of the August 25th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Present. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Go ahead and ask our clerk to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Public for which it stands. So we'll go ahead and have an opportunity now to have some introductions of new employees. And we'll um, go ahead and start with our interim assistant city manager and director of IT, uh, Laurel, Laura Schmidt, who will introduce um, Ralph. Thank you very much, um, uh, oh, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, Laura Schmidt, the Interim Assistant City Manager. I'd like to introduce Ralph Demericott. He is our new Principal Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. Ralph received his Bachelor of Arts in Asian Studies and a Master's in Public Administration from San Diego State University. His professional experience includes serves as a, serving as a community representative and communications advisor for a few assembly members and state senators, as well as director of communications, senior policy advisor, and most recently the deputy chief of staff to the city of San Diego's city council president. He moved to Santa Cruz three months ago, welcome, with his dog Mars. <laughs> and they are having a great time settling into their new apartment in Seabright, as well as going to our local par uh, dog parks and taking advantage of all the different things to do in Santa Cruz. Please welcome Ralph. Welcome Ralph. Thanks for jumping right in. Okay, we'll go ahead and next invite up our director for the library, Susan Nimitz, to introduce her new employee. Thank you, Mayor. I'm so excited to be able to introduce Philip Garcia. We were lucky enough to steal him from the Salinas Public Schools. He's working for our library IT department as a library IT specialist one. Um, he lives in Salinas with his wife and is interested in cars amongst many other things. I just have to say, one of the reasons we hired him is because we heard you won employee of the month a lot. <laughs> Please welcome Philip. Um. Welcome Philip. I'll go ahead and now see if our Director for Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, wants to come up and introduce her new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. It is my pleasure to introduce Allie Cameron. Um, Allie first joined the city as a temporary worker last December and has recently been hired full-time as economic development coordinator, and we're really excited to have her here permanently. Allie is responsible for managing our trolley program, uh, facade improvement and signage programs, and she's actually, actually just 
just went through a whole streamlining process, which has been great, and working with about 12 to 15 awardees mm -hmm. about. Um, she helps manage our communication strategy with our ED team, including social media, um, and is a grant writing guru. Some of you have already had the opportunity to work with Allie on some grant opportunities. Allie comes to us from CSUMB. She was a program officer for grant development, supporting faculty and staff in their submissions process, budgeting all RFPs. And she's recently been working on several grants here at the city, including with the Economic Development Administration for our local sports industry cluster study, and through the National League of Cities um, on the Innovation Ecosystem Grant Opportunity. She was born in Minnesota, um, went, to, went to school there, um, and went to graduate school at Monterey Institute. Um, and she's I've definitely worked on peace building in the environment, lived abroad, done a variety of really interesting things. She loves nature and dance. You can actually attend one of her yoga or Zumba classes. And uh, she, at, she teaches at 24 Hour Fitness. And um, she has a, a Zoom Valley, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Zoom Valley um, channel on YouTube. Um, so it has quite a following. Um, she also, these are just so interesting, I had to share it. She also raises savannas um, and is looking for foster families. A savanna is a cross between a serval and a tabby cat. Um, they're amazingly um, exciting and beautiful um, cats and very personable. She's lived in Santa Cruz for a year and a half and she lives downtown. Her favorite thing about Santa Cruz is entrepreneurial spirit. People here make things happen. Um, her favorite natural spot is Neary Lagoon. So I always like to say, what's your favorite park? Um, working at the city, she loves a variety of work and has been really inspired since she's been here working with the local business owners, innovators, and entrepreneurs. So welcome, um, join me in welcoming Allie. Welcome, Allie. Okay. So we'll go ahead and now ask our Director of Public Works, Mr. Mark Settle, to come up and introduce him. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. It's my pleasure to introduce Robert Domingo. Robert is our new Environmental Microbiologist 3. And Robert started with us at the wastewater treatment facility as a temporary worker, and, and we're happy to have him on as a, a full-time position. What, Ro what Robert focuses on is testing the plant process water and local, and local waterways for microbiology presence and effect on living organisms. So it's important to check our wastewater and make sure that we're getting correct treatment. Um, Robert was born in Redwood City and is raised in San Mateo. He currently lives um, in Midtown and he is, his parents and siblings still live in the Bay Area. Uh, his past work experience recently is he was doing freelance uh, electroplating, which is kind of interesting. And he received a BS in neuroscience from UCSC. Um, when he's not working, he likes, he spends time doing uh, music production and, and playing disc golf up at um, De La Viega. And any other f fun facts? He says he can ride his bike without using the handlebars, but w we kind of had a, had a discussion about not doing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, please join me in welcoming Robert. As long as you wear your helmet. <laughs> okay. So um, I'd like to now invite up Director of Water, and we have Rosemary Menard introducing her name, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you. All right, I'm uh, here to introduce today Liz Douster. She's a new water quality technician and the theme song of today's introductions is somebody starts the temp and then we hire them full time. So uh, Liz came to us as a temp 
She had a great experience working for the Santa Clara Valley Water District where she really discovered her passion for uh, freshwater eco ecology and field sampling, sampling techniques, which is what she um, sort of focused on with her UCSC um, science and uh, ecology and evolutionary biology, that's her degree. So she has some things in common with some folks up there, I'm sure. Um, she is, uh, she did work at Berkeley College before uh, moving to UCSC and she's worked in the hospitality and legal industries. Like I said, she moved to, uh, she did some work as an intern at Santa Clara Valley Water District and that really gave her a trajectory to work uh, with us. She is um, living in Felton and when she's not working, she loves to kayak, garden and go on road trips. So please welcome Liz. Welcome, Liz. Nice group of new hires, so welcome all to the city. Okay, so we'll go ahead and now move on to our presentation uh, portion of today's meeting. And I um, have a couple of proclamations and then we'll have a presentation from our uh, water director. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, uh, declaring and having the first presentation on Muslim Appreciation Month. I know that some of the folks need to leave, so we'll go ahead and start with your presentation and then proclamation. So please come forward. Hello, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for honoring the state's designation of August being Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month. Uh, so this is actually the fourth year that um, this proclamation um, or that uh, this de designation has occurred with the state of California. And so we appreciate that Santa Cruz um, has, uh, um, has is presenting this proclamation again. I know that um, your city did so last year, so we truly appreciate it. Um, it's especially important during the Um, all right, so um, it's especially important, uh, you know, given kind of the state of affairs that we're in right now, um, when you have, <laughs> I think it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna try with this one. Um, so, I mean, I think these des these proclamations are especially important, especially given you know the the current climate that we're in right now with the divisive rhetoric from you know the highest office all the way down, and to have our local level, our city councils, our um, counties uh, recognize the Muslim community as part and parcel of our greater community, it, it, it truly means a lot. Um, you know, Muslims have um, built this country um, since even before this country even existed. We've been part of this, um, of the founding of this country. We are your doctors, your lawyers, your, you know, we we have uh, your civil rights advocates, your chefs, your taxi drivers. We are what makes this country, or we what are helping make this country run. Um, and so, to again, to have the city of Santa Cruz um, recognize uh, the this Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month, we truly appreciate it. So, thank you so much. And we're going to have um, somebody, a representative from the Islamic um, Center of uh, Santa Cruz. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, City of Santa Cruz. We're really appreciative of this recognition, so thank you. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention and to our kind of collective awareness in this gathering what I and my Muslim community have been feeling, which is the impact of Islamophobia on our community here in Santa Cruz and the Bay Area as a whole. Uh, Muslim women, myself included, ha wear their religion on their heads and can feel intimidated walking the streets, even in this liberal bubble that is the Bay Area. Sometimes it can be an unfriendly stare in a shopping mall, a racist comment, or even an intimidating approach while at the streets, mall, or a hospital. Um, a new study released by CARE shows that 53% of all Muslim students have faced bullying at school, and which m what is uh, must much worse is that 38% of those students have actually experienced bullying at the hands of their teachers or professors. Um, <laughs> 
Also, many employees have filed and won lawsuits against their employers based on religious discrimination. We ask of you as our representatives to speak up when you hear the rhetoric that will add more confusion and conflict to our city. We ask of our civic leaders to encourage the community to stop being distracted by headlines, to call out what happens to a mosque as a hate crime instead of simply a dispute and to have the courage instead of waiting for others to take action. Um, and again, on behalf of the um, Santa Cruz Muslim community, thank you for this recognition. Thanks. Thank you for being here and for your presentations and for so articul articulately phrasing um, exactly the importance of these actions on behalf of our local government to make a difference. So um, I have the honor of having a proclamation. I'll read a few of the whereases and then I'll come down and hand it to you. So whereas freedom of religion holds distinction as a cherished right and a fundamental value upon which the law and ethics of the United States are based. And whereas in 1996, the Islamic Center of Santa Cruz was, was established and serves the spiritual and cultural needs of the Muslim community in Santa Cruz, hosting Islamic activities, seminars, and workshops, and encouraging civic participation and responsibility. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz seeks to further embrace its diverse community and afford all residents the opportunity to better understand, recognize, and appreciate the rich history and shared princ principles of American Muslims. Now, therefore, I, Martine Watkins, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of August 2019 as American Muslim Appreciation and Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz. We'll go back to the other presentation we have today, which is a um, presentation declaring uh, September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And I believe we have Sue from uh, Creative Director from Jacob's Heart here. Is that correct? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. I'm here today from Jacob's Heart. Um, and super happy to announce again um, the proclamation of September Cancer Awareness Month. Um, for those of you who don't know about Jacob's Heart, I'd like to share just a little bit about it. Uh, Jacob's Heart Cancer, Children's Cancer Support Services exists to improve the quality of life for children with cancer and to support their families and the challenges they face. Every caring person can appreciate the physical and emotional devastation that occurs when a child is diagnosed with cancer or dies after a long treatment. Community support makes sure local children with cancer and their whole family has a ride to treatment, a house to live in, food to eat, counseling, support, and love. Jacob's Heart services and programs are offered in Spanish and English. They're provided at no cost and are generously funded from our local community. So 21 years ago, Lori Butterworth founded Jacob's Heart when there was a need. Um, a friend of hers, uh, son Jacob, was diagnosed with cancer. And one of the things that we um, like to share is a quote of Angel, Jacob's mother. When Jacob was first diagnosed, I remember someone saying that God never gives you more than you can handle. I never thought I could ever believe that again. What I've learned is you can handle anything if you don't have to handle it alone. So thank you again, Santa Cruz City Council for supporting Jacob's heart, making sure no family goes through childhood cancer alone. 
And we do have um, an event coming up in September. Uh, it's at Watsonville City Plaza. It's called Kid Rageous. It's the 21st annual, annual event honoring the um, kids with cancer and the memory of kids with cancer. Uh, it's a day of family fun. There's music, dance, games, arts and crafts, and great food. So we welcome you to join us there. Um, thank you again. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation, but more importantly, thank you for your work for the families that are needing your service in our community. So I too have a, a proclamation for you. So whereas the character of our community is revealed in how we treat our most vulnerable, and whereas each year one in 285 children in our community are diagnosed with cancer, and whereas Jacob's Heart's Children's Cancer Support Services hold, holds the memories and honors the legacies of hundreds of children from our local community who have been lost to cancer, ensuring that their precious memories will never be forgotten. And whereas it is important for all Santa Cruz residents to recognize the impact of childhood cancer on families within our community and honor the lives of children in our community whose lives have been cut short by cancer. So now, therefore, I, Martine Watkins, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2019 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz. And I encourage all citizens to join me in honoring Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for its 21 years of outstanding support to our community and acknowledging its contributions to Childhood Cancer Awareness Month honoring children with cancer in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue, and it's always a tough one, and it's a pleasure to be able to bring awareness to it. So. My first time in front of you. Well, welcome. Great job, <laughs> and thank you for, for your work. <laughs> So I'll go ahead now and switch over to our presentation on the Mid-County Groundwater Agency Groundwater Sustainability Plan. And we have Rosemary Menard here. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm, I'm here really today to give you a very brief overview of a lot of really great work that's been going on in dealing with uh, groundwater sustainability. And so I'm gonna, that's gonna be very short and sweet, but um, I think we have a lot to celebrate about the collaborative process that has generated the work that you're gonna hear very briefly about. So the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is a, a state law. It was uh, required that we establish a groundwater sustainability agent, there, agency. There are two in the north, mid and northern part of the county. One is the Mid-County Groundwater Basin we're gonna hear about today. The other one's in the Santa Margarita Basin, and that we prepare a groundwater sustainability plan for the Mid-County Basin by 2020 because it's a basin that's been in <coughs> critical overdraft. The sustainability plan has to lay out a plan to uh, bring the basin into sustainability by 2040 and to maintain it for 50 years after that in sustainability. So for the Mid-County Basin, the main issues have been maintain the groundwater elevations, prevent seawater intrusion, and protect groundwater dependent ecosystems. So um, that's what you're gonna sort of hear a little bit more about. This is the basin boundary. This um, sort of this blue line that goes around here is the uh, hydrogeologic uh, basin boundary. You can see that parts of the city limits are in this boundary, but the vast majority of the city is not in the boundary. Uh, Live Oak, Soquel, Capitola, parts of Aptos are in the, ba uh, the boundary down here to La Selva Beach and the uplands areas as well. Um, this is a, a chart that just shows 
how groundwater is used and who's using how much, you can see that the SoCal Creek Water District, which is a, a groundwater agency and all of its water has come from groundwater historically, is using about you know 60% of the total water. Um, Santa Cruz uses about 9%, the Central Water District about 7%. Um, the 9% that Santa Cruz uses is about 5% of our total supply. So that's a, from the belt system that you probably heard us talk about. Private well owners, small water systems, institutional, that's mainly uh, Cabrillo College, um, and then some agricultural use. So this is the sort of characteristics of the groundwater use in the basin. Uh, this is a pretty wordy slide, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but this is a history of the groundwater management planning that's been going on. Really, even before the sustainable groundwater management, there was quite a bit of um, planning. But the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act gave local agencies uh, some new tools and some new requirements to work with that have been really important in thinking about how we're going to implement and how we're going to regulate groundwater use in the future. So that's a major issue we're talking about in both the Santa Margarita Basin and in the Mid-County Basin. The draft of the plan, which is required to be submitted to um, the state at the end of January of 2020 for the Mid-County Basin, was published in um, July of 2019. It's open for public comment right now. And uh, it is going to be the subject of a um, public hearing at the Groundwater Management Agency. Board. We'll go ahead and maybe pause for a second, just because of the, um, <laughs> the microphones. Bonnie, Bonnie, do we have support here? Do we want to take a pause here for a moment and we'll get a little bit of uh, audio support here before we move forward? Does that sound good? Yeah. Go ahead and take Okay, sorry, Rosemary. We're going to have to put a little pause on your presentation while we figure it out. You can stare at the list here of the chapters. <laughs> I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> Spark our interest.
Is that better? Touch your mic. Okay, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the uh, pause here. Great job for uh, identifying the problem. Sorry about that. We'll go ahead and hand it back over to Rose. Very good. Um, the, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan has a very explicitly described and regulated uh, table of contents. This is the high level overview of it. I think the main things that we're gonna, that you wanna know about is uh, chapter three, which is the sustainable management criteria. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, I think. And then projects and management actions have to be identified at plan uh, implementation and including the finances for how it's gonna get done. So the plan includes all of these elements. Um, the, there are six sustainability uh, indicators that have to be addressed in a groundwater management plan. And for this particular basin, the Mid-County Basin, the land subsidence is not an issue. It's not an issue in the Santa Margarita Basin either. We don't have the hydrogeology here that's similar to say in the Central Valley where land subsidence is a big issue. Um, but the big issue in this basin has been seawater intrusion and the threat of seawater intrusion one of the major ways that we're dealing with this is to think about um, how to maintain protective groundwater elevations at the coast. So you can see that this map sort of gives some indications of places where seawater intrusion is an issue. There's quite a lot of detail in this map and I'm not gonna go all the way through it, but there are typically monitoring wells all along the coastline here and there are some places where we know that seawater intrusion has historically come on shore by uh, measuring water quality um, parameters, including chloride levels of the, in these monitoring wells. And in La Selva Beach area, there's been quite a bit of um, over pumping there and the geology there I think has really resulted in seawater intrusion coming on shore there. But the general strategy is to establish and maintain protective um, groundwater elevations along the coast and all the monitoring wells, and also be monitoring uh, carefully for chloride levels so that we have action plans to put in place when and, and if we see um, chloride coming on shore from seawater intrusion. Um, fundamentally, the projects and management actions group includes some baseline things that we've been doing. This includes water conservation. It's quite a lot of um, really strong conservation ethic in this basin and actually in the whole uh, parts of Santa Cruz County that I'm familiar with anyway. So that's a major element of maintaining the sort of demand on the groundwater resources to be kind of stable and um, declining over time on a per capita basis. And then uh, for the sort of projects we need to implement in order to ensure sustainability, for sure the, the Pure Water SoCal project is on that list, as well as water transfers and exchanges and aquifer storage and recovery by the city would be another um, item using sort of sor surface water from our San Lorenzo sources. We do have another list and you can see it in the plan if you're interested of additional measures that could be taken in the event that we don't reach sustainability and the measures that are have been identified. I just wanna give you this one example. This is a result from a groundwater modeling. And so I'm gonna get quick, uh, give you a, a, a sort of a baseline. This is the baseline in the current well. This is a deep uh, aquifer under the sort of one of the deepest ones. This is a particular monitoring location. The current groundwater elevations of that location is here. The minimum threshold that we've established for that uh, particular site is these dotted lines, or this dashed line here. The measurable objective is here. And what you can see is with the Pure Water Soquel project, that uh, base level comes up. And with a combination of the Pure Water Soquel and the city's aquifer storage and recovery process, that comes up uh, even more. So these are the strategies and the very specific tools that we've been using to establish what the measures need to look like and kind of how we need to operate them over time. And the couple of things just for you to know, there's a, there's a public meeting tomorrow at the Simpkins Family Swim Center, starts at 7 p.m. It's a Q&A session that the staff will be there available to talk to folks who have questions. I mentioned the September 19th public hearing comment period closes, and it's not a SQL-like comment period, it's just more of a general comment period. And then the plan is for uh, the, the amended plan as, as a result of the public comments and other feedback to come in 
come back to the groundwater agency on um, November 21st and then be submitted in advance of the end of January deadline. The city has two members on the groundwater sustainability board. Council members Matthews is a member and has been involved in the group since the, kind of the beginning of that, of the uh, Santa Cruz uh, SoCal Aptos groundwater management committee that sort of created the groundwater sustainability agency and then uh, water commissioner david baskins as a and that's the second member and with that if you have any questions happy to answer them any of the council members have questions for rosemary okay seeing none thank you very much for the update and for all the good work that you do okay so we'll go ahead now and move on to um the uh, announcements portion of the meeting. So I um, have a few announcements and then we'll get to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us an opportunity to review the email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to have been made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens um, when you're inside and outside of our council chambers. I'd like to now ask if there are any council members who have statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. I'll go ahead and see uh, if our city clerk has any additions or deletions. I don't. So I have a brief announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. this evening. I'll go ahead and look to our city attorney to now report on closed session. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Uh, city council convened in closed session this morning at 10.30 a.m. to uh, consider the following items. Item A was liability claims, which are the claims of Ronald E. Chinitz, Allison Sales, Jocelyn Sales, Robert Sales, Emery Doyle Schofield, and Ray Arthur Weeks. Those um, are also listed today as item eight on your consent agenda. There was no action taken in closed session. Council also met with and gave instructions to its real property negotiator concerning the properties at 700 River Street, uh, five, 550 to 580 River Street, and 600 to 650 River Street. Um, council gave instructions to its negotiator. Uh, there was no reportable action. Council received a status report and gave direction to the city attorney on item C, uh, pending litigation. That's the matter of Hatch Pomerantz versus, Hatch and Pomerantz versus the city of Santa Cruz. Um, council also met with labor negotiators, uh, including the group's uh, supervisors, OE3, executives, police management association, fire, and uh, police officers association. Um, the supervisors and police management association uh, matters are also listed on your consent agenda as items 10 and 11. Uh, lastly, but there was no other um, reportable action taken. Uh, lastly, the, the council conducted a performance evaluation of the city attorney and of the city manager. There was no reportable action. I'll go ahead and now ask if our city manager, uh, Martin Bernal, has any updates he'd like to provide. Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to just give you an update on two items that uh, 
uh, and that is the uh, golf course uh, operations plan and the um, Harvey West Pool uh, plan. Those are items that the council asked that we bring back to you during budget deliberations. The original plan was to bring them back today because, uh, however, because of the number of items on the agenda and also to provide the opportunity to have the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission to review those items. They'll be before you on September 24th and they'll be before the Parks and Recreation Commission on September 9th. So I just wanna let you know about those items. Thank you for the update. Okay, we'll go ahead and now see if our uh, city clerk has any updates to the calendar for our upcoming meetings. I do not know. Mayor, I would uh, make a motion that we um, move the calendar to the end of this uh, of the afternoon agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second uh, to move the, the item to the afternoon to the end of the afternoon agenda. Any further discussion? Any uh, public comment? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, that fails with Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown voting in support, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, so we have no updates to the calendar at this time. So we'll go ahead and move on to our consent agenda. And those are items three through 23 on our agenda today. And they'll be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull an item? Council member Brown. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor. And this, I just wanna say this is, uh, I'd like to pull item 14. This is in response to a request from a member of the public uh, and uh, concerns addressed to the entire council, which we received uh, kind of late in the game, but I did wanna make sure that we um, address them. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I had a comment on item number 12. Okay, any other items to be pulled from consent? Same, same thing, uh, comment on item number 12. So. Comment on item number 12. Um, nine, just a question. Okay, so at this time we have only item number 14 pulled from our consent agenda, is that correct? Uh, number five, I thought the vice mayor, you weren't gonna talk about number five? He had a comment, but he didn't pull it. Oh. Are you pulling item number five? No, I'll pull it then. Okay. Okay. We'll go ahead and um, then go ahead and look for the comments on items that are on our consent agenda other than items number five and 14. Is there a comment on any items other than five and 14 from council members? Councilmember Glover. Yeah, it's more just a question um, with regards to the tree services. There was some uh, curiosity just within the public as to what our average tree service use is and why it's so high. Around 200,000, I believe. So our average, so anyone here that can speak to that from staff? Are you speaking to item number 12 on our consent agenda? Nine, I believe. Yeah, okay. under nines for award contracts for city purchases. Yeah, yeah the tree services. What last is here? Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, I'm here to discuss the uh, the high cost of the community tree service and Lewis Tree Service. Um, these are the two firms that um, our Parks Department has specified um, are the best value for the types of services that they provide in different terrain. Um, our Parks Department uh, and our Arborist uh, authorize tree work um, at different times of the year, sometimes to um, to mediate um, fire hazards and uh, also natural disasters as well. Um, so we employ these two companies to work on all around the city. Um, so we, we've gone out to bid for these services in the past and these two um, service, these two companies have provided the greatest value to the city and are able to um, act in a swift manner in emergency situations. Thank you. Any other, any other questions from the council on this item? Thank you for being here and answering the questions. And there was another comment or question for item number 12. So for item number 12, um, regarding the RFP announcements, I was just um, 
it's not really clear when these go out oftentimes for city council members and I was just gonna just make the comment potentially the recommendation that um, that when RFPs go out if there's a, a is a, if there's a possibility for city council members to receive emails so they can share it with the broader public in case there's um, agencies or institutions, companies that we may know of that we may want to forward these on to and members of the community as well. Somewhat of a process question. Yeah, Alex, I think you can answer that. You might be receiving a lot of emails, so. <laughs> uh, back again. Um, so our RFPs are always posted on our external website and are available to the public. Uh, they're never not available to the public at any time. So all, all RFPs and IFPs are posted on our website, and we post all addenda on the at, on the same pages, and they're available for anyone to participate on. We don't uh, prohibit competition, uh, so there it's maximum participation is encouraged. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay. And is there any other questions or comments on our consent agenda items aside from items five and 14, which have been pulled? 12, um, a question about um, when you're using the GIS technology to look at the tree canopy, how much human um, interaction with that goes into it? Like, are, are there many humans out there also counting trees? Are there areas where they put people to count trees? So a question, I guess, around clarification around how um, how many people are involved in the tree counting process. Does that summarize I think, it? I think I might be able to clarify it. Okay. Whether or not there's a ground truth thing going on uh, in addition to the GIS mapping. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Tiffany Wise, a sustainability and climate action manager. So you're talking about the UCSC study on tree canopy? Or uh, well, about the one we're about to do. So I, I wasn't sure that's, how much. Um, that's all done in the field. That's all done. They go out. They actually take measurements and okay. count. Okay. That, that was my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Unless there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the community who want to address the council on our consent agenda other than items 5 or 14, which have been full pulled. Please, you, please come, for, come forward and you'll, you'll have up to, No, you're welcome to come forward. This would be your opportunity and you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Much. I was told that uh, I could present to you at um, 11 o'clock, but I guess that was changed to 10.30, so I've been hanging around. My car was towed on January 19th. It was for the Women's March. I would worked eight of nine days before that. I am a permit holder in the Red Church lot right over here. Um, so uh, two days after that, I walked around, you know, it cost me $500, it was pretty expensive. I walked around in the lot across the street, there were approximately one sign for every space, all the way down Lincoln Avenue and Pacific Avenue. There were two signs on every single meter. In our lot, according to the police officer, there were six signs for about 100 spots. So one sign per 16 spots. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just didn't know that there was an event going on there. I'd been out of town working, like I said, and so um, it seems like, so I went through a whole process. I, I called the uh, police. They found out that was Rossi towing. I picked it up. It cost me $500 to get towed two miles for 22 hours. Pretty expensive. The police officer finally got back to me. He wouldn't let me look at the pictures because he said there were evidence. Apparently there were six signs. I only saw three two days later, but all the other signs were up. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a very expensive thing. There's no uh, recourse or there's no information at the window. The ladies try to be very helpful. They don't have any information about what to do in a case of towing. This was a third party event. I talked to, it took me nine days to get a call back from the um, Public Works, the Director of Public Works, and he was very helpful. And I talked to, I think her name is Heather Sawyer at uh, um, Parking Services. And apparently what happens when a third party um, takes over lots like that, they are in control of signage. and so. It was raining an awful lot this winter. It had been raining all nine of those days before, many days before that. I don't know if a rain squall came up. I don't know if they ran out of supplies, but it just seems like not only was I not protected by adequate signage, but um, also the follow-up. It took me nine days. I got a letter in the mail six days later. I just happened to see that that was there. And so I sort of, it seems like you're not protecting permit holders. My permit was displayed. It was still displayed. Thank you. Your time is up. Okay. Okay, 
So at this point, um, we'll go ahead and see if there's any other members of the community who wanted to address us. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and look to see if there's a motion on um, the desk. I'll move the consent agenda. Okay, I'll, okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and return um, in order, and we'll start with item number five, which was pulled by Councilmember Crum. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I have a bunch of questions about this, and I think just to expedite this whole thing, I would make a motion that uh, we get the uh, Public Safety Committee to look at uh, this item and then get it back to the Council. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings, to have the Public Safety Committee look at this item. I'll go ahead and um, look to our city attorney to see his insights or response to that at this time. I just spoke with Councilmember Crone just a couple of minutes ago, and I'm happy to speak to the Public Safety Committee. There's no burning urgency that we get it done this meeting. Okay, so uh, the motion is to have this return to the council after the Public Safety Committee looks at this. Right, and I understood that that meeting was scheduled for, I believe, September 9th. So it'll come back in September. Okay, okay, Councilmember Matthews. Just a quick question. Um, basically what we had here was um, additions to gaps in the uh, bail schedule. Um, I, largely, I think that's what it was. So, so since 2016, the council's made a number of amendments to the municipal code. And when we do that, we um, have to adopt a bail schedule to inform the court, um, not how much people will pay in bail because nobody's taken into custody for general municipal code violations, but it, it informs the court about an appropriate fine. Most of the time, the fines are specified by the municipal code, so our task is very easy. Um, others, where it's just defined as an infraction or a misdemeanor, we try to base it, our recommendations at any rate, on what uh, similar types of code violations already contain in there. Uh, in, in the bail schedule, so um, so that's when we bring it to the council to up to date. It's just really to inform the courts, but I'm happy to speak to the public safety committee about that and bring it back uh, at an appropriate time. Right, I understood that, that the, um, the uh, charges uh, highlighted in yellow were the, the changes to the existing schedule. That's and, right. And some deletions as well. To reflect amendments to the municipal code. Right, right, and um, so my question, if this is referred to public safety, is just a question, is the intent to look only at those new things or at the entire bail schedule? Maybe that would be the question. question. Well, that, that's, what, that's why I'm asking, that's, pardon? The motion maker, right? That's a, that's a question. There's a lot here, and that's why I, I was I was I was sending it to the public safety because I think we could spend an hour or two, and I, I it would even like to be a council meeting agenda item. But instead, short of that, I was trying to expedite the meeting and move us along, and get the public safety committee to possibly take some have some questions for the city attorney, understand what a bail schedule is, because the, the word even bail is not, is actually fungible here. It's not actually a bail, it's, it has to do with fines. Uh, maybe that's in, in, in the word bail, maybe that's part of it too, but I know there's a great debate right now uh, across the United States on uh, cash bail, for example, and it'd just be really great to get some clarification on a lot of these things that are here and who they're targeted and what the reason why we're necessarily, you know, fining various, uh, and, I, and I had a conversation with the city attorney and he was, was fine with coming to the uh, public safety and I've talked to him offline a bit too. Do you have a further question, Council Member Matthews? No, the only point was to ask the question, it's not just the highlighted yellow and strikeouts, it's the whole package. Yeah. If the Council Member Myers, oh, okay, then we'll go ahead. Back to I just wanted to have a clarification for the public, actually our public safety committee is scheduled for September 23rd. Sorry about that. I guess I just have a question. I'm not quite sure if, if my understanding is some of these changes are um, necessary to re, kind of to fix and update. It's how much discretion would the public safety the committee have? The tool that to we use to ensure that the um, municipal code that the city council, amendments that the city council adopts can be effectively implemented and enforced. Right. That's, that's essentially what it is. Okay. 
Vice Mayor Cummings, then Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Chief, and then Councilmember Myers. Sorry. My understanding was that the concern around this was that um, other council members wanted to have a long discussion, mm -hmm. and rather than having that discussion here, and um, you know. Rather than having that discussion here at this time, to allow that it to go to the city council meeting for further or the public safety committee meeting, um, I, my understanding of this is this is just updating the schedule, and so I think that if they want to have a broader discussion with the community around what that means, since it might be it might some people might not understand what it means that to allow that to happen at the public safety committee meeting, and then it can come back to us and hopefully go back on the consent um, agenda item. Okay. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I think Vice Mayor Cummings covered it. Thanks, okay. Councilmember Myers. Uh, I'll, I'll pass. Councilmember Graham. Pass it Okay. Members of the community, you'll have up to two minutes. You're welcome to come speak. Hey, my name's Serge. Sorry. Um, and I'm not speaking for the catch. I'm just a member on the catch. And two things. One, uh, of the new bails, the first one on there, $1,000 for sleeping in a condemned building. If that's a safety concern, I understand that, but that sort of applies to the homeless, perhaps having more conversation about what a uh, response other than money that they'll never be able to pay you would be. Um, and if you're gonna have more conversation, I get it, public safety, but perhaps the catch might have be interested in getting a presentation to about some of the other ones, not necessarily this list other than that one, but the broader scale of tickets and stuff. Thanks. Next speaker. You just gotcha. Okay. We'll go ahead and then return it back to the council. We have a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. This will go to the next public safety committee meeting to have a uh, further conversation with the community at that time and then return back to the council at a future date. Uh, city, Man city Attorney Tony Condotti will work with the, c the committee on that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and now move on to item number 14, which was pulled from our consent agenda, I believe, by Councilmember Glover. No, well, that would excuse be me, me. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I was like, what? <laughs> so, um, so the request to uh, consider this item further um, it was not specifically about the contract, the award of a contract to this particular vendor. It was about the... Um, the practices uh, of uh, the, the work that's been done in the past and the potential for this to occur in the future and its relationship <laughs> to um, what is required under our uh, river management plan. Um, so I believe the member of the public is here. I'd like to hear maybe from the public and then have a discussion and try to get our questions answered um, okay. before we proceed. You'd like to, you would like to reserve your opportunity for questions for staff before, after, until after the member of the community speaks, is that what you're requesting? Okay. Well, I mean, other people. If you, other people want to ask questions right now, that's fine. I mean, I can ask questions. There may be. I just. There may be more afterwards. So I'm, just, I'm trying to streamline again and move through. No, I think maybe so. if you have your questions, we'll go ahead and follow that process. And then if there's additional questions that are raised from members of the community, we can have our staff respond and then just to stay consistent with process. Okay. So we have people. Through. Sure. Um, so it's my understanding that the. Um, the vegetation management prescription that um, is in the San Lorenzo River, River and Lagoon Management Plan um, has been uh, violated, that um, they're a 10 foot swath of wildlife habitat from Highway 1 um, to Water Street. Um, Primarily trees, um, willow and alder trees, um, and then a five-foot buffer along the, the wetted edge of the channel have been removed, and that that is um, n that is um, contrary to what um, members of the public understood to be an arrangement that had been made um, with the city, um, and so I'm trying to get an understanding of. Um, I don't need to know about all the reasons why that may have happened, but um, how it is that we ensure that doesn't happen in the future. Um, can we get that as a prescription or you know, a, a condition in the official addendum um, that added to that, um, that language that protects those areas? 
So I, I've just been, I wasn't around for the, and I had, those were informal conversations and negotiations. I've never seen anything come to the council that we've voted on, but it's been raised here, and so I'd like to resolve it. I'll try to do that. Mike Hopper, Public Works Operations Manager. Uh, a little background, Public Works is charged with maintenance of the San Lorenzo River, has been since it was completed, the project was completed by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is flood control, and the prescriptions uh, have to do uh, through some engineering jargon with flood control and maximizing conveyance of water down the river. Uh, the other reason we do it is that um, if we don't do it, FEMA considers flood uh, insurance rates as if the project doesn't exist, which can double or triple flood insurance rates. Uh, we have several permits that uh, govern our activities down there as well as the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan. Uh, we are required by permit to maintain a five foot buffer along the wetted channel to provide shade for uh, fish and, and habitat for other uh, wildlife. Uh, we are allowed to maintain a 10 foot wide swath at the base of the levee. So to find that location, that's where the slope of the levee meets the level part of the river channel. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, that's not really doable uh, because we have to get equipment down in the river. We have to get people down in the river. Uh, it doesn't, it's not safe for them to have to navigate a 10 foot wide swath to get to their work. Uh, we would have to cross that swath to do the other part of the work that's prescribed, which wasn't included in the correspondence from the member of the public, which is uh, to loosen sediment in the channel to encourage sediment transport uh, to keep the depth of the river at a level that maximizes conveyance. So rather than eliminate the 10 foot wide swath at the base of the levee, we moved that up against the five foot swath along the wetted channel, both sides, in areas where there was no existing vegetation along the wetted channel, which occurs occasionally. We guaranteed a 30 foot wide swath total. So if there was only five feet on one side, we would make it 25 feet on the other. Before we execute the work, we go down and mark with flagging where that 15 foot barrier would be or wider if necessary. Uh, we also uh, pull out non-native species. Uh, we also try to preserve individual isolated trees that are of a size below what we're required to take out, uh, regardless of where they are in the channel. So another, can I just ask one follow-up question? Yeah. So in terms of the, um, again, I was not involved in any of the conversations about this with members of the public. So if, if was this what your, your understanding of what you all had kind of come up with and agreed to was gonna happen? I'm just confused. I just wanna make sure I'm clear about why the misunderstanding and. Sure, well, for one thing, it's a dynamic environment down there. Every year it's different. The channel takes a different path. The vegetation pops up in different areas. Uh, we do a survey before we start. We go down there with our contractor. Uh, we file a plan with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and then when it comes time to actually do the work, uh, we, train, we have a training session with our staff, our biologist. We have a consulting biologist that does a pass through the area, looks for nesting birds and other uh, endangered or threatened species. Uh, and then we have training for the staff and then we go ahead with the work. And at that point, uh, we always have members of the public that are present. Uh, we try to engage in a dialogue with them. I don't, I've never uh, refused to speak to anybody down there. Uh, in other parts of the river, we have ongoing uh, dialogue with Coastal Watershed Council and other uh, groups that are interested in the river. Uh, we try to make it so that it works for everybody, but it primarily has to be consistent with our goal of flood control. Councilmember Meyer, 
I'm sorry, Councilmember Brent, does that cover your questions for now? I, I may have more That's depending good. on what I hear. But. Okay, Councilmember Myers. Um, I just have a yeah a couple of questions. I think one one item I know Mr. Hopper is um, I know we've we've struggled with sort of maintaining vegetation around also around potential campsites and and especially understanding if people are there um, because of the heavy equipment use of chainsaws etc. So um, I think one. Um, one thing that I mean, I think overall, uh, you know, um, the vegetation maintenance, but I do think there's some clarification that would be helpful, you know, seasonally as we as we move forward. And um, so I guess my question is to see if there's a way to either update our protocol. I guess I'm maybe not asking a question, but I'd, I'd be interested in understanding a little bit more about how we may be able to do that, including other requested treatments in the in the channel, which is where I think some of our vegetation disappears over time. So I'd like to see some of those things uh, rectified. Thanks. I had a quick, just a question on the, uh, I guess the letter writer said that, um, that the materials list was violated. Is that just, that's the discretion of the, of the city to do what they think needs to be done or was there actually something submitted to, um, you know, Fish and Game or I don't know, the various agencies that said this is what we're gonna do? Well, the Public Works doesn't really get involved in restoration. Uh, we have informally worked with Coastal Watershed Council and other groups in the community along with the Parks Department. And, but there's a list of species that are allowed down in the river as being more appropriate for that environment. I'm just thinking about violation. Is it, is, is that's too strong a word because we have, the city, Public Works has discretion over that area. So it's not that we're violating something. Mm -hmm. in violation of, of, of an agreement or? We go to quite a bit of trouble not to violate our permit requirements and to be consistent with the river plan. Thank you. I think, seems, I think we have a follow-up question from Councilmember Brown. Yeah, well, I'll just say, uh, yeah, I um, appreciate Councilmember Meyer's uh, comments and would agree that it would be nice to find a way to, to make sure that we update our protocol, that we do what we can to ensure that um, protocols aren't violated. Um, and I just, when you mentioned the training and I forgot to ask, um, do, was that true also for contractors such as um, the contractor here, um, Kenny Robinson Construction? Or do they go, if they're gonna be engaged in this um, river vegetation management work, um, they are trained as um, city staff are also engaged in this work would be trained? Yes, that's the reason we have the training and that's one of the requirements of our permit. Clarifying. So we may have more questions, but I think at this time we'll go ahead and see if there's members of the community who want to address us on this item. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Just a reminder, we're on item number 14 of our consent. Good afternoon, agenda. council members. Um, I'm the person from the public who's raised this issue. Um, historically, in 2015 and 2016, when I first began watching the vegetation or the flood control work, um, they were, as far as I could tell, not observing the requirement that the 10 foot strip of um, vegetation be left along the toe of the levee. That was basically being removed. The five foot buffer was being left. So the total was only five feet instead of the required 15 feet strip. In 2014 and 15, we just tore out our hair, those of us who were concerned. In 2000, 17 actually, there was an informal, we met with uh, Mr. Dettel, Bruce Van Allen and I met with Mr. Dettel and talked about some of these things. And then in 2017, I went out on the levee and um, talked to Randy, who was the head of the crew. And um, it was a very casual training. It was not a training with a biologist at that point in time. Um, and. And then the following year, I think we finally got clear about the fact that it was that 10 feet that we wanted to protect. And so we talked about it with the Public Works Department. I wanna thank the Public Works Department. They made the adjustment. They added the 10 feet to the five feet. So now technically it needs to be 15 feet on either side or 30 
combined and everything that uh, Mr. Hopper said is absolutely correct in terms of what's happening now. It's just that it wasn't happening before the community began to talk to Public Works and ask them questions about this and then they finally did add that 10 feet extra in the last two years. And there even have been tagging the native plants there and saving some of them. So there's been real improvement. We're really grateful. What I'm asking is that what um, Council Member Myers said is that we clarify the protocol because it's not the same as what you've got in your packet. Okay, additional members of the community, you'll have two minutes. Is there anybody else um, who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing that, you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, my real concern here is the fish. And I remember back in the mid 70s, along the levee, the, during salmon season, the fishermen were shoulder to shoulder. I mean, there was like no room for anybody. To, they were just like, uh, it was unbelievable watching how many fish they were pulling out and how, you know, how many fishermen were actually there. And now we're at the point where counting fish in the river, you know, maybe there are like 15 or 30 each year or something. And I realize that it's not just the part of the river that's in the city that's been degraded, but we have to do everything we can to keep the part that is in the city so it can sustain fish habitat. Um, I read in the report that there's supposed to be a biologist on site during this whole restoration project. So I hope that that actually takes place. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the community wanting to address us on this item, we'll return it back to the Council for Action and Deliberation. Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Brown. Or, yeah, you're first. Uh, uh, just an observation. Uh, it, it seems to me the item at hand here is the wording, the contract, and the, the history on this. The goal, obviously, the goal is flood control. Um, the conditions do change annually. Um, it it appears that there's been um, a real benefit from the conversation, and that the practices have. Um, uh, improved in recent years, and I agree that it seems like it's probably a matter of updating the protocol rather than holding up the contract. Absolutely. Yes. Councilman Brown? Yeah, I, I agree, and I so I wanted to make the motion that we award the contract for the um, <laughs> with Kenny Robinson Construction in the amount of $209,000 and request that staff provide do provide the council with an update to that protocol to reflect uh, the agreement made in the current practices. Second. Sure. We have a um, motion by Councilmember Brown, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Go ahead. Um, Filipina, can you put those pictures up? Um, I think it's really important to remember it is a flood control project. And um, in 1998, the county of Monterey and Santa Cruz got sued for not maintaining their flood control project, cost them $30 million because they couldn't get a, a fishing game permit. So they they didn't get, were able to get their maintenance done. Um, I appreciate that you're awarding this contract. The, the other one that shows the, the flows, that's what it looks like right now, but go ahead and show the high, high water flows. We get a lot of water through here and it's really important that we maintain the capacity because the area that will flood is the El Rio uh, Mobile Home Park is where it's gonna break out. That's my concern, the public safety of this project. So we need to have the capacity to get in and get our maintenance done so that we maintain the capacity of this flood control channel. So we're happy to work on protocols, but we gotta maintain, be able to do our maintenance. Yeah, okay. Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Myers. <laughs> sure. So I, I, I appreciate the uh, follow-up comment. And I, so I guess I'm just saying that I made the motion with the understanding that um, based on uh, Mr. Hopper's comments and the um, and, uh, public that this was, would, this is a practice that is not prevented by the Army Corps of Engineers. And so we're not actually in, I understand the need to be nimble with the practices depending on what happens seasonally um, or various seasons, but in terms of this, just having this as our baseline for this is what we 
say we're doing and we're going to do it is I don't my understanding is that's not a problem is that I just want to clarify that for Mr. Dettel you made me a little be happy to continue is. the dialogue uh, with members of the public okay great it's it's a very flexible arrangement I mean my my goal is to uh, reconcile our flood control responsibilities with a vibrant habitat Councilmember Crone Councilmember Myers and then we have maybe this answers it um, December 2005 is that all the pictures were from December 2005 we've had more water since then right I mean stronger um, floods and 17 yeah, this is the high water 17. mark of 2017 right now there's about 10 cubic feet per second going down the river on this on February 7th of this date we had nearly 23,000 cubic feet per second going down the river Thank you, and I appreciate getting a rereading of the motion before we vote. Councilmember Myers? Yeah, and I just wanted to clarify, um, I certainly am really familiar with the protocol um, and understand the need, especially with the uh, freeing up the sediment so that we actually get the scour action too. So I think just, um, I think my intent was really just to, uh, I, I know we have the table here, um, but Maybe just additional, just some additional wording on our on our protocol if it's available. Uh, especially as you mentioned, Mr. Hopper, the you know every season's different, and um, just to be able to kind of so there's some clarity. Uh, I think it just helps for the public to understand. I've had people say they're cutting all the trees down in the river, and then when I explain really what what we're do down there, they really people people have a lot of respect for the way we're managing the system. So I think just. Um, my intent is not to try to create, you know, an impasse or issues with the with the flood control maintenance, but um, sometimes it's just helpful for people to understand kind of how you're choosing, how we choose to do the work in the areas we do, um, and um, and I also just want to publicly just recognize that um, the contractor is uh, that is part of this um, contract, which is very well qualified and, and has been working in the river for a long time. So I really appreciate the city's efforts at maintaining and hiring a really qualified um, contractor that works in the area and is very familiar with the protocol. So um, I'm just I'm just trying to see if there's a way we can kind of kind of just uh, add additional a little bit of additional language to it to clarify. Okay, Councilmember Brown, and maybe you could re restate yes. that motion. Before I restate it, could I ask Councilmember Myers, if you might be willing to be involved in that conversation with our Public Works Department, I, I, I think that you probably are most qualified, um, and you seem to have an interest in just following through on those up on um, whatever updates are possible. And are you guys you amenable from to your that? perspective? Okay, thanks. Okay, sure. So, um, so then, I, so then I'll restate the motion with that addition. Um, so the motion is to award a contract for the San Lorenzo River flood control maintenance with Kenny Robinson Construction as uh, recommended by staff in the amount of $209,000 and to direct public work staff to uh, provide council with uh, proposed updates to the management um, San Lorenzo, Lorenzo River and Lagoon Management Plan uh, language updating the protocols to reflect uh, current practices with Council Member Myers uh, providing some input to staff. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, that was a motion that was seconded originally by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion? Can we just add understanding the um, uh, essential objective of flood control? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So to, to now incorporate the, the fundamental need for flood control within the motion. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. <coughs> so that concludes our consent agenda. We'll go ahead and move on to our general business items. And next is um, item number 19, and that's the ordinance amending chapter 14, dogs and other domesticated animals of Title VIII animals of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. And the order will be a presentation of the item by staff. For the council members who brought the item forward, they would present, but um, we have staff here, Mr. Condotti, and then we'll go ahead and have questions from the council public comment and return for action and deliberation. Similar to all order. Councilman Kondati. 
Yes, thank you. Um, this is really a housekeeping matter. Uh, and if you, if you take a look at the red line a draft of the ordinance that's presented here, um, the existing definition of a uh, service animal is limited to service dogs and, um, and the criterion under which they're considered service uh, animals is uh, specifically defined. What this ordinance does, it would, it would broaden the definition to basically adopt the standards for uh, service animals as uh, contained in the regulations implementing the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's, and, and it was, and it's being brought forward um, after a member of the public pointed out the issue. So it's really a housekeeping item and I'm happy to respond to any other questions that council members have about it. Do any council members have questions about this change? Council Member Just so we're, we can be clear, we're, we're, we're updating this ordinance um, because I've heard from people's fears that it is, um, you know, targeting a certain population that um, we need an enforcement mechanism for, but that doesn't sound um, what this is about. Yes, that's that's right. That has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's it's not a change in policy at all. It's really just to make our code consistent with federal regulations. Federal. Okay. Thank you. Any question, other questions from the council at this time? <laughs> Bless you. Any members of the community would, um, wanting to address us on this item? This is item number 19 on our general business portion of the meeting. Okay, seeing none, Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. I'll make a motion to move the item and introduce for publication an, an, an ordinance amending section 8.14.201 exceptions to prohibition of chapter 14 dogs and other domesticated animals of title eight animals of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code concerning the definition of service animals. Okay, I'll second that. Further discussion, Councilor McCrone. Did, did you, anybody from the public want to? Nobody wanted to. Oh, okay, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Member Matthews. And just for those who are watching on TV, <laughs> um, this simply brings us into conformance with federal and state law. It actually broadens the definition of service animal and in fact um, includes now some flexibility um, as state and federal uh, definitions change that we will be in conformance without having to come back. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes <coughs> unanimously. Um, we'll maybe take a short two minute break before we move on to item number 20, which is our revised six month work plan. <laughs> Sarah. Okay, we're on item number 20 of our general business agenda portion, and we have a revised six month work plan. Um, and our presentation is from Sarah Fleming. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Fleming, and I'm Principal Planner here with the um, Planning and Community Development Department's Advanced Planning Team. And uh, I have before you a, some updates uh, to the citywide and advanced planning six-month work plans. At the August 13th meeting, uh, both of these were presented, and Council had some changes that they directed staff to make. Uh, we have made all of those changes, and um, I'm happy to, uh, if there are any questions on those changes, point people to where we could find them in the documents, and otherwise, uh, all of the changes have been made. So there's your short and sweet presentation. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any questions in regards to the updated work plan at this time? Okay, seeing none. I, I, you have a question? I have a question, yeah. Um, okay, I stared at the chart. Attachment two. Yes. Um, and just, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding how we should be reading it. So the, the, the chart with the yellow and the green on the top. Yes. Those are what are regarded as 
I, I guess I'm trying to understand the bottom of the chart in the orange versus the bottom, the top of the chart. <coughs> I understand the project manager definition, or, but I'm trying to understand, is this whole thing? Six month work plan? Yes, for the advanced planning division. And so I've split it into two planners. You have your yellow planner, who's in the yellow and white the above, okay. and then the orange planner in the orange and white below. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the community who want to address the council on this item. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Is there any other members of the community that like to address us on this item? Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, the issue that I'm concerned with is the ADUs, updates, and I would hope that you would um, ask the planning department not to close down any non-permitted ADUs until you update the ADU uh, requirements and possibly uh, or hopefully grandfather in all existing ADUs that are currently unpermitted and that are safe and uh, not a fire risk. Um, so hopefully you can do that, uh, get the planning department not to shut down any non-permitted ADUs until you, this update happens. Thank you. Next speaker. Madam Mayor and Council Members, my name is Gary Patton. I am one of the co-chairs of Save Santa Cruz, and as I hope you know, we sent you a letter relating to this item. We are hoping that the Council, as you take final, I think hopefully final action on getting the priorities set for the time ahead, uh, that you will deal with the quarters plan by number one, making absolutely clear that the former ideas should be terminated. In other words, stop that old quarters plan and then reinitiate an effort, which we don't think will take very long, actually, at least in planning years, uh, to make certain that our zoning code and general plan conform as to the developments along quarters and related areas so that the neighborhood protection, business protection portions of the general plan are treated appropriately as development on the quarters occurs. The quarters are a real opportunity for more affordable housing, and I think Safe Santa Cruz is very supportive of that. Uh, we do want the developments when they come uh, to be respectful of neighborhoods and local business. Is there any other member of the community who wants to address us on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back to the council for action and deliberation. I think I said with Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. Unless there's, are we going to have questions for staff at all? We already, we already had already opportunity question for, for staff. staff. So do you want your okay. welcome to make the motion? Um, I'd like to make a motion to remove the quarters rezoning effort from the planning department work plan indefinitely. And I'd like to direct the planning department to prioritize the housing blueprint recommendations and building electrification per our climate change program um, and, th and with the building department. And um, I just wanna, so I'm gonna put that out as a motion. I'll second the motion. <laughs> Did you wanna further explain your? Uh, just a couple of comments. I, I appreciate, um, the letter from Safe Santa Cruz, and I certainly think that um, I'm really focused on this six month period, and we have a lot on the plate. I'm very um, interested in making sure that we can move things forward, and I appreciate the need for our community to restart this uh, conversation uh, on what future development looks like for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I do believe that the ADUs, uh, and especially the housing blueprint recommendations should be moved forward. Um, and we also towards the goals of our climate change program and, and uh, taking advantage of some of the um, potential electrification options coming. Uh, I think we wanna be ready for that. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing these conversations though restarted as early as possible into the beginning of the new year. But I do think um, we have six months and we have a lot of work and I'd like to, to see if we can focus on that and then acknowledge that we do need to initiate some kind of conversation with our community, community down the line around the, um, uh, the rectification of our general plan and our zoning ordinance. Thank you. 
So I have a few comments, but I know Councilmember Brown had her hand up. Um, yeah, so I um, I appreciate Councilmember Myers your your comments, and um, I I agree about the priorities um, and the, and the concern about workload. However, um, I I think that the community has been waiting a long time to have this conversation, and we have not responded to that. And I think that, um, or we've we've really kind of only nominally responded to it, I guess. And so I really feel like initiating this now and beginning to have that conversation um, is really important. And so I do have an alternative motion that I have prepared that I'll give everyone a copy of, um, which I can make now or wait till some further discussion, but I um, I will be making this motion as an alternative. And you have it, okay. we do. but we I, there's a separate copy, so you can have it. I think um, I'll just sort of make a few comments and then we can hear your alternative motion. I um, support the proposed motion on the floor. I think essentially, uh, if you were to ask any of the council up here in terms of making the quarters plan a priority to implement, I'd, I'd say we're all in agreement that that's not the direction we want to go in. So to remove it indefinitely feels consistent, I think, with the original message. But honestly, I think I left our meeting feeling um, last time that, you know, we have a situation where Santa Cruz is still internationally compared as the least affordable. And we have a series of recommendations that came from a very robust process that was actually awarded um, by the Northern California Association of Planners, I think, yes. <laughs> if, if I'm saying it right, um, that set forth uh, some priority uh, areas to move the needle on housing for our community. It was vetted significantly through the community. And to me, it feels you know, frankly, like a disservice to not be able to move forward with critical housing um, policy at this time, knowing that um, this is a conversation that I think now framed this way can still get to what I believe is the intention around the orig original recommendation, but ultimately freeing up our advanced planning team to really get moving the needle on supporting housing in our community. So for me, I had a, a little bit of disappointment and feeling that if we're gonna go backwards, how are we serving our community moving forward? So I uh, personally will support the first motion. I'm not quite sure what the second motion is. Maybe I won't if, if after I hear this one, um, but I also, want to acknowledge the sort of the latter part of that motion in terms of the electrification. Electrification is, is huge. It's there's so much potential with what that policy is for the future of our uh, sustainability of our climate and building practices. And there's a lot of potential work that we can do in that area and would behoove us if our advanced planning um, team was working on that because my understanding is that there will be some resources that'll be forthcoming in the, in the upcoming months to help us in that regard. So for me, this also seems aligned with our, um, our principles around climate, um, climate change and sustainability and mitigation and best practices in that area. So I uh, support the motion on the floor. I'm happy to return back to Councilmember Brown to state her alternative motion if she's wanting to do that at this time or if we want to continue conversation before doing so. I'll look to you if you want. Uh, yeah, maybe it would be helpful for me to, to do that now then because I don't think that there's, that this is an alternative motion in contrast to the motion that's been made and I think it actually lays out a little bit more about an interest in uh, pursuing affordable housing in along the corridor. So, so if I could, I'll just, and you all have it in front of you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just read it out. So this motion would be to direct staff to terminate the corridor's plan and do no further work on this project. Um, to direct planning staff to initiate a project to resolve the existing inconsistencies between the corridor related general plan policies and the zoning ordinance by making <coughs> general plan and zoning ordinance changes as necessary to meet the following objectives. <coughs> A, preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses as the city's highest level policy priority. B, encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities at appropriate locations along the city's main transportation corridors. 
Three, direct the planning director as a first step in carrying out the council's direction on this matter to meet promptly with representatives of Save Santa Cruz and other neighborhood and community groups that, have, so community groups that have previously commented on the now terminated corridors plan to seek agreement on possible changes to the general <laughs> plan and zoning ordinance that can achieve broad community support and that will allow the council to achieve its objectives. Four, direct the city manager and planning director to report at the council's second meeting in October 2019 with the results of community meetings, proposed policy changes consistent with the council's objectives, and a schedule for accomplishing the planning project specified in these directions. Five, direct the city manager to provide the council with a monthly progress report on this matter placed on the council's regular meeting agenda. Each council report shall request any further action or direction by the council that the city manager um, deems necessary to allow the council to achieve the objective of adopting zoning code and general plan changes as outlined in this set of recommendations no later than November of 2020. Second. So we have a substitute motion, motion from Councilmember Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, and if I could, sorry. Um, if it would be helpful to take these um, and vote on them one by one, I'm okay with that. I'd like to just try to move us through. I, this is the motion I wanna make um, and I'd like to move through it. My understanding is we have to make a, take a vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. Ah, okay. That's right. And assuming that the council does vote to accept the substitute motion, then I think it could be broken down as suggested by Council Member Brown into separate items. Before we take that um, vote, I'd like to hear from our city planning team on this potential motion. Is that appropriate? Certainly. Okay. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. For me, this feels um, like it's taking our city backwards to go forward, but very um, divergent from what I think ultimately is moving the needle on housing in our community. So that's my instinct. I think elements of it feel appropriate, others don't, but I'd like to hear our staff's opinions I, on this. I have another related question. And okay, we'll go ahead. And, we'll go ahead and have that question, then we'll go Vice Mayor Cummings. Well, it's, it's related to what you just asked. Okay. Um, and that is, this seems to me extremely ambitious. And so I'm wondering, um, I think it would uh, supplant more than one item here. So. That's what I'd like to hear. Okay, and then do you have a related question as well? No, I just. Okay, okay, you have a related question? And Council. if you could also comment, um, just regards this with uh, some of the upcoming, I think, legislation around housing that we anticipate probably will be signed any day now. So if we could kind of put it in the context of where the state might be going and how that sort of relates to, talk to, to this, thank you. Absolutely, yes, so I had two points. Um, one for each. Uh, so the, the first point is uh, the impact on workload. Um, if we were to follow this, if council were to choose to move forward with this motion as written, um, that would essentially be one full-time staff person uh, through the six month period. Uh, I think it's a very um, assertive, a potentially aggressive timeline. Um, I appreciate the importance of the um, need for speed. Uh, however, if, if the council does wanna move forward at this clip, then the yellow planner who is the expert on this would not really have capacity to do much of anything else. Um, the other thing I would like to raise is that currently moving through the assembly is SB 330 that would essentially, um, if signed by the governor, would um, disallow us from making any sort of down zoning type changes. Um, and so that very well, we could start down this path and then should that pass, which um, as Council Member Meyer said, at any, any day now could be signed, um, that would essentially provide prevent us from doing very much what this motion is asking us to do. So just be mindful of that as well in terms of um, what the state very well may mandate us to do. Mr. Butler. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, I'm the Planning Director, and I would just add that um, being very blunt, the timeline of November 
of 2020 is not possible when you start looking at everything that's needed for this, including the CEQA review, including revisiting our housing element and getting that, making sure that that is not, that the, the certification of that is not compromised with the State Department of Housing and Community Development. And as um, Sarah mentioned with SB 330, the, the date for that item goes back to, um, January 1st of 2018. So any provisions that we have in place as of January 1st of 2018 could not be um, modified to reduce housing capacity should that bill ultimately be signed. And as we know, the state is moving in that direction on many fronts with many bills. And so if that doesn't pass this year, we still stand the risk of next year a similar bill coming forward that has that same retroactivity clause built into it. And so there is a, a very significant concern on staff's part that if we embark on an effort such as this, the state will come along and say, thank you and all of that work is nullified. We have some other items here that we believe can um, make a big difference to community generated ideas. And that is why um, we have the, the work plan proposed in front of you. And if it is council's desire for us to do that, absolutely, we will get that moving as quickly as possible. I do just wanna be upfront about that timeline of November, 2020, not being realistic when you start taking into account everything that goes into um, modifying the zoning as, as directed here, including the general plan modifications, as well as looking at HCD certification of housing element, CEQA review that's associated with that, a, a year timeline, even if we dedicated a full-time planner to that right now, isn't realistic. Yeah, and if I might add as well, um, the AMBAG is getting ready to release new, um, uh, re thank you, RENA numbers, alphabet soup over here. Um, and so that could um, also completely change uh, what we're required to do. And just quickly, I wanna read uh, for the edification of the council, the language that's currently in the um, SB 330, which is Skinner's Housing Crisis Act of 2019. Uh, changing the general plan land use designation, specific plan land use designation, or zoning of a parcel or parcels of property to a less intensive use, or reducing the intensity of land use within an existing general plan land use designation, specific plan land use designation, or zoning district below what was allowed under the land use designation and zoning ordinances of the affected county or affected city as applicable uh, as an effect on January 1st, 2018 would be prohibited. It basically, it says an affected city shall not enact a development policy standard or condition that would have any of the following effects. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, we have just, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, Brown, Matthews, and I'll just say, I won't be supporting the substitute motion. I think it would be irresponsible of us as a council to move in this direction at this time, personally. Okay, Councilmember Myers. Um, I just have a, a quick question. Um, again, I think that I think that this conversation needs to happen. I think there's a lot of moving pieces to this, um, and I think um, you know preserving our neighborhood quality and also our businesses and the the way that people um, not only you know currently but also in the future really understand how and what their neighborhoods will be like is really important. And so I don't. I don't disagree with um, sort of the need to restart the conversation um, at all. I do, um, my main thing is really understanding um, sort of the ramifications of where the state is moving. And um, again, I'm just gonna state again, I think ADUs are uh, incredibly, um, in a sense, low hanging fruit. Um, they can produce housing now. We've um, finished almost all of our code um, changes. And uh, I have a question, uh, if, you, if you have the number, I don't know if you do, but I would be curious as to how many uh, ADU applications we have, we have currently sort of sitting um, until we sort of figure out and finish up our ordinance changes is on that. So uh, how many have been issued this year? And then do we have a sense of how many ADU permits maybe are in the hopper right now? 
We've generally been issuing between 30 to 45 ADU permits. We were actually down a little bit last year and we put that um, to the, um, the fact that we were making so many updates that we were, that people were likely anticipating uh, those changes that would save them money, allow them more flexibility in uh, how they um, build their ADUs. And so they were sort of sitting on the sidelines and waiting, knowing that it would be easier in the uh, in the coming months. Um, so we were a little bit down um, last year. I don't know the specific number that we have waiting in the wings. We, we turn them around really quickly when they do come into our building division. Um, and so there usually isn't a, uh, a large sort of pipeline. It's just when they come in, we, uh, we work on them quickly and, and try to get them issued. But I think that people have been waiting in the wings knowing that we are making it easier, we are reducing fees, and uh, we're adding flexibility in terms of what they can do. And the council's actions earlier this year um, were a testament to that in terms of uh, all of those factors and, and uh, making it easier to build ADUs here. And we've got a list of other things that uh, can also uh, achieve those same goals. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. So I have a couple of comments and a question. So um, I guess in response to, I, and I absolutely understand the workload challenges and your concerns and appreciate all of the work that you've been doing. I don't wanna discount any of that at all. Um, and so that I wanna, I have a question about in a moment, but in terms of the, the concern about this uh, potential prohibition on downzoning, nothing in this motion suggests the intention is to downzone. The intention here, I believe, is to open up the conversation with the community to get our zoning and general plan in uh, conformance with each other. So that doesn't necessarily, there's nothing prescriptive about downzoning here. It's just about having that conversation. And, and I think another point that is important is that having some updates to the council about how it's going will allow us to adjust timelines, expectations accordingly. And so, you know, ha having this as a goal does, I mean, I, not, the sky isn't gonna fall if on a certain date it hasn't happened. The point is to have this as a goal. The expectation is that we'd like to meet those timelines to the extent possible and hear from staff to the extent they are not possible what's happening. So I, I, I think that that um, is built in in order to kind of, to try to address those concerns. I understand that's not gonna completely take care of it for you all, um, but that's my intention. And then the question I have with respect to the, the discussion, we had a lively discussion about the uh, potential uh, delay of work around ADUs and affordability. Um, and then I just heard um, Director Butler say that people are waiting with the expectation that these are just around the corner. So if that's almost completed, when would might that be completed and how might we adjust this time, you know, these dates to meet that but still get moving uh, rather than saying, well, we're just gonna talk about it again next year because I that I'm not interested in, in doing. We'll see what others think. Sure, so um, to your first point, um, I, I hear what you're saying and I appreciate that the motion does not include downzoning. Where my question comes in is that the general plan already in the corridors areas, in those mixed use areas for most of those locations is a higher intensity use to some degree than what our zoning would be. So um, opening it back up for a conversation to potentially change anything, um, if the state law were to go through as written, then um, we wouldn't be allowed to take it to anything less than what's currently in the general plan now. Um, Additionally, in terms of the timeline, I think a lot of uh, my concern comes from um, when we did our general plan process, um, it was a seven year process that had over 100 community meetings, very, very intense and robust. And um, we're gonna be starting a similar process to update our current general plan, I'd say probably in about five or six years. Um, and I, I just am, given that there was 
we have such a very wonderfully active community, I just don't see any way that we can have that similar conversation uh, in, in your time frame proposed. And I, I do not in any way uh, mean to be negative, I'm just trying to be as realistic as possible because I want to be able to meet your expectations and I want our team to be able to do that. And when I, when I look at this time frame, I just, very realistically, to echo the words of Director Butler, just don't see that being feasible, and I'm not sure what changes would come out of it if this SB 330 were to move forward as written. And it, was there another question? Oh, on the ADU timing. Um, so can you repeat that? I'm, it fell out of my head. So the, we had a conversation about the, the potential delay in the ADU recommendations coming back to council uh, if this were to be included in the six month work plan right. at our last meeting. And right. then I just in response to Director Butler's point that there are people who ha maybe have plans and intentions to uh, build ADUs and go through the permitting process who are waiting and it's just around the corner. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, how much time is that anticipated to take? When were you planning to bring those back to us? And could we, adjust the timeline in my, the, my proposed motion to take that into account, but not just put it off and say, we're gonna talk about it again next year. Sure. Um, could the city clerk bring up the attachment too? Again, are you able to see that? And I'm gonna zoom into the yellow planner's workload here. So you can see here for the ADU items, so the mandated legislative updates um, have a uh, implementation timeframe of January 1, 2020. Um, so they don't give us a lot of time to turn around um, the, the changes. And um, this legislative session actually has been extended um, by about two weeks. And so normally the governor has to sign or veto the bills by the September 30th. Uh, this legislative session for whatever reason it's been pushed out um, for signatures as late as I believe October 13th. And so that also pushes us back just a couple more weeks and while it might sound like it's a couple of weeks, those are precious weeks when you start to talk about community outreach, uh, bringing things forward to planning commission, then council if any changes are needed, if um, there's just a, a series of processes that that pu just pushes back further. And when you consider that there's only one meeting in December and the holidays, I mean, you just set, these are the things we have to weigh. So um, right now, the proposal is to uh, have everything ready by the end of the year, both the mandated legislative updates as well as the affordability review that is outstanding from um, earlier this year, and um, have them ideally go on the same track and be before you in uh, December. They'd have to be, to, to meet that timeline, they'd have to be at Planning Commission in October. And so if we're not getting our verification from the governor uh, until mid-October of what's going to happen, that already starts to p crunch this timeline. And so if we're adding, um, I believe in here, uh, item four on your motion indicates that we would come back having done our community outreach by October 2019, um, that really, it's it, it almost almost needs to be one or the other. I, I don't see a way uh, given the resources, especially with Planner One also being on the rental housing data collection effort and working uh, as the staff liaison to that ad hoc subcommittee, um, how she's gonna be able to do all of those things. Um, it definitely becomes more than a full-time job. Quick follow-up question. It sounds like October, if the deadline for uh, legislative uh, for signatures from the governor is now mid-October. It sounds like October would be a more difficult month to have any community uh, conversations and than September would be. So I'm just trying to see about how that sounds. I mean, I, I, at least to initiate that process, to have a meeting mm -hmm. with, say, Santa Cruz to, um, I don't believe that the, I mean, again, the proposal, the motion is not prescriptive about the extent of, mm -hmm. you know, publicity about that meeting. It's to meet with community groups that have been actively involved and concerned and asking for some response uh, for quite a while now. So sure. I don't know how much time that would take. 
Very fair point. Um, my only concern with that would be um, I want to be really sensitive to the community's needs, and I don't want to pick something back up again, get everybody excited that we're going to have the conversation, and then have to put that on hold yet again in order to address the ADU items and get those things through before the end of the year. Um, once we start that conversation with the community, I really want to be able to do that, be focused on that, have an individual and a staffer who is dedicated to that and is ready to move forward with that. And given these other items that are in here, especially the mandated stuff and whatever the subcommittee wants to do with the rental housing data collection effort. I just want to be very transparent that that is going to be a real, real strain on the resources. And um, I, I just don't want to get the community excited again and then not be able to stay on top of that process. I would hate to meet with them in September and then not be able to come back until January or February. Uh, thank you for that. Sure. I do have one more comment, but I'll let uh, okay. other people have comments all okay so we have um i think it's a question but then we'll go ahead and maybe take the vote on the substitute motion maybe have um, that motion restated or i guess we have a, a question and a comment um donna you mentioned the electrification um <coughs> issue and that doesn't appear in the work plan at all here does it no that is not currently included as a and part of this work plan a comment on that let's throw <laughs> sure. something else in here i'd love to comment on that um so um Every three years, our building and fire codes are updated, and 2019 is a year when they are in the process of being updated, and they'll take effect on January 1st of 2020. We will be before you in October for the first reading of the new building and fire codes. And with that, um, I have talked with our building official and asked that um, he coordinate with our uh, sustainability manager, Tiffany Wise West, as well as our green building manager, um, Kurt. Hurley and our uh, building division to be prepared to answer questions of the council in terms of what that would take, what some other communities are doing, the timeline of when that could be implemented and so forth. And so when that comes to you in October, we will be prepared to answer questions. We do not anticipate having an ordinance at that time, but we do expect that the council is very interested in that. And um, even prior to this uh, conversation, uh, and I'm seeing lots of nodding heads, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, even prior to uh, the conversation today, we were expecting that um, those questions may arise. And so we want to be prepared um, to uh, do some research and have some of those answers for you when we come back in October in terms of how quickly we would be able to get something on the ground. Um, we also want to do some initial, some initial outreach um, to the development community to just hear their comments on it so that we'll have that for you when we come back in October as well. Oh, following up on that, so um, given that you're already thinking along these lines, doing some preliminary work, is that something that you anticipate, although it doesn't appear on the work plan, that is, is going to be moved forward? We would anticipate that is something that the council requests, um, and that's why we're doing that initial research to give you a realistic um, timeline and understanding of what that would take. The reason why it's not on this work plan oh, is it is would focus, planning. this yes. is advanced planning, and that would Got focus it. more yeah. on our building division, um, and so that's why yeah. you're not seeing it there. Um, well, I'll just say briefly, um, I'll vote against the substitute motion. I feel really strongly uh, that we should be going ahead with those items that were identified as priorities in the housing blueprint with a great deal of community input and thought uh, that that to some extent um, presents opportunities for relatively soon results for low hanging fruit. Um, the whole package of ADU uh, considerations you know, not personally that I would support for everything that's been uh, 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 thrown out as a possibility, but I think it just giving some clarity on, on what our um, guidelines are for the ADUs is just super important, um, both for those who want to come and build new ones or legalize unpermitted ones. So um, I think uh, what we should be focusing on uh, for the ADUs, I mean, people talk about neighborhood um, com compatibility uh, and character, and um, for both the ADUs and corridors, really looking at uh, uh, design standards and conditions of approval um, so that they they are uh, they they do integrate well with our uh, neighborhoods. Um, so those are the the main reasons. Um, those are my priorities going forward. Vice Mayor Cummings. I think one thing that would be helpful, which is 
why I seconded this motion is, and before I start, I just wanted to say I appreciate all the information you all provided to us today with regards to um, workload and you know um, the different uh, items that might be coming out of the state. I think that if we begin these discussions with the community groups and organizations, um, one of the things, I think that that would be a great opportunity um, for city staff to get a sense of you know the urgency that the communities are wanting to see, and then the city staff being able to communicate you know, the realistic timeline that they're able to work under, given um, what we are intending to pass today. And I think that by having that conversation, which is a part of this, that if there can be a way for um, the city staff and some of these neighborhood groups to um, begin to find some like grounds for consensus, I think that that could help because if, if the anticipation is that the timeline should be extended, then that, that's something that could be brought back to us in an FYI and we can consider extending that timeline so that staff is able to um, meet the demands of the workload. So I just wanted to, you know, put that out there as to why I'm, I'm supporting this today. And I think that um, we are, you know, based on what could come out of those meetings, I think that there would be, um, you know, an ability for us to work to see if there's some consensus around extending dates and timelines to make sure that there's flexibility in this. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that it's clear that um, if there are, you know, if there are new bills being passed at the state level, if there's concerns around timelines after having com com uh, conversations with community members, I think that bringing it back to us or just having a conversation with us would be helpful in, in having us better understand how we can make this work. So I'll just make a few comments before we maybe take the vote on the substitute motion. I, I think, you know, I feel our community is looking to us to lead in the area of trying to support housing affordability at this time where it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to live here. And I um, support terminating the corridors plan and I support having conversations with Save Santa Cruz, but at the cost of us being able to, in the next six months, carry out affordable housing recommendations that were community vetted through a housing blueprint subcommittee process that had um, statewide recognition for a best practice um, is, is truly um, irresponsible of us as a council. And that, I mean, that's my opinion. And I don't think we have to be one or the other. I think absolutely we can have conversations about the quarters plan. There is healing that needs to be done there and there's conversations that need to be done there. But to have it, at the cost of us being able to do other things in the next six months, as well as to logistically try to plan for that for me as also the person who's trying to manage the meetings in addition to the other things that this council wants to accomplish um, is, is very difficult. So I, I can meet halfway on the first, you know, item or the first, second and third potentially item, but to, um, to, to go in this direction at this time at the cost when I think our community needs us to lead in a different direction in a way that we've already kind of done the work for um, feels disheartening personally. So I'll just, leave, I'll just say that. So I won't be supporting the motion on the floor. We can vote on the substitute motion and, and if that passes, we'll go ahead and take that motion. Okay. So all those in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Okay, so that passes with council member Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings. Do you have any modifications to the elements of the motion given the information you've received from staff? Um, not at this time. I am looking forward to hearing back to think, you know, to think through realistically what, it, and, and also after, I, I do want to see an initial community meeting with community members who, again, have been requesting this for a long time. Um, take place and if there are recommended adjustments in the timeline out of that I'm I'd be absolutely open to having that conversation um, and um, I'm just gonna say um, when I disagree with my colleagues I don't call them irresponsible and so I feel a little disheartened um, because I feel like I'm being very responsive to uh, a big subset of the community that's, that's been, um, again, quite patient. And um, so I'll just leave it at that. But I don't have any changes at sure. this time. I'll just, I'll clarify because I was the one that made that statement. I, I don't necessarily, that's not pointed at an individual. I think we have choices as a council in terms of our responsibility to govern in a way that I think meets the needs. So for me, I can't support it because I feel that doesn't fit 
in alignment with my values and how I want to lead in this way. But for others, that might not be the case. So um, uh, it's not intended to be pointed to any individual. It's not in alignment with my personal integrity and values on how I want to lead in addressing the housing issues in our community. Um, and um, But if it's the will of the majority of the council, then that's the will of the majority of the council. I just wanted to say that with respect to the issue of workload, um, that uh, you know we'll be uh, very open and, and clear with you about whatever issues we encountered there, because as you heard, that, that is a major concern. And so we want to be realistic and honest about that. So uh, as we move forward with, with this, we'll, we'll just have to update you and keep you informed, um, just to, again, to be clear about that. Uh, I just had a really clarification. Uh, one of the members of the public asked about ADUs and um, are we currently closing down ADUs or are we waiting until the updates of the ADU ordinance happen? So um, I'll, I'll speak at a high level to this and then Director Butler may be able to uh, fill in the holes that I don't necessarily know the details of because that doesn't fall to my team. Um, we typically work with um, any illegal dwelling units, uh, be it an ADU, garage conversion, what have you, um, to as long as there's not an imminent life health safety issue, um, we typically are not shutting people down as I understand it. We are actually working with them to try to find a way to legalize and keep those units on the market. And I think last year it was uh, maybe a total of 15 or less that were um, closed. I'm, I, I could be speaking out of turn, so I'll let the let the director clarify that because again, it doesn't sit in my team. So sure, that number was over approximately two years, and those were direct um, <clears throat> uh, direct removals from the market. And we'll report back with some uh, more recent statistics. Um, but um, Sarah's correct. We do, and in fact, uh, we do always try to keep people in the units in addition to um, trying to legalize them and in fact when we have provisions that are potentially in the queue or that are coming down through the state that may help a uh, property legalize um, we let them know and we say hey you know we're gonna set you aside for a little bit and let's talk in six months and you can keep those individuals. We, we go out, we do an inspection, we make sure that there are no obvious life health safety issues. Um, obviously we don't want to put anyone in danger but if we do not find any of those, then we put them in the queue of projects uh, that we want to legalize. And we work with them, including looking at um, future provisions that may help them so that, you know, the last thing that we want is someone making a bunch of investments and then three, six months later, um, we say, oh, now you could have done that, but you had to go in and spend all this money. So we, we try to look ahead and um, help people to the greatest extent that we can. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilmember Crone, for following up with that question. Um, also, I uh, want to appreciate Councilmember Brown for bringing up the use of that language. Um, I just encourage my colleagues, knowing that there is a very clear ideological divide on this council to avoid making those kinds of value statements uh, and stick to I statements uh, because if the majority of the council does decide to move forward with this language, then uh, individuals who might have made that statement will be calling the majority irresponsible in a public setting. So I would just really encourage us to be conscious of uh, the way that we interact with each other on the dais. Thank you. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and maybe take the vote and I'll just for the record state that I support the first um, part of the motion to direct staff to terminate the quarters plan. I also support elements of conversating and working with Save Santa Cruz and other community groups to have those types of conversations in regards to next steps moving forward. It's the uh, detailed description of how that moves forward I don't support. So I won't be supporting the motion, but for the record, I do support those elements. Okay, Council Member Crone. Uh, I will be supporting the motion, but I, I also wanna say for the record that um, we have a representative government. And I think the last couple elections, we heard from the people on the east side and they voted, they wanted the corridors plan not to happen. And it happened over a long period of time. I mean, uh, and finally, I feel like this day has been long in coming and I'm uh, pleased that you brought this forward. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. And um, I look forward to the vote. Myers and then uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. 
Yeah, I mean, as evidenced in my motion, I certainly support, and for the record, I'd just like to um, support the intent to uh, recognize the community's discomfort with the corridors plan and to um, direct that there's no further work on the project. And I certainly support, as I've said, um, the need for um, our planning planning department to begin to talk to Safe Santa Cruz and other community groups. So uh, I can't support the full motion, but um, I just wanna go for, on the record on that. Vice Mayor. I just wanted to say that, you know, during the past um, election campaign that there was a lot of um, a lot of folks from the from the east side who were concerned with the corridors plan. I think one of the big things was that not that they just wanted to kill the plan, but that they wanted to be included in the conversation more and have more of a say and be listened to because they felt like they weren't being listened to when the corridors plan was being developed. And so I just want to make it clear that it's not that we're trying to stop affordable housing. It's not that we're trying to stop any kind of development from happening within the corridors, what's happening is that um, the people from those communities have reached out to us because they felt like they weren't included as much in the conversation and we're just hoping that through this, their voices can be heard more and we can move forward with the corridors plan, including the recommendations coming from those neighborhoods. So I just wanna make that clear that we're not trying to just kill this whole project. As a resident of the east side, I uh, agree that the corridors plan was something that wasn't supported by the residents of the east side. So I agree with that, that it is appropriate to not move forward with that at this time. And I also agree with the um, elements around uh, reigniting a conversation around um, how to engage th that area and save Santa Cruz and other interested in community groups. I guess, you know, just for, the, for the record, it's the challenge with that um, and how to reconcile that policy decision um, with at the cost of some of the other policy policy options that we aren't able to move forward with at this time. So here, here to that, and um, um, we'll figure out how to move forward and hopefully uh, make a difference in housing in our community. Okay. So with that, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone and Glover voting in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Councilmember, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. I don't think we actually voted on the other items within the work plan, so. Right. You wanna make a motion? I would move to um, accept the other items proposed in the modified citywide and advanced plan of vision six month work plan. Second. Okay, okay uh, heard a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Brown for <coughs> I believe, Councilmember Matthews. Well, understanding that much of p yellow planners' <laughs> work will be different. Right. Right? So understanding yes. that much of that yellow planner, including potentially their work on the rental data collection effort, since that's within the yellow planners. Did you want to state that in your motion? Yes. Yes, with the consideration that... Um, that planner one or whatever they're being called. <laughs> I was trying not to number them one and two, <laughs> yellow and orange, because <laughs> they're both equally talented. <laughs> that the yellow planner's um, timeline might be affected um, and that the, co the, mo the previous motion on corridors plan um, replaced the, um, the calendar proposed item by staff. Great, and then does that capture um, the other items that are not AP that are in your attachment one citywide work plan as well? Yes, okay. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I well, I as I said at the last meeting, I don't know that I'm necessarily comfortable with saying explicitly those are not going to happen because um, to the extent that these are items that everybody knows we want to take care of and certainly planning staff wants to take care of, I don't want to preclude that from happening. So I think we all understand it. I don't know that stating it is um, necessary or productive. Um, I think I maybe, motion. if I will, I'm hearing something different. I'm hearing that there is sort of a co opportunity cost, and so it will come at a cost of some of these other items. Correct? That is correct. The reality is, um, as much as we can work on everything, we would love to, but given the very assertive uh, timeline in the motion, um, the reality is is that many of the yellow planning planners' items um, will have to be put to the wayside, and the ones that uh, she will be able to do in combination with this, uh, I, the way I would prefer to prioritize it, and I think legally we need to, is to get the mandated ADU items through as well, and then anything else really would have to fall by the wayside. And do you feel that it's important to have that stated that we are putting those by the wayside as a council? 
I can't make that decision, um, but I do want to make it very transparent that um, to manage expectations on our end, because we always want to be accountable to council and make sure that we're meeting your expectations, that the reality is, is that much of these things, uh, if we do, if council does choose stick to, to, to stick to this timeline as we come forward with a report for you, um, that they will have to not be done in the six month time period. If my colleagues feel that is critical to be said in a motion, I won't stop it. I just don't understand it. But thank you. Councilmember Kerr? Would you rescind that language about the um, stating it in the motion? Can you explain? I mean, well, what Councilmember Brown's alluding to, do we need to say that and be explicit in the motion about it? I've accepted it. It's. I, I think, well, the, if I could just to, for clarification, I think it's just the reality that if we're accepting <coughs> this as our six month work plan, but we're making modifications that are gonna influence whether or not we can actually do this work at the opportunity cost of moving forward with the original direction, that's just the reality. I mean, stated or not, I think, so we are accepting this, but we know that elements might not get done. I, I thought I, both of you were on the um, rental data collection uh, subcommittee. How, how are you, think, what do you think about that? Council member, I mean, Vice Mayor Cummings. I just add that we are actually having a, well, I've already met with some members of staff and we are gonna meet tomorrow morning to discuss timeline about the rental data collection effort. So just to put that out there. And I think that something that would be beneficial is that as this work plan is being implemented, that we receive report backs to better understand, you know, which items need to be pushed off, which items will, you know, um, may need to get extended so that that way we can make sure that we're managing the staff's priorities and their ability to get all these items done. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Can I get the that second on that? Was it? It, it was, was me. Yeah. Okay. I'm, motion by Vice Mayor Cummings. to have a reread of it for the sake of the minutes as a more. Sure. Final. So the motion, if you want to reread it, was to accept the remainder of the um, six-month work plan program um, and, and recognize that elements within that may not get accomplished due to the other actions. But I, I think there was the timelines may need to be adjusted um, to accommodate the workloads associated with the new adoption of the corridors plan. Sure, so accept the staff recommendation of the prov proposed modified citywide and advanced planning division six month work plans. Recognizing that the timeline for completion of the items by the staff member in yellow may need to be adjusted um, to take into account the motion made, the previous motion made on the corridors plan. That passed unanimously. Okay, so that will then conclude item number 20 of our general business. Item, okay. So let me script. So the next item is item number 21, and that is the Historic Preservation Commission recommendation on the Water Street Bridge plaque. And we have Ryan Bain, senior planner, who will be presenting on this item. Welcome. Good afternoon. Hello. Ryan Bain, senior planner. Um, back in May, the city council um, made a request um, for the Historic Preservation Commission to make a recommendation regarding the uh, interpretive display or plaque. Um, we took the, um, the item to our June uh, Historic Preservation Commission meeting um, where the commission established a subcommittee um, to formulate a recommendation. That, that recommendation was brought back to our July HPC meeting, uh, open to the public and discussed, and ultimately resulted in the recommendation that's attached to your staff report. Um, so I'm available for any questions, as well as Joe Michalek, our, our HPC chair is here, if you have any questions regarding the recommendation. Do any of the council members have questions for staff at this time on this item? For staff and or commission members and all? 
Um, if, and or commission members, if appropriate. Okay, no, wonderful, thank you. Is there, is yeah. there, I'm sorry, just to clarify, there was a commission member here that you said? Yes, yes. Joe McCluck, our, our chair oh, of the HBC oh, is here. Went. Wonderful, okay. excellent, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for doing the, the work and uh, looking into the issue and then coming together with the subcommittee and then the recommendation, that, that's always nice to see. Um, I appreciate that the uh, commission supports the placement of something on the bridge. Um, I'm uh, curious, it says in the bottom that uh, there would be a representative that would be working with uh, Eleanor Mendoza, and I believe that she was present at the, at the Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Um, have, uh, has, she been, has this been communicated to her, and what is her thoughts on the process? Has any, any feedback from that? I personally have not communicated with her, but you're correct. She was at the uh, HBC meetings and spoke at both of those. Um, I think as part of the recommendation, my understanding of reading it is that, you know, based on it, the council's direction and, and this, if this moves forward, that that would, that communication would happen with her. Um, uh, I see, yeah. thank you. Um, and then I noticed uh, when they're talking about the site locations, uh, the physical site poses a number of problems that would need to be addressed before designing a sign or a panel. So um, I'm just a little confused because I thought it was a plaque, um, but in the recommendation it's a sign or panel, and then this suggests that it would be three-dimensional or something to where it would potentially block a, a walkway, but for all plaques that I've seen that have been commemorating historic or um, notable uh, locations, they have been embedded in the actual uh, wall or cement. Uh, but then also there are couplets, I believe, what they're, uh, or the, the little curved spaces along the bridge where people look out over the river. And so I'm just curious uh, if those were taken into consideration when thinking about the proposed or potential locations of that and um, if that was thought of before this was written in here that it would pose access problems. I might have Joe who kind of worked on that recommendation together. He might, may, might be able to answer yeah. those a little okay. more. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Joe Michael, I chair of the uh, Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you uh, for taking this up. Uh, I might point out that Ellen Mendoza and her petition of 120 people started this process, and it's, it's kind of remarkable from the standpoint of how democracy works, how process takes place, and how it goes on and on. But to address your issue, uh, we looked at the site at River and uh, Water Street. It's problematic from the standpoint that it's very busy. There's a, right now there's a big sign there relative to construction work that's taking place. It's really not visible for people. And we also thought that putting on the bridge uh, is, may also present a problem in that who walks across the bridge? Very few people. So I think it needs a more prominent place if we're serious about it. And you could put it on by the river, uh, on by river and uh, where Wells Fargo Bank is, there's a space there. Or you could put it over by the courthouse, which might in fact be a more logical place. We initially thought that Mission Plaza would be appropriate since the jail was located at the mission, and Mission Plaza represents a lot of uh, historical antecedents for people. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, why we consider that, and we thought that the sign needs to be uh, more interpretive. Rather than putting 40, 50 words on a plaque, it is not meaningful. You need to put it in an historic context. And that context is very complex. A lot was going on at the time in 1877. People look back on it now uh, primarily because sources are more readily available. Uh, much more information is now accessible on the internet, local newspapers, historical records from, from a government are available. There are two recent books that have been published Oxford University Press published Forgotten uh, Dead, which has a picture of the hanging and lynching in Santa Cruz on the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an iconic photo that's been, uh, some people estimate it's the only one available uh, from that time period, one of the earliest uh, indicating lynchings. Mm -hmm. And it's subsequently has been used as a model for if you're gonna do a lynching, this is how you do it, get the people behind the picture of the people killed. You know, you make a statement about it in terms of uh, 
a, a legal representation for people that may get out of line. So there's a lot of history there, and we thought that um, <clears throat> it needs more explanation. It needs a bigger context. Mm -hmm. You know, you can slap something up and put it on the bridge. Nobody's going to see it. I think it needs much more context. And, you know, others can speak to that, but that's, that's our point of view. And we thought that, that the museum is the logical place to begin this because they have, A, they have an exhibit that was mounted in 2013, did a very good job of uh, talking about the lynching at the, the bridge. Mm -hmm. And it's very s subtle, but very sophisticated. And it does not take, necessarily take a political position. There's also the legal history of Santa Cruz County that was published by the Museum of Art and History in 2006 that has a portion of that, one of the chapters devoted to the lynching. They talked uh, about it as uh, the lawlessness and racial strife that was endemic in Santa Cruz at the time. And uh, what else do I have to say? Um, and the museum is uh, a source of community engagement. They just had a, a Chinatown Bridge discussion there. So to me, it's a focal point. They have an archive, historical archive, they know the people that put together that exhibit, so I think that for us is a starting point. The commission itself, um, we are focused on the Secretary of Interior Standards. We're focused on the ordinance. We're focused on dealing with the 703 historic buildings around the Historic Building Survey. Uh, we're not necessarily trained historians, and I think that makes a difference in terms of putting this in the appropriate context. That's why we recommended the museum and you know they know the people that in the community that can help put this together. Right. Well, thank you for that. Anyway, um, that long-winded statement. That's here. perfect. Yeah. No, it's okay. great. It provides me with your perspective, the thought that went into it, uh, the different angles that you're thinking of when you're approaching the issue of history. Uh, so, really appreciate that response. Okay. Um, there, I, I agree with you on many points, especially the need that it uh, to place it in a larger context uh, to understand the history of the community and make it uh, something that's a point of conversation and make it so it's as um, a scene as possible. So whatever that may be and whether well, that's next to the river or on the bridge. Um, I, there were two things that uh, caught my ear when you were talking. The display at the museum uh, is subtle and there was another word you used, subtle and Sophisticated, thank you. Uh, so subtle and sophisticated, which is good. Could you explain what you mean by subtle? And then also doesn't take a political position. Um, could you just expand on that a little well, bit? Uh, you know, and you look at the exhibit that's in the museum. I hope everyone here had a chance to do that. They don't put the hanging image out in front of your face. It's behind a fence. There's a little hole and some people miss it. You know, you read the text from the local newspapers. And what's interesting about that, there's an item from the, the Courier item newspaper, where it's two months earlier in this context, they wanted to hang a white man. And they said, what a terrible thing to do. This is awful. A couple of months later, we're going to take out those Californios. And they were on the rampage about, yes, let's do that and get rid of these undesirable people. So there's, there's some kind of uh, dichotomy there between the, the attitudes of people expressed through the newspaper. And it's, it's, uh, you, you have to read the text. It's, it's relatively um, a fact. It, it's basically factual. You read it and you say, this was what happened. Okay, but then you start to think. You go look at the 1877 newspaper accounts, and it was an extensive coverage in the local papers. And, you know, no, nobody seems to know who did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't believe that, okay? There are 40 people involved in it. You, the sheriff had to know who did it. And there, there are other elements of it, but, you, you know, you can't go back and interview people, you know, 140 years ago. But the, the other element is, is denial of due process. And, and due process did exist at the time, as far as I can tell. Uh, and nobody prosecuted the people who did the lynching. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a, the icon photo uh, became a flashpoint for people in the community. And they used it as a, an object lesson for people. This could happen to you if you're not careful. You know, I'm just hypothesizing that. No, absolutely. They cut up pieces of rope and sold them as souvenirs. So there has to be an element here that could be examined in a larger context. Right, and then hopefully the the inclusion of the rest of the history of Santa Cruz, especially around, you know, 
white supremacy and the Ku Klux Klan, which was in 1922. So yeah, we'll, we can talk about that at another time. But um, uh, thank you for your answers and for your uh, perspective with regards to this. Now, I'll wait until we hear from the public before I make any motion, but that's amazing. Is there any other questions before we open it up to public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if members of the community would like to address us on this item. And you'll have up to two minutes. I would say false narratives of oppression or crisis enable some of the most devastating events in human history. Examples are weapons of mass destruction, a Saddam Hussein, or potentially the Green New Deal that we're dealing with today. This is an example, this plaque, of a false connection between racism and ultraviolence by using a far distant past event with no real evidence such connection existed. The original council direction given on this bridge plaque matter was to ascribe it to an act of racial terrorism. That the false narrative language was taken out for Today doesn't change the message much. We don't need reminders of ultraviolence itself. I think the press has that covered on a daily basis every day. It attempts to connect a narrative about the history of discrimination of Californias instead of sticking to the, for all we know, scant unrelated facts of the actual lynching. My understanding as accounts vary. The actual vigilantes are unknown. We don't know their motives, except if anything, it was because they thought the men hanged were robber murderers that weren't getting justice meted out soon enough. Those hanged and those unknown unknown vigilantes certainly were neither worthy of martyrdom or memorializing. I don't know the definition of a Californio, but as a second generation native, I'm thinking I'm one. These events were regrettable, but very rare in Santa Cruz, occurred before the time of police, the current justice system, before the concept of innocent, before proven guilty, was even a firm idea that came about a few decades later. To me, it is more of the progressive leftist politic of blaming regrettable events on racism and a rewriting of history to serve that purpose. In the time of today, it is an unnecessary, incendiary, unuseful purpose, but in my opinion, an example of a very destructive political purpose that's dividing our nation. I don't really care what happened on the Water Street Bridge 142 years ago, but I do care what happens regarding revisionist history in the here and now. It may come as a real revelation to some on the council, but people treat each other better or more generous and the reduction of human suffering more likely when they are unified in common beliefs. Thank you. Any other members of the community want to address the council? Okay. I think you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, to think that there was no racism back then is kind of absurd because we still have racism in Santa Cruz now. Even though this is supposedly this liberal little community, um, there's abundant racism and I, you know, I, I know that it exists and I'm sure it existed back then. So to me, the best place for this plaque would be on the bridge and in one of those little couplets where you can look out over the, the river. And if they wanna have a permanent display in the lobby of the museum, that would also be good and that could be put on the plaque that, you know, to see for more information, go to the museum and there be, there's a permanent display. And I would suggest putting it in the lobby because that way people wouldn't have to pay to go into the museum to see that display. Thank you. Seeing no other uh, members of the community wanting to address us, um, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for action and uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. So I think that Many of us acknowledge the past that has led to the current United States. There was a lot of violence, racism, discrimination, and a lot of injustices occurred. And I think that a lot of that is evident in the events that happened on the state in 1887. However, in our town, I think that we also need to acknowledge that a lot of progress has been made over time. Um, Santa Cruz strives to increase diversity and inclusion within our community. And I think that what we need to really focus on is continuing to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice within our community so that we come together and we're able to push away negative forces such as ICE that comes in and tries to um, really disturb our Latino communities and other such forces that really try to um, break down our, you know, 
attempts to try to make our community one that's loving, whole, diverse, and inclusive. And so I'm gonna make the motion that we accept the recommendation of the Historic Preservation Commission with the appreciation for their thorough and thoughtful consideration of an interpretive plaque or panel regarding the 1877 lynching on the Water Street Bridge and direct the mayor to appoint an ad hoc committee of individuals with demonstrated historical expertise in this field to develop a recommendation for an interpretive plaque or panel acknowledging this incident in the context of early California history, returning to the council on or before the November 26, 2019 meeting with their recommendation as to format, text, and location. Second. Uh, uh, Read a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by um, Councilmember Glover. Thank you, and then, um, I, yes please. I'd also like to just uh, maybe talk briefly uh, with that motion on the floor about a potentially a friendly amendment. Um, so it was mentioned uh, here with regards to the MA and incorporating them, which is great since that's their recommendation. Uh, however, do we want to set a timeline associated with it just so that, you know, because it's an open-ended date. In all reality, with the issue of this plaque and the commemoration of this um, date, there has been work for the last decade trying to get some kind of commemoration on that bridge with regards to the lynching that took place there. So can we add into the motion some kind of uh, expectation of date and then also the incorporation of community conversation? I just want to say that I did include a date. The date is November 26, 2019, that this should come back to us with the recommendation as to format, text, and location. I just didn't hear the date. And it's on or before. Uh -huh. So if they finish this before November 26, 2019, then it can actually come before us then. Great. So. Uh, yeah, I'm good, thank you. So you're comfortable with the um, motion that you seconded? Yeah, I just didn't hear the um, date the aspect. Okay, um, Councilmember Crone and then uh, Councilmember Matthews. Thanks, I just had a uh, statement I want to read from historian uh, Jeffrey Dunn who could not be here today uh, because of a scheduling issue. Um, Dunn says, I have spent roughly 40 years researching and writing about this event, and I feel strongly that it deserves to be acknowledged and reflected upon by the community. A plaque is one way of displaying such earnest reflection. This was a significant event in our history, and we cannot let this moment of commemorating it slip by. I thank Councilmember Glover and the rest of the council for moving this forward. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Councilmember. Yeah, um appreciate the uh, thoughtfulness on everyone's part that's gone into this and to the commission. Uh, I did speak with most of the commissioners um, extensively with Jeff as well, and I know his history on this. Um, and uh, I, um, I think the direction of um, designating a small ad hoc committee to work on this, uh, and they certainly have the latitude to involve resources from the mall, from the community, et cetera. And I think that, that will come up with a, uh, it gives a good structure for coming up with a um, productive recommendation. And I also do want to appreciate Council Member um, Cummings' um, approach to, in some way, and I leave it to, to this group, um, uh, including our contemporary aspirations to do better, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, and I know that at least one of the um, HPC members uh, who works um, with California State Park suggested perhaps bringing in some consulting for someone who specializes in interpretive work. Um, that's certainly a possibility, but I think just um, uh, designating a small committee of people really familiar with this field is a good way to go. Thank you all. Okay, Council, sorry, did Councilmember Brown and then back to Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I would agree with my colleagues about the importance of um, using this opportunity to um, to really reflect on our, the, our, the present day as well. And so, and I, I really appreciate the uh, work that the Historic Preservation Commission um, put in to, to understand and bring us this recommendation. Um, this to me is an example <coughs> of why we have commissions. We have the, all of this uh, amazing energy in our community and people who are really interested in um, helping this council work through issues. And so I just wanna, you know, to really celebrate that as well as um, the opportunity to um, memorialize or um, re reflect upon the, the substance of the event. 
Thank you. Okay. We'll go Councilman yeah, Lumber yeah. and then back to Councilman Matt. Thanks. Um, I, I know in the motion it says to instruct the mayor to form the ad hoc committee. Just curious what would go into that selection process uh, and how would, because uh, so, because you know, uh, as much as I would like to believe that there would be a super diverse and intricate process of uh, selecting the individuals that are involved in the ad hoc committee, it, I'm a little troubled with putting it all in the hands of one person. Yeah, so we've had, if I can speak to this. Please. Um, so we've began conversations with um, with Jeff Redunn, who has a lot of extensive, who's done a lot of extensive work on this subject mm -hmm. already. Um, we've also had communications with uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Pedro Castillo, um, who also is interested in working on this. So a number of historians have right. already reached out to us about wanting to work on this, and I would actually, you know. Um, I would actually recommend that if other members of the city council have other historians that they would like to you know, recommend to the mayor, that they maybe send her an email with names that they would like to be considered for this ad hoc committee. Okay. Uh, you, you'll have to excuse my hesita hesitation. Um, the majority of my requests do not get fulfilled so uh, when I send them in. So um, just a little little pause there with concern with regards to making sure that if there was a recommendation that I made that it would actually be taken into consideration and then moved on uh, as opposed to just disappearing into a, an email black hole. So um, it's great to know Pedro Castillo and uh, Jeff Dunn that you mentioned before. When you say they reached out to us, who is us? Myself and, and Council Member Matthews had a conversation with Jeffrey Dunn over the weekend. Uh -huh. I hadn't formally met him, and um, so we had an opportunity to meet over the weekend to discuss this item. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to meet with him this weekend. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you. Council Member Matthews. A couple quick comments. Um, uh, it was acknowledged what a great service our HPC does, Historic Preservation Commission. This was really out of their wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, they mostly deal with historic preservation of structures. So uh, I think it took a special amount of effort uh, and research on the part of the subcommittee and thought on the part of the whole commission. So I really commend you for something that was not standard work in trade. You, you don't need to comment, but I just wanted to give you, thank you for that. Br briefly. Yeah, briefly. Breaking protocol. Briefly. Ellen Mendoza mm -hmm. is an important element yeah. of this, and I think she should be considered, if she's willing and able to do it, to be on the committee. That's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Glover. Just one more thing. Yeah, so thank you for saying that. Uh, I do just want to give a big shout out to Eleanor Mendoza, who worked with the different students and uh, educators in the area to bring the uh, data packet forward to me, which allowed, and also, which allowed for me to craft and create the uh, gender report, which was submitted with uh, supporting information. And thanks to my colleagues for co sponsoring uh, the agenda item. So, a great example of how uh, a young student with a diligent focus on making an impact in the community can make some impact and change. Uh, but then also, um, I don't know if, I, I guess we wouldn't want to necessarily incorporate an emotion to prioritize Eleanor if she's interested on the, on the uh, subcommittee or whether it should just go through a recommended email. I think that the mayor has heard loud and clear. Okay, I mean, you, you'll just have to excuse my spec skepticism, but absolutely. But we can move forward. Okay. Well. Okay. Thank you for the motion. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by um, Councilmember Glover. Um, thank you for the work on this, and to um, the commissioner who is here today to help uh, answer some questions as well as staff. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on to our next agenda item, which is item number twenty-two. And that's the uh, role of the Planning Commission subcommittee at community outreach meetings and associated update to the Department of Planning and Community Development community outreach policy for planning projects. And it looks like we have uh, Catherine here uh, and Sarah back. Okay. Back and welcome.
Good evening, members of the council. I'm Catherine Donovan, senior planner in our advanced planning division, and I am bringing to you today um, a draft guidance for our planning commission subcommittee. Um, just some background on this. On August 28th, the City Council approved the community outreach policy for our planning projects, um, and the policy was based on recommendations from the Santa Cruz Voices in Housing, the Fall 2017 Community Engagement Report. Um, and in that report, the public and the Planning Commission had expressed a need for more involvement in all projects at earlier stages um, so that meaningful uh, input could be for provided before projects are virtually um, completed, the development completed. Um, and so in response to those concerns, um, the policy included the Planning Commission subcommittee. The subcommittee consists of up to three planning commissioners and they are volunteers who work on a six month rotation. Um, they attend all community meetings for large or significant projects. Um, and we, the reports from our early com community meetings um, included that there was some confusion and uncertainty as to the subcommittee's role. Um, we also had an issue of some planning commissioners who spoke out in support of projects at the meetings, which is not appropriate. Um, and so at their March 7th and 21st, 2019 meetings, the Planning Commission discussed the issues at length and talked about the pros and cons of the subcommittee and whether it, whether it needed to be disband, disbanded or if there just needed to be um, more input on, on the protocols and the conduct of the subcommittee at these community meetings. Um, and the issues that came up, the pros included how informative these meetings were for the Planning Commission. Like the council, normally you get two or three minutes of testimony from each individual uh, member of the public. And, and that's not always enough discussion. And so the Planning Commission found that being able to attend these meetings and listening to really prolonged discussion f from a, a variety of people helped them in their understanding of how the community felt about projects. And it also gave them a chance to listen to the developer feedback and then to see how developers had responded to the community and whether they had actually made meaningful changes to the projects or not. Um, it also allows the Planning Commission to, to weigh in early to um, be able to make comments to the developer on a project early on when the developer can easily make changes rather than waiting till the project is practically completed. Um, and it's also a, a chance for trust building and community outreach by the, by the Planning Commission. And the cons that came up were the confu confusion um, amongst the public as to the role and also potential Brown Act violations, at least in the eyes of the, the public. There were, there were multiple comments from the public about whether or not this was a Brown Act violation. Um, and also about the possible perception of somehow following um, recommendations or, or comments by the Planning Commission, whether that would give the developers a, a pre-approval or whether they were, were required to, to follow those comments. Um, ultimately, after extensive discussion on this, the Planning commissioner, Commissioners indicated that they wanted to continue with the subcommittee, um, but that they wanted to have um, some established rules of decorum. Um, and they voted to have staff bring this back to the City Council to ask for direction. Um, and given that staff had received this extensive conversation with the Planning Commission, 
we went ahead and prepared some draft guidelines for you um, that addressed the, both the Planning Commission and the public's concerns. And we have um, included those draft guidelines in your packet and we would be happy if you had adjustments you wanted us to make um, to include those in the draft guidelines and either just make them and, and have that be approved or come back with a, depending on how extensive those changes were. And oh, that's it. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Are there any questions for staff at this time? Councilmember Matthews. Uh, just a trivial one. I, I like the general direction of this. So the guidelines are simply a, a refinement clarification on the existing program, which will continue. Um, <laughs> I see the format is that um, the volunteers on a volunteer basis, the commissioners um, are appointed for a six month period for the subcommittee. My only thought was maybe at some point there's a personal schedule conflict. They can't make a public meeting. Could an alternate be appointed? So three planning commissioners could still attend but they wouldn't be on the subcommittee. Right. It's just kind right. of- Right. What we found is that um, they don't always have three attending. Sometimes it's only two, um, depending on, as you say, conflicts and schedules. Um, but I don't see any problem with adding that in there that there could be an alternative. Makes sense. Other questions, Councilor O'Connor? Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, what, in your opinion, what would we be missing if we didn't have this committee at all? Um, the, what I personally see as the most important piece of this is the allowing the planning commission on these more complicated projects to have the more in-depth public input because um, although members of the public do reach out to individual planning commissioners, being able to be at a meeting where there's an in-depth discussion and a lot of give and take and listening to the developer respond to the community is very, very different than the formal meeting format. And I think that the commissioners get a lot out of that and it, it really improves the process. It helps inform them as to the community's concerns and as I said before, it lets them see how sensitive the developer has been to those concerns. And just w one more question is like, what, are there rules that govern like the planning commissioners interactions with um, developers, the people who have projects before them or applications? Yeah, oh, Lee would like to speak to that. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Yes, and there are distinctions between legislative and quasi-judicial actions for the Planning Commission, and that's why I wanted to, to speak to it is because um, for the quasi-judicial quasi actions, the bylaws that are adopted by the Council for that guide the Planning Commissioner's actions um, preclude the conversations um, between the Planning Commissioners and the general public. And <clears throat> as Catherine mentioned, in those instances, the Planning Commission is able to then hear from the community as a large, as, as a whole, um, everyone who's attending those meetings at least, and um, have uh, a, a better understanding of the dialogue that occurs between those community members and the developers who are presenting that. Those same provisions are not um, as uh, much of a requirement for legislative actions. Um, however, um, it, we still invite the planning commissioners to those uh, legislative policy issues that our advanced planning team brings forward. So again, they have more of an opportunity to hear the dialogue uh, between community members about the pros and cons of different options, much more so than you get at a meeting very much, very similar to these where people get up and they, spit, they say they're two minutes and there isn't a back and forth and a, a conversation. 
and I'll just maybe be, and then I'll go to Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilman Brown. You know, I being part of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee, we really talked about how we are being really transparent and engaging the community early on and doing the best we can to avoid any conflicts later down the line. So the intention I just want to really acknowledge behind this is to get misconceptions and um, awareness out there so that we can have uh, more um, thorough and um, efficient really process to move um, to move items or or not so council uh, vice mayor Cummings and council member question so can planning com are planning commissioners allowed to speak with developers before the project comes before them no the bylaws state that um, planning commissioners are not to communicate with either the public or developers for quasi-judicial actions. So if there's a project, a development proposal, that would be a quasi-judicial action that is going before the planning commission. The bylaws state that planning commissioners should not be having conversations with either the public or the developers in advance. So the, the community meeting serves as an opportunity for the commission to hear from the community and from the developer's presentation and then convey that information back. And um, admittedly, we've, we've had some hiccups as uh, Catherine uh, alluded to during the first year of implementation and uh, we're learning from those and I think that uh, this uh, set of guidelines is a good first step and I think um, if the council has suggestions on how that can be strengthened, um, you know, we're, we're open to those and I think that the Planning Commission would be as well. They want also to have a, a clearer understanding of the role and expectations that they have. Just to follow up, I asked that question because <clears throat> I was at a meeting regarding development and the Planning Commission subcommittee committee spoke to the entire audience about the project and so um, maybe that's one of the hiccups that occurred early on, but I just wanted to, that's why I brought this question up because that was concerning to me since I've been in a meeting where I've seen the subcommittee speak about a development that is still kind of in the process of, of, of you know, them applying for their application, so. Sure, and that's one of the uh, things that um, we would appreciate any council um, <clears throat> comments or, or questions on. Um, there are pros and cons to the planning commissioners speaking. Um, it, certainly speaking in a manner that um, would advocate for or against a project, I would not see as something that we would expect from a planning commissioner. However, um, expressing questions about uh, a project or um, identifying issues that may be of a concern early. One of the advantages that we saw of the um, planning commissioner's early involvement is um, at, at one uh, community meeting, for example, a planning commissioner spoke uh, in, in front of the group and said that they had concerns about the the corner element and um, uh, the presentation of that, um, you know, whether it's materials or, or placement. And that can be looked at in a number of ways. Um, if it's interpreted as, oh, well, if they address that, uh, you know, if it's interpreted by the public, I should say, as well, if they address that, then they're gonna get the count, the that planning commissioner's support. That could be viewed negatively. Um, however, if it's viewed as, um, well, that could help improve the project and it's something that early on there is an, a, a larger opportunity to make those modifications um, whereas the project hasn't been finalized, that could be viewed in a positive manner. And so setting that framework up front, that was one of the things that we tried to do with the guidelines is put that framework in place so that those expectations are clear for the community and for the commissioners and that they're stated at those meetings. So if it's the first time someone's attended a meeting and they see a planning commissioner speak up and have a question about, you know, I'm, I'm not really you know, comfortable with the way that that building is addressing the street. Can you speak to um, how your approach was uh, in, um, in designing the pedestrian realm there? And then that upfront conversation 
and that upfront setting the stage for the community can help to um, keep that as a neutral statement and one that doesn't come with expectations of, well, if you address the pedestrian environment, then that commissioner is gonna support your project. So I, I think it is a balancing act, and I think that there are positives and negatives, and those, uh, I tried to articulate how, you know, they could be perceived in the community, and to the extent we can set that stage, then hopefully we're addressing those um, community concerns while also providing a valuable opportunity for the planning commissioners if they choose to do so. We've also had um, planning commissioners say they weren't comfortable speaking, and I think that that's fine as well if they wanna just absorb what they get from the community and report that back to the planning commission, because that's an important part, is reporting their observations back to the full commission so that the commission gets uh, a better flavor for how those community meetings went. Thank you. Welcome. I, uh, I, I just... Oh, sorry. Okay, good. Councilmember Brown. Um, so uh, my question is uh, also for Director Butler: Is there uh, is there anything that precludes planning commissioners from attending these public meetings as members of the public? Um, I understand there, they can't meet individually sure. behind closed doors, but is yeah. there anything that prohibits that? There isn't anything that expressly uh, precludes it. Um, certainly, we want to be careful about Brown Act issues. And so anytime we've got four planning commissioners, four or more planning commissioners at a public meeting, then it mm -hmm. raises potential Brown Act concerns. And so um, there are ways in which that can be addressed in terms terms of um, setting the, the um, expectations for them. However, um, I personally advise sort of a cautious, cautious approach to that and um, say, you know, it's best if four commissioners aren't present at one, just to avoid the perception of Brown Act issues, even if they are following the regulations in terms of not having individual conversations with one another about the, uh, the project. Um, just the community perception is one that we also want to be cognizant of. Welcome. Do you have any other questions? Okay, Councilmember Rives. Sorry, uh, Director Butler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious if um, it, it, are other communities doing this similar kind of process? Is this sort of becoming the norm with regards to? I'm just curious about. Um, or, you know, I'm just curious if this is happening in other communities at all. And uh, I mean, it does place a lot of pressure, I feel like, on the commissioners because um, they're being really asked to participate in a way that's not completely clear. So I'm just curious if, if this is starting to become more, more uh, you know, more common with communities. Sure, different communities do it in different ways. Um, and, um, some better than others. Um, I had a, a uh, I've seen a community where, for example, two of the commissioners actually um, sit on a decision making, a lower decision making body. The, the two planning commissioners sit on a lower decision making body along with a council member. And that raises concerns about due process and future um, uh, items getting appealed. And so I would not recommend that approach. Um, however, um, I think that there is certainly a, a push to involve the community earlier in the process. And um, many cities are looking at ways in which they can and do that. And so I, I think different cities do it in different ways, um, but certainly the earlier we can get folks involved, the, the better opportunities that they have to, to shape the future development applications. Any other questions for staff before we open it up to public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if members of the community want to address us on this item. You'll have up to two minutes. Please come forward. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I think there's a perception among the public that a lot of these developments come forward completely fleshed out and that the uh, outreach to the community is basically just a dog and pony show and that the planning commission is just basically rubber stamping everything that comes along. So uh, personally, 
I would like to see the public involved at the earliest point possible to add input into development so that it doesn't become the developer just foisting something onto the community, but there's actual community involvement in what's being done here. Thank you. Are there any other members of the community? Okay, seeing them, we'll return back to Council for Action and Deliberation. And I think I'll just go ahead and sort of restate what I think, you know, is, is evident here, which is that we do want compatibility with neighborhoods and community involvement early on. And so as we're starting to learn the best approach to that, I appreciate um, this potential process. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and look at Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my concern is um, doing the public's business in, in, in public. And um, I was at the same meeting that uh, the vice mayor was at. I was at two other meetings um, where this, you know, you had strong advocacy uh, on the part, it seemed to me, of, by, by commissioners. I would like to make the following motion. I, um, in the interest of fairness and the removed taint or bias by city officials, from the review of land use development projects. The provisions in the, develop, in the Department of Planning and Community Development, Community Outreach Public Policy for planning projects for a planning commission subcommittee tasks with attending community meetings shall be deleted. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Brown. I believe it was Councilmember Matthews, then Councilmember Brown. Um, I'm actually kind of um, agnostic on that. I see the, the value of the uh, subcommittee. Um, I, I certainly support the direction that has been taken to um, have a graduated matrix of expectations of public outreach and involvement. And it's certainly valuable for, um, particularly on the higher uh, profile or larger projects, to um, <coughs> have these kind of earlier outreach efforts, meetings with the public, and encourage planning commissioners to come. Whether or not they should be required to come, I think that's a different issue. I should also say uh, regarding whether four of them might want to attend, um, I, don't see, I don't think there should be a prohibition against that. I don't think you quite suggested that. But there again, it is, there is a different dynamic at a public meeting, so it can be quite useful if you um, anticipate that this is the early stage of something that's gonna have a lot of um, community visibility to go and observe. And I think um, the important part of the guidelines here um, should be almost whether or not <laughs> there's a subcommittee that if you go to one of these meetings, it's kind of like when we meet with labor representatives, you are listening. <laughs> you're not, you're not, uh, projecting conclusions in advance. So I think that's the value. You go, you get the dynamics. There may be the opportunity to ask a non-leading question, how are you handling such and such, um, and get an answer. So I think there's a value in, in, um, in the early uh, outreach efforts and uh, in uh, encouraging planning commissioners to go, but, but being clear on the guidelines. So I think that's the bottom line is the attachment. <laughs> Uh, I uh, tend to agree with Council Member uh, Matthews about this, and um, so, you know, I really believe that, um, as Council Member Crone has suggested, that having planning commissioners attend these meetings in an official capacity um, has caused us problems, and I'm not sure that written <coughs> guidelines are going to prevent that. I really appreciate staffs attempts to, to, to do that, to, to help clarify, and I think that they are useful um, and ought to be uh, used as guidelines for planning commissioners in general, and so I'm wondering if the maker of the motion would agree to um, include that in the direction. What's the exact wording? Uh, to, to use the proposed guidelines for the subcommittee or the proposed protocol, um, whatever the term. Attachment terminal. three. Attachment <laughs> three, thank you. Um, that um, those would be adopted as guidelines for planning commissioners in their participation at public meetings, should they do so. Page is that, could you? 
attachment three. three. Attachment three. 2215. What is it, 2215? Sorry, 13. I don't have page numbers. I Thank get you. it online. And if um, I could, th th those would have to be modified because they refer to a, a subcommittee structure. So if you just strip out that and just say, should planning commissioners attend an outreach meeting, these are the guidelines and expectations. I, 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 as you were speaking, I was totally agreeing with you. I, I do go back to when you said they ask leading questions. I would um, rather have as many planning commissioners who want to go to public meetings, just like council members, but not, but to observe and not necessarily participate because you, as you know, a lot of our actions can be perceived by uh, different ways in the community. And um, I'm totally in favor of four or five planning commissioners going to a meeting um, to observe and to see what the community debates about. But I would prefer if we could maybe send this, I don't know how you um, put it in the resolution, but if we, they could not like necessarily ask questions or you know applaud or. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, Vice Mayor Cummings. They want to respond. Okay, go ahead, Councilor well, Brown. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I am sort of operating under the assumption that um, as council members are expected to do, um, we that that is the responsibility of planning commissioners to um, act accordingly. Um, I th so if. The goal is to say um, planning commissioners can't ask questions at public meetings, should they attend and include that as an additional guideline? Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not. Uh, we'll take that one, ask questions and provide input related to cities, land use and design policies. I would, I would take that out. And, but out. the others I, I like, learn about the project, listen to public discussion, report back to the planning commission. And I think that it's, it's really good for us to make clear, just like we should make it clear to ourselves, that w more than three of us can attend meetings. Mm -hmm. It's just that we cannot okay. communicate with one another in the sense of it looks like we're making a decision. Right. And I would expect planning commissioners to do the same. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Matthews. I was gonna, um, speak to my support of this just because of the fact that um, I think that it's really important that if planning commissioners want to go to meetings and what's been reiterated that they should be able to go. Um, I do think that it's problematic if they're going in an official capacity. And so I just want to um, voice my support for the motion and also that um, under the guidelines that have also been included around, you know, the intention of them attending these meetings is to learn about the project, listen to the public discussion, mm -hmm. and then also report back to the commission. I think those are all valid things we want our you know, planning commissioners doing at these meetings. And I think that um, the time for them to weigh in is when these items come to public hearings. And so I think that um, I just want to say that I'm in support of the motion. A, a question of staff. Um, when these meetings are held, is there always a staff member who attends? Yes. So really, that kind of alleviates the need for um, the, oh, now I've lost it, the uh, function of providing input on city procedures or something. I mean, if some member of the uh, public says, well, I don't know how XYZ is going to be handled, you'd turn to staff and staff answers that. So. We're not losing anything on that. Yes. <laughs> and then I just also wanted to comment, um, sometimes on these uh, developments of various sizes, there's a lot of public interest, curiosity, opposition, whatever, support, um, and uh, a lot of emotion. And in fact, the project meets the district requirements. So there's not necessarily, as much um, latitude or, you know, possibility to require changes as members of the public might think, and that's good to know. <laughs> well, I am. Um, I'll just say that I support, absent a formal process, having an interest in wanting our planning commission to engage with the community early on to hear their concerns to help that it's a preventative policy, right? I mean, I think the approach is to really try to mitigate the things before they um, escalate in a way that doesn't feel like they've, the community's been heard or um, their ideas have been incorporated. So um, I'm supportive of the direction and um, if happy to, to I'm wondering follow if, them. pardon me, I apologize for the interruption. I'm wondering if um, the motion could be restated. Sure. 
-hmm. Why don't we have you uh, restate the motion, uh, Councilmember Crum? Believe. Thank you for that. And then we had a uh, second by Councilmember Brown. And can we also put um, the A, B, and D in there too? Would that be appropriate to um, what um, Councilmember Matthews was um, alluding to, wanting people to participate and be there and observe, but yeah. not? But we have a staff member to answer substantive questions about city policies and stuff. The motion, um, in the interest of fairness and to remove any taint of bias by city officials from the review of land use development projects, the provisions in the Department of Planning and Community Development Outreach Policy for planning projects for a planning commission subcommittee tasked with attending community meetings shall be deleted. Okay, so that was a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Could I ask for clarification of that? Is the motion to approve the draft guidelines with that modification? So, so that was the, uh, my request was to amend the motion to include uh, the draft planning commission subcommittee guidelines provided in attachment three of our agenda packet, that those would be approved as guidelines for planning commission, revised and approved as guidelines for planning commissioners who choose to attend public meetings with the exception of, where is it? Um, da, 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 number, can you remind me? 2C. Council Member Crone, 2C. 2C, thank you, 2C. What Through is, the mayor, may I ask a clarifying question? Sorry, Council Member Crone. Yes? You go ahead. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm hearing is that we would, um, the direction would be to disband the commission, but retain the Sub guidelines. Subcommittee. Sub oh, I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> the subcommittee. Um, um, and to revise the guidelines to be applicable to any planning commissioner who attends a meeting. Uh, deleting asking the, the section about asking questions and yep. providing yes. input right okay Catherine. and this would actually involve revising the policy itself because the policy has the direction for the subcommittee mm -hmm. that was kind of the direction my question was going is it sounds like there's what the council is discussing <coughs> is modifications to both the existing policy and the draft guidelines mm -hmm. so the direction would be to have you revise that based on the input you received from the council today. Okay, does that feel comfortable for the council? Staff? Okay. Yes. Clerk, do, did you feel a clear? Okay, city attorney, you're feeling good with uh, this Just too. going to ask if the council would like the revised guidelines and policy to be returned to the council, perhaps on a consent calendar for be, further council review. That'd be fine, that'd sure. be fine. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure we're clearly capturing it. Right. Great. Okay, so we'll see that at a future time on consent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move right on to our next agenda item, which is item number 23, which is the resolution endorsing the Green New Deal. And this was an uh, item that was continued from the prior meeting, and that's item number 23. I'll go ahead and ask staff, I mean, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and ask uh, the city council members that brought this item forward if they'd like to present on um, the agenda <laughs> item before I open it, it to see if there's any questions amongst uh, the council and then go ahead and open it up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so this was a continue from last time, like you mentioned. Uh, that was uh, due to some additional language that had been added uh, by myself and brought forward for some potential amendments uh, to include the uh, Senate resolution as well as the House resolution uh, for our message of endorsement, but then also some language in it that uh, made it a little bit stronger in my opinion and the opinion of uh, community members and some people involved in uh, environmentalism locally and fighting climate change uh, to hold specifically corporations uh, more accountable and then also uh, make sure to bring in language with regards to uh, protected communities, the issues of labor, the issues of transitions from existing fossil fuels over into a green economy and uh, some other items. So you can find the language in your packet and happy to answer any questions or uh, clarify. Okay. 
Um, well, I guess I just have maybe one clarifying question. Is um, this was an item that was brought forward by uh, Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and uh, Councilmember Glover, and then um, revisited to have a conversation. Is this an item that you are in uh, support of as a committee, or was this um, just the updated version that was originally provided, just for clarification? Councilman Brown. We had a meeting okay. as, the, as uh, the three of us had a meeting um, and, the, and with um, Tiffany Wise West and the outcome of that meeting was that this would be the um, version that was brought to the council. Okay. And was this the version that was, uh, is this version supported by Tiffany and our city attorney or um, did they have any input or did our the city attorney has not weighed in, but yeah, I oh, don't. Okay. I don't have any concerns yeah, about it from a legal perspective. Yeah, Laura's here. She can comment on that. Uh, Laura Schmidt, interim assistant city manager. I think from Tiffany's um, perspective, she is extremely supportive of the Green New Deal in general, and she worked with the council members offline. And so, um, she. We leave it to you at this point as far as the details of the conversation. Okay. So in concept, but not necessarily in specificity. Okay. Okay, is there any other questions for the subcommittee members? I just wanna also add one thing. Um, <clears throat> first, I wanna thank Tiffany for all the work that she's done on this. She does tremendous work for our city, um, helping us become more sustainable and meeting uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases, um, which is something that this community very much cares about. And I just wanna be clear that from the last meeting, um, there were a number of the, of um, be it further resolve clauses that um, weren't in the initial proposal that was brought to the city council, which is part of the reason why we wanted this to be reviewed. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that um, Tiffany in no way removed those and those were reintroduced, that those items were new items that came forward at the last meeting. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to go over this before it came before the council today. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted that to be clear. Thank you. For the clarification. Okay. Councilmember Glover? <laughs> I'm a little confused. Uh, um, <laughs> so that is true that there were additions that were not in previous uh, versions. However, it is also true that the language that was present in the one that was in the last agenda had been altered from the original language, which had changed the language around businesses and corporations. So there, are, there were additional clauses that were added, you're absolutely correct, but it was also reintroduced because of some reintroduction of some original language. Just put and I guess up. the only thing that I would respond is that um, some of that, I know that some of that language had been reviewed by the city attorney's office and that there were um, recommendations that were made around that language and that that original version had been agreed upon to be included last time. And so that was another, so I'll acknowledge that that is something else that um, Council Member Glover w w was hoping to have changed in this and it has been included in the current version that we have before us. Absolutely, Along thank you. with the additional clauses that it weren't, that were introduced at the last meeting. Absolutely. Council Member Myers. <clears throat> Um, I'll support the resolution, but um, I, yeah, I guess also I just want to congratulate Tiffany and the city staff on an award that the city received this week called the Beacon Award, which um, recognizes that the city is well on its way in our climate change and um, uh, climate change efforts and uh, will be the city as a whole will be recognized in October for that. So just important for our community to know that um, the city is actually a leader in many of the things that are that are um, cited in the resolution. So um, I believe that we're working hard and uh, I'm happy to let's call the vote. <laughs> we have to, we have, this is questions and then we'll go, we have to open it up to public comment oh, first. Okay. Did you have any other questions before we open it up to public comment? No, no. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment and then we'll Sorry. come back for the, for the motion. Go ahead. And you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Hi, Elise Casby here, environmental activist for the last about 40 years. Um, so I just want to say that the politics of climate change is well underway, sadly, 
very, very sadly for the American people. And the Green New Deal, from my understanding, has been pretty greenwashed by corporations. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the definition of greenwashed. Um, what I hope the gen general public will start to realize is most of us has, have been, sadly, very misled about the scale and scope um, that climate change is about to impact all of us and is already impacting people around the world, indigenous people who live up on the ice, ice fishermen and women up there. Um, around the world, it's well established and it's well underway. It looks like we might have 10 feet of sea level rise, possibly as early as within the next 10 to 20 years, possibly earlier, 10 feet sea, sea level rise here. So I just wanna say that um, <clears throat> I have a book to recommend by Dar Jamil. Dar Jamil is one of the most excellent investigative journalists, in my opinion, that's alive and working today. I became aware of Dar Jamil when the politics of uh, the Iraq war were underway. And as we all know, weapons of mass destruction were never found there. Um, our reason for going into Iraq was pure and simple oil for the uh, oligarchs here in America and around the world. Um, Dar Jamil presents a very readable book. It's called The End of Ice. It documents many of the different ecosystems that will be impacted by climate change, not only sea level rise, but forests and so forth. We are way behind. This Green Deal is probably way behind. Everybody needs to get up to speed. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Garrett Phillip. Uh, this is an example of one of those you know, false uh, crisis narratives. Anyway, the false climate change narrative disingenuously spun by the lustful, filthy, lucre-grabbing or anti-American principled socialist change activists must be opposed in the strongest terms or be one of them by your silence and ignorant support. Their narrative is chocked full of lies. Real scientists would tell you that lie number one is that science is at a point where, is, is not at a point where it can predict climate 10 to 100 years into the future. Climate is an example of one of the most complicated systems to model there is, and the current understanding is uh, beyond us by orders of magnitude. Models of equivalent complexity would be like predicting the timing of earthquakes or the exact location, category, and landfall of hurricanes a month from now or 10 years from now. Lie number two is that CO2, a single contributor to climate that is estimated to influence climate in the 2% range, man's part far less, is a lever that can control climate meaningfully. Lie number three is that alternative replacements will magically appear to any of the things they wish to up the yin yang, including all carbon based things or dependent things, including oil, coal, paper, iron, steel, cement, glass, aluminum. They will simply be taxed to zero effect on anything except the ill effects on those who pay for this ignorance. Your particular support resolution contains repugnant intentions to violate the sovereign rights of individuals. The phrase future policy will help create high quality union jobs which pay prevailing wages, blah, blah, and guarantees wage benefit parity for workers affected indicates a decided preference to deny citizens their absolutely identical right to negotiate for themselves without unions, show a preference for central planning of all kinds, and shows an unwelcome rights interference in labor negotiations. I remind you, you should not be representing unions, but only on the behalf of all people's right to fair negotiations and the side of the people in public union negotiations. You are too far on the wrong side of this. My motivational guess is vote pandering. If you don't think the reality is a small percentage. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Brett Garrett, and I just want to say thank you so much for hopefully unanimously endorsing the Green New Deal. It's very important. It's one of the ways that, that Santa Cruz is a leader on these issues. Um, I strangely have a point of agreement with the previous six, uh, speaker that scientists can't predict what's happening 100 years in the future, and at every turn, we're finding that their previous predictions um, we're too conservative, that the climate is getting worse faster than anyone predicted, and that appears to be likely to continue, and we just have to do all we can, and thank you so much for endorsing this uh, Green New Deal resolution.
Hello, uh, my name is Dr. John Conway. I'm an environmental scientist and uh, the head of research at the Romero Institute. And I would just like to thank all of you and particularly Tiffany Wise West for your leadership on and climate action and sustainability. Um, because it's very, very clear that if every city and county and state and country in the world does not undertake actions like this and faster uh, and very soon, then we will have failed as a human civilization. Uh, and, and I would like to see that not happen. So thank you very much for your leadership and I encourage you to all vote to support a Green New Deal. Thank you. Hi, my name's Anya. I'm 19 years old and I live in Santa Cruz. I am here on behalf of Sunrise, um, which is who proposed the Green New Deal originally on the national level of all. Um, I think endorsing um, environmental legislation and getting environmental legislation through is absolutely essential to create a livable future. I feel as though if we do not take a major environmental action now, it will create a future that is not good for anyone. And with that said, I think environmental legislation needs to be just for all people and for all people to live. And one person said here that we are well on our way to climate change efforts in Santa Cruz. I do not believe we are well on our way to climate change efforts. I feel scared when I go to bed at night. I cannot sleep at night because I'm scared for my future and my chil when I have children, their future. And my friends cannot sleep at night. I have my best friend who cries to me at night because she's scared of her future. We are fearful of our future and we have a right to be fearful for our future. We already see climate change affecting our futures now. We see islands going underwater. We see wildfires. I cannot move back hardly to my hometown because I am so scared of fires being able to go through the hometown. I live very close to paradise and is one of the towns most likely to be affected. And so I really hope we take more concrete action in the future and support more environmental action because this uh, environmental action is not enough alone. But with that said, I think it's a stepping stone for our future. Thank you. Hello, can I submit a document for the record? Go ahead. And pause. <laughs> cool. Uh, my name is Grant Black. I'm 21 years old and I'm the hub coordinator of Sunrise in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm here today to let y'all know that we do endorse this Green New Deal and we certainly hope you guys do as well. A uh, special thanks to Tiffany Wise West uh, as well as Councilmember Glover and his interns and the people at his office for drafting this vision statement. We support climate action and we see this resolution as a building block in which our city will develop a concrete Green New Deal in word and deed. We want to see a just transition for the displaced workers and the unemployed by creating thousands of green jobs through infrastructure, retrofitting buildings, and new public transit construction, solar installation, and an emphasis on smart agriculture with sequestration emphasized. Um, we also want to see an emphasis on social and racial justice in this Green New Deal in this region. Uh, additionally, I would just like to say this is a really serious crisis and I appreciate the council recognizing that. But we have a long way to go and the youth are definitely waiting and the youth are definitely looking towards you for guidance and we will continue to be here to pressure you until we see it. Thank you. Are there any other members of the community who want to address the council on this matter? Okay, seeing none, you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I think that it's uh, imperative that we support the Green New Deal and that the city itself uh, work on implementing as many of the uh, projects and uh, other things as possible uh, on a timely manner because time is running out. I mean, we don't have 100, 200 years to work this out. We have a short period of time to reverse what is going on or at least uh, if not reverse it, halt it in its track so it doesn't go any further. Um, so I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't just uh, 
endorse this project. There's a, a, a lot of uh, conservative uh, people out there like Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity that are saying, oh, the Green New Deal, we're gonna have to get rid of all the cows, we're gonna have to stop using airplanes and uh, you know all these other nonsensical things that they're pushing against the Green New Deal and it's always gonna cost you know trillions of dollars. It's actually gonna create so many jobs implementing these things that it's going to pay for itself and the fact that these people will be working and paying taxes and so forth and so on and it'll create new industries so i hope that you're all supportive of this thank you yeah okay we'll go ahead and return back to the council at this time council member glover council member brown and then vice mayor cummings council thank you Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers from the community. Um, I think as was illustrated uh, in the comments and also with especially the news in recent weeks with the heat waves in the Arctic and the Amazon rainforest on fire that we can uh, hopefully come together unanimously and uh, move this resolution forward uh, with the goal of acknowledging all of the fantastic work that we've done so far in the city of Santa Cruz to address climate change and um, mitigate the impacts that we'll see from that, but also uh, as a statement of the hope for our future endeavors that can be ideally even more ambitious with the direction that we go and the uh, roles that we take. So um, I'd like to make the following motion that we uh, adopt the resolution endorsing the Green New Deal, House Resolution 109 and Senate Resolution 59, as well as uh, direct the mayor to send a letter of support for House Resolution 109 and State Resolution 59 to the city's congressional delegates. Second. Second by Councilmember Crone, and the, I believe it was Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I, so I just want to make a couple of comments, having been involved in bringing this before the council. Um, and primarily what I want to say is that um, given that this is a uh, resolution that's advisory in nature, um, and um, it took some time to, to get it, um, to us, um, you know, I think it's important that we we um, are supportive and that we make uh, we rec we um, communicate that support. Excuse me, to our congressional representative. Um, I um, could wordsmith some of this language a little further, um, and we unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to do that at our last meeting. Um, so that said, I'm supportive of it. Um, coming to us now as it is. Um, what I really am interested in though is the important work that we need to do to actually um, in, create policy and programmatic changes, the, re the things that we need to do to actually address climate change. I see this as uh, an important step to acknowledge it, to let um, uh, our congressional representative know that we're supportive um, and hope that he will be too um, at the federal level, that m it is a much bigger challenge than we al can deal with alone in Santa Cruz, but we certainly have our part to play. And um, I want to thank um, Tiffany Wise West for working um, on this with us. And I really look forward to working with her and with the community and my colleagues um, as we <coughs> move forward with things like building electrification and, and other policies and, and programs here at the city. Mayor Cummings. I just want to echo um, what Council Member Brown just said because um, I don't think that our work stops with just moving this resolution forward today. I think that as has been mentioned by many members of the public, we do have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> Having been working at the front lines of a lot of these issues, um, I've I did my PhD work in Panama. I've worked on climate change issues in the Everglades and continue to work to with youth for them to understand the impacts that we're having on our environment and to help um, educate and promote future leaders to become um, leaders in the conservation movement. So I'm deeply committed to moving forward policy and working with the members of our community to make sure that we are moving forward with implementing change. And I think that 
after this um, resolution gets gets adopted. And as we mentioned, we weren't able to wordsmith this as much as we were hoping to at the last meeting. But um, that as this moves forward, that we as a community continue to move forward with taking action in the form of policy to make sure that we're actually continuing to stay ahead of many other cities when it comes to trying to draw down our greenhouse gas emissions and become a more sustainable community. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Um, I uh, do support the uh, Green New Deal. I have just a couple, I know people don't want to wordsmith, I have a couple what I think pretty minor uh, changes I would like to suggest here. Um, the text and the whereas is uh, make it clear that this is an aspirational document. And um, I just have a few on the very last page. Um, I, I consider these tweaks and I hope they'd be uh, accepted as friendly. Um, at the top, be it further resolved that um, I'm dropping out local, that businesses, organizations, and corporations should be held accountable through policy and regulation for the environmental degradation caused by their products and practices and recognized for their contributions to environmental sustainability. So I, I hope that would be acceptable. Um, and that's on, uh, for the, do you want to go through it and then have this um, to be individually Accepted. I'll, I'll, I'll just read them and then people can react. Okay, so <laughs> we'll go through all through all yeah. four through. Uh, we'll go through all of them and then have a further discussion. Okay, and just to clarify, thank you. The, just to clarify, this is the first. Be it further resolved on the second or third on the last page. This is, I think, the well, it additional. It depends on how your page lays out. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the packet. So there's four pages in my packet um, that is on and Just posted be it online. Be further resolved that local businesses. Okay, and one. so your suggestion there is. I'll read it again. Yeah, and uh, just be a second. Be it further resolved that businesses, organizations, and corporations should be held accountable through policy and regulation for the environmental degradation caused by their practices and products and recognized for their contributions to environmental sustainability. So as opposed, to, uh, so can you just let me know why you wanna take out local businesses as we are writing a resolution for our local area? Uh, and then also, is there a reason why you wanted to remove out the language environmental degradation caused by waste and pollution generated b through day-to-day -day business and products they sell? Just curious. I, I thought practices and products was more general. That's all. I'll just, if I could maybe, yeah. and I'll weigh in. You know, I, um, I support the removal of local businesses. I think, you know, as the representative of the city going to the National Conference of Mayors to advocate that multinational corporations, particularly big oil, be held accountable for mm -hmm. their contributions to kind of clump them together with local businesses that I think we really try to work with to become green businesses feels sort of um, uh, uh, trying to mix a positive potential approach with a negative one, right? So we, I think, fully want to support national big oil, like those, there needs to be accountability there. And right now they're seeking immunity. And so I think that's consistent with that. And so for me, I think that's where I sort of see, feel a rub too between that being blended in with the local. Cause there's sort of, I mean, there's major contributions that big oil knew about for over 50 years and deceived our public about. And, and, and it's sort of hard to mix the two for me. Another, just another, uh, what, why I added that last line, recognize, for contributions to environmental sustainability. Um, Tiffany came and presented to the Community Affairs Committee of the Chamber and on her climate adaptation plan and uh, was so well received and taken so seriously. I think we want to um, include, especially at the local level, the awareness and engagement of our business community and our organization. So yeah. that, that was my reason. Absolutely. Um, what, uh, 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 how do I say this? Um, yes, I totally agree with everything that y'all just said. Um, and if it's just the removal of the word local as to assume that businesses and multinational corporations encompass <laughs> as well the local, then I'd be okay with removing the word local. Um, I do want to point out at the last meeting, it was cited that there were somewhere around 500 green businesses in the in the area. Um, but in some further investigation, the city's green uh, business de department or whatnot reports 190 green businesses in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, and then 
looking at all of the other businesses that exist and the business licenses. Some, for example, are like yacht charters or McDonald's or uh, all the apartment complexes that we uh, have here in Santa Cruz. So those are not uh, green businesses and are have a, you know, in my opinion, there's not very much accountability with regards, especially like lane charters. So they're dumping stuff into our water because of the how much they use their engine all the time. Um, so I hope that we can understand that, yes, there's a green business program. Yes, we're working with our local businesses. Uh, yes, there are 190 great green businesses registered here in Santa Cruz, and we want to appreciate them. Uh, also acknowledging that we have a massive amount of other businesses that are not green businesses, some of them multinational corporations, and some of them directly impacting the environment. For example, um, if you saw in this previous week's Good Times, the photo contest winner. Did uh, anyone see that? Just anyone on the dais? No? Um, it's a collection of plastic beach balls that have found their way uh, on the San Lorenzo River and uh, jammed themselves underneath the overpass at the base of Ocean View Park. So the question that begs then is what are we doing or what is the boardwalk being held accountable for, for their toxic plastic waste that they are emitting into our marine sanctuary uh, that is documented now in the, um, in the good times. But I have to be honest, I, who used to live up in the east side area by the park, would walk that consistently and notice the inflatable hammers that you get at ticket booths and all of the other garbage and trash that's accumulated as a direct result of the boardwalk being there, not to mention all of the oil that comes off of their machines in a uh, marine sanctuary, not to mention the noise pollution or the car and exhaust fumes from people driving continuous circles around looking for parking to stay there. Um, so there's a lot uh, just in that one corporation with regards to environmental impact. And so I wanna make sure that we're having strong language in our resolution, even though it's not binding, having strong language in our resolution so that then we do look at future policies, we can seriously take into consideration the impact that our even, even our local corporate Corporations have on our uh, on our environment. So, if it will make you more comfortable, I'm happy to remove local uh, since businesses does encompass all of that. But I do think that we should be very clear that there is environmental degradation and waste uh, generated by this work. So I don't feel comfortable removing that that language. I'd love to hear from my colleagues about it. However, though, on this on this line, uh, Councilman Matthews. Uh, it's a journey. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take this meeting till 6.30. Um, I would like to strike out the local. I think add the word organizations because this just talks about business. There are plenty of other responsible parties. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add the term recognized for their contributions to environmental sustainability. Um, if that's acceptable. Um, I, uh, yes, I'd, I'd just love to, I'd love to hear from at least the seconder of the motion or my colleagues in your opinions on, on this and the language um, and where specifically, because do we want to rec recognize specifically those that have achieved their green business certification and are proven to be environmentally sustainable? Because if we just say, hey, great job, everybody, then you know, it just loses its, like, what do you mean we want to congratulate those that have been doing the things? Where, where is that benchmark, you know, so. This is general, and there are so many benchmarks for mm. so many different endeavors. I'll just say the other two I wanted to suggest, uh, I'll go, and then I'll be, be done. Um, two uh, resolves below that be resolved that future policy, we should guarantee that these new jobs, I would say, aspire. And uh, the very next to last be further resolved that through the climate action plan, we commit to align, I would say, aspire. And again, I, I don't think, I mean, this is described as an aspirational document, and I would just like to modify those two words. I saw Councilmember Brown's uh, hand. Specify what it is. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of the non-substantive language changes, I'm agnostic. Uh, you know, I what, whatever people we can will get us to the finish line here. Right. Um, in terms of 
the um, I, you know, I think it is important to suggest that we're recognizing uh, and you know, kind of affirming uh, where positive practices exist, and we kind of do that with our certifications and uh, the you know recognition that the city gets the work that we do. So it's happening. I don't think that um, by saying it here, we're suggesting good job, everybody, and but you can always improve. There's continuous improvement in some cases, and in other cases, we have to push pretty hard. So. Um, and then in terms of the, so on the other ones, you know, Aspire, you know, I'm fine, I'd be fine with Aspire, work, you know, work to, you know, work towards these jobs, you know, something like that, um, because I don't think we can't, I just don't think it's possible to guarantee yeah, we it. So can't. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I don't have a problem with, you know, just, it, I don't think it's weakening it, I think it's just uh, kind of reflecting reality. All right, Vice Mayor Cumming. Um, so I agree with that. And then I think the other piece where um, in the first, be it for the resolve that we were discussing around organizations rather than local business, I think that that's appropriate and multinational corporations and then striking Santa Cruz. The reason being is that we want to encompass all organizations and multinational corporations <laughs> in and beyond Santa Cruz to make sure that everyone's being held accountable. I don't think that we should focus directly on Santa Cruz because we want to, I mean, the statement that's being made is that we want to make sure that organizations and multi-corporations everywhere are doing their part. And so I think that striking in Santa Cruz um, would be appropriate. And then I also think that the other changes would also be appropriate as well. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Is we're just going to strike local, but leave businesses, comma organizations, and multinational corporations. Want to clarify? That's fine. Um, and then, uh, sh then we can make the other suggested changes. The only thing um, is the 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 union job question of, you know, the word guarantee. I think it says that we should guarantee. Now, it doesn't mean that we will guarantee it. It's that we should guarantee it. But if there's a different word that you would prefer in there as far as we'll strive to, you know, uh, that through, through future uh, policy we strive to. Uh, Fine. Strive yeah, is fine. Strive to. Okay. Wonderful. Because that at least uh, creates the language of effort. You know, we're trying to as hard as we can to do it, but we can't guarantee. And then the last modification was commits to align. You change that under the second to last further, be it further resolved, to aspire. Is that correct? Okay. Is that accepted? And just with to further, re be it further resolved that through the city's climate act, climate and energy action plan 2030 uh, and health and all policy programs, the city as aspires to align with state goals pertaining to emissions reductions. Similar with the other. Yeah, yeah, that's just so that we can all be on the same page, why not, yeah. I would just add, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but if, if, it's, if it's of interest of the council, just to incorporate in multinational, big oil, just to call out big oil um, specifically, <laughs> because the control, they're <laughs> significantly responsible and they should be absolutely held accountable because they've continue to contribute to this crisis and deceive the policymakers and the public. And so what would that language read again, just one more time, sorry. Just add it to after multinational if you want. Multinational corporations and big oil or something, okay, yeah. Sorry, I just I like about that. I like that. Okay, <laughs> okay, Think, are we there? We're there, okay. All right. Do we have clarity for our city clerk? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, why don't we take a five-minute transition break to the next item. Good job, everyone. I'm just gonna adjust item 24 so you don't have to go all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Really? Yeah. I think I can go see if. But they're on. I didn't want you guys to know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a quorum. I think hopefully some folks will come to kind of trickle in. So we'll go ahead and get started again. <laughs> and I gave a kind of a heads up to the people in the back. So we have um, now on our agenda, we're on item number 24, which is Vision Zero. And so we have a presentation from staff and then we'll follow it up with uh, questions, public comment, and then um, action and deliberation. So we'll head it over, head it over to you. Good afternoon, my name is Jim Burr and I'm the transportation manager and uh, Claire Fleesler is here with me, a transportation planner. And uh, I just briefly, I just want you to know that the transportation division is really committed to transportation safety. Um, regardless of your action today, we will continue to be committed to transportation safety for all of our roadway users. Um, we believe we're making efforts in all the right places. Uh, the city, um, through their Street Smart program, through engineering for sure, and through our OTS grants with, uh, with enforcement stings, uh, we believe we're doing all the right things. Uh, I think the numbers are agreeing with us. I'll have the traffic safety report out later this year, and I think we're gonna see some really great trends. In particular, I believe bike collisions have dropped greatly, um, like over 50% since 2015, uh, and uh, I'll back that up the report again later this year. So um, what we've laid out here for you today, I believe is one way to say yes uh, to uh, you know, another ask of our very small division, uh, but uh, Claire will explain more about it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Again, I'm Claire Fleesler, Transportation Planner with the City. And before I get started, I also want to recognize that we have Phil Boutel, the Chair of our Transportation and Public Works Commission here, as well as Teresa and Lauren from the County Public Health Department um, through the Community Traffic Safety Coalition, who's been working regionally on Vision Zero efforts, most recently uh, really, really lending a hand to the City of Watsonville in their undertaking. Uh, today, we're, we have a brief presentation for you. We're going to go through generally what Vision Zero is, the, uh, the actions from the Transportation and Public Works Commission, which I'll abbreviate TPWC frequently, that got us to this point, um, a general discussion, and then move towards our recommendation. So Vision Zero started in Sweden in the 1990s and has become a, a worldwide effort. The overall goal is to reduce and eliminate serious injuries and fatalities on our roadway. This happens by changing the approach um, from traditional to Vision Zero approach, which recognizes that serious injuries and fatalities on our roadway are preventable, that human error is inevitable, and that we should, we should plan and address our roadways through um, a systematic approach to really address uh, the fact that human error will occur and to continue to improve traffic safety for all of our roadway users. This is the most up-to-date map from the Vision Zero network of Vision Zero cities in the United States. As you can see, uh, those coastal cities have been taking us on, and middle America, not so much. But uh, we're not the first, and we won't be the last that's considering this. Why are we taking this on? The primary reason is because bikes and pedestrians in our community are disproportionately likely to experience serious injuries and deaths on our roadway. Um, proportional to the percentage of roadway users, they see much higher rates of serious injuries and deaths. And this is based on the American Community Survey five-year estimates of mode share and the statewide integrated traffic reporting system, SWITERS, um, collision data. The, uh, in order to address this, the Transportation and Public Works Committee formed a subcommittee which met over a six month period with their primary objective to do a deep dive and make a recommendation on if a Vision Zero undertaking in the city of Santa Cruz was an appropriate response. They spoke to internal city departments including city manager's office, public works, planning, police, fire. They spoke to um, external agencies that are doing Vision Zero including the city of Watsonville, Fremont and others um, and they worked uh, closely with the health Health Services Agency, mainly with Teresa Rogerson, who's in the audience here. They met over six months, they did 17 meetings, and they spoke to 21 individuals who have, have been or would be involved in Vision Zero efforts. They identified many concerns and areas of opportunity. Primarily, as, as Jim identified, and as you all know, we have a very, very small staff, and we're very busy. Um, and this is one more project to add to 
our plate. Um, as you know, when you take something on, there's something else that doesn't get taken on. So really identified that as being one of the big things. It's a, a resource limitation to implementing this. Um, additionally, I believe it's attachment four that you have our, our existing strategies on collision reductions, one of which is Street Smarts, which is now in its third year, um, just launched last week. You may have seen the press release. Um, and it went from a successful citywide program in years one and year two to a countywide program. So we do have an, in, an education arm of this already in existence. Um, additionally, a desire to have a overarching policy that focuses all of our efforts on traffic safety. One of the things we say in our department is that safety is kind of our north star of how we approach our projects. And one of the things we always bring to our commission is that we don't propose the second safest alternative, which is often why you get neighbors coming before you that are a little upset that the safest alternative is slightly more inconvenient. So being able to have that policy approach there that says safety is our number one objective and those are gonna be hard choices for you. Um, also, uh, looking at efficiency, at cooperation and coordination, because it's an interdepartmental effort. Public Works is the main player here, but it also impacts police for enforcement, fire for response times, the city manager's office as the, the overarching um, you know, arm of the city in that coordination. And then looking at the big picture and how do we really address uh, our roadway needs and our overall transportation system in order to achieve reductions in reduction, reductions and elimination of serious injuries and fatalities on our roadways. So looking at this, the TPWC subcommittee uh, identified these as elements that address the concerns that they heard. Looking at the staff burden and thinking about uh, going after existing grants that exist for Vision Zero development. Uh, pending your action today, there are some existing grants that we could pursue to assist with this effort. Um, utilizing the existing model we have for the internal climate action team that we have that is represented of almost all city departments and really increasing interdepartment communication on, on transportation issues. Um, recommended not making changes or minimal changes to the Street Smarts campaign and uh, really recognizing, we're thankful for this, that staff does excellent project work. We have a long list, as you know, I say this number all the time, we have $17 million in grant funded and programmed projects for specific safety improvements that we're going to be doing between now and 2021. We're really proud of that and it's as a result of our prior planning efforts that really identified and prioritized by pedestrian our active transportation planning network. Um, and. Uh, the TPWC subcommittee really identified that this would be a new set of project prioritization <coughs> tools. So with that, uh, this is just a pretty highlight slide of some of the projects we've done recently. Uh, the B40 Creek Path, the Pacific Avenue Contraflow Lane, the Felker Street Bridge, the Beach Street Bikeway, really um, within Public Works, our priority is to increase separation, increase safety, and put forth the um, the treatments on our roadways that do have the highest rate of safety. That's why you see so much effort from us coming towards completely separated facilities, including the rail trail, which is taking up a lot of our time and we're really excited to move that to the next phase. So in conclusion, the recommendation coming out of today is that council adopt a resolution in support of a Vision Zero policy for the city of Santa Cruz and direct staff to form a Vision Zero task force beginning in 2020. Um, to identify what this would be, the first task would be an internal audit of our existing programs to identify what it is that we already do. So again, attachment four highlights some of those things. Um, and then to prioritize what those gaps are. What are we not doing and how can we step into those things and make a, a more holistic Vision Zero program? And then as a result of that, after that internal audit, to develop a Vision Zero work plan, which would be reviewed at the Transportation Public Works Commission before coming to you at Council for deliberation and action. And with that, we're available for any questions. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the um, staff from the Council? Council Member Myers? I just have a, <clears throat> a couple questions on the staff report under the fiscal impact section. Um, it talks about redirecting uh, some of the work that the department uh, currently does annually. Um, specifically, it talks about grant writing for transportation projects, which of course I'm assuming um, also include trails and, and alternative transportation, which again goes towards our goals of trying to reduce emissions in the city. Um, do you have a sense, for example, I don't know if you do four grants a year and you're gonna only be able to do one or sort of kind of what is the scale of that? So in other words, um, just if you yeah, could comment absolutely. on Absolutely. Um, 
We apply for every grant that we are eligible for over the next, I have them written down on my phone, so sorry if I'm being rude looking at it. Um, over the next six to eight months, we will have the Recreational Trails and Greenways Grant Program, which is a great program for rail trail, multi-use paths, potential river walk enhancements. We'll have Caltrans planning grants, which we could go in for a wide variety of projects looking at uh, continued transportation planning. Um, highway safety improvement program, which sounds like highways, but what we've used it for is sidewalks, uh, protected turn lanes to enhance cyclist safety, intersection improvements surrounding city schools, and identification of high collision intersections and needed countermeasures there. Um, the active transportation program, Cycle 5, which is the biggest bear of a grant I've ever taken on. Each one of those applications takes about two months of my time. Um, and Office of Traffic Safety Grants, which last year we were successful in partnering with the police department to get expanded overtime hours funded to uh, really target school bell times, high collision corridors, and uh, weekend night drunk driving enforcement. So um, you may or may not know this, but within public works, within the city, uh, I do most of our, almost all of our transportation planning grant writing and uh, project grant writing with support from our engineering team, but it's primarily just me. So it's a lot of grants that we go after trying to implement the projects that we have on our existing project list. Right, and thank you for that. And um, I'm just curious, it mentions in the staff report too that um, Looks like the city manager's office would be doing the zero, the Vision Zero Task Force um, implementation or organization. Is that correct? Right. That was that, that was what that. was recommended by the I think the, the commission that uh, we help coordinate the, coordinate that. Yes. Okay. And is there is there staffing available for that as well? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why it's recommended to do the twenty. This start in uh, in twenty. Uh, 2020. 2020, right. Okay, great. Could, could I just clarify something that I think that stood out to me? I don't mm -hmm. want to. Yeah, sure. No, I, I think I'm done for right now. One of the things that I um, see as, you know, completely um, synergetic is the connection between Vision Zero and health and all policies. And I know that works coming from the city manager's office. So as we move forward, and I know it's referenced in the agenda report, the, the um, uh, the best way to marry the two um, in terms of timing and efforts seems really appropriate and consistent with each other's values. And I'm sure other jur jurisdictions have done the same, likely. So I'll go ahead and return back because I interrupted. Did you have any additional questions? No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of, of the effort for sure. I'm just trying to understand sort of how it fits into the workload and the programming. Um, and uh, certainly, certainly see um, that we do a lot of work already, but um, just trying to kind of weigh all that out. Right, and, and, and we did the same, and mm -hmm. that's why we want to put off implementation until 2020. We would, um, we are hoping for not a full-blown public um, circus of a project. We did uh, extensive outreach for the Safe Routes to School Complete Streets Master Plan um, just four, four or five years ago, and then rolled that into more outreach for the ATP plan. We have 200 and over, I don't even know, 246 projects or something on the books, you know, ready, grant ready, if you will. And so current projects will not be impacted, but the next, the, the next projects we want to go after mm -hmm. will be impacted. In other words, uh, mm -hmm. the grant writing, which funds all these projects is, is one of the key mm -hmm. pieces. Additionally, this is the same staff that works on our parking programs. And so all of the TDM that we're doing uh, is also comes comes out of the staff, and we have a number of ideas that we want to do above and beyond the TDM in in mm -hmm. in terms of new parking programs downtown. We want um, some uh, on demand uh, permits. We want some residential permits, and so we we have a lot of ideas, but. Anyway, a small staff to take that on. So it's not current projects, but future. Yeah, if I may expand on that, just in one thing. The things that are on our plate right now, as you guys know, we have a, a very, very um, small amount of discretion in our CIP, and most of our, the heavy, heavy, heavy majority of our transportation projects are entirely grant funded. And what that means is the projects that we're currently working on have grant scopes, schedules, and budgets, and we can't simply set those aside and remain in good standing with those funding agencies who we depend on for those future projects that we use to implement roadway safety projects. With that said, we're really trying to find a way to say yes to this in the, the constraints that we all recognize. Councilmember Brown? 
Yeah, um, thank you for uh, the presentation and thank you for you know, all of your work and, and trying to, to make this happen. I know it's something that a lot of people in our community are excited about. Certainly the Transportation and Public Works Commission has put in time as well. I appreciate that. Um, a question I have is in fiscal impact, you um, it's suggested that implementation of existing plans for bike and pedestrian safety projects, programs, and initiatives might um, be compromised. Yeah. And so, but, you know, given the visions, the intention of Vision Zero, you know, future projects and future improvements, that just it seems mm -hmm. counterintuitive to me. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, and then really quickly, is it okay if I ask a question of uh, Commissioner Patel who's here? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah to, to what you said um, and to our small staffing levels, we, we depend on all of us to kind of go all in on the projects we have. Our entire engineering staff is full up with the implementation of projects that we've gotten prior grant funding for. So moving through the design phase to the construction phase to the completion phase. In terms of upcoming projects, primarily those fall onto my plate to do all of the grant writing and preparation for that in order to obtain the funding to implement that next round of projects. Uh, in the, the coming year with putting, um, if we move forward with this, with putting Vision Zero primarily in our public works division that will fall onto me, that means that I will have less time available to pursue those continued grant opportunities to fund the projects that we have on our existing uh, project list from our active transportation plan. So that's what that, that's what that means. Really, we want to try to do everything, and our big goal is to try to implement as many of those projects as possible to continue to improve roadway safety. Um, and so it's it's kind of taking a pause on that, seeking funding for implementation, or just not having as much time to aggressively pursue all of those opportunities because we're spending time on the planning phase, which is not wrong. It's just a a reality of kind of the the staffing levels that we're operating within. Got it. <clears throat> Yeah. Did you have additional questions? I have a question for Commissioner Patel. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so if it would be helpful to hear a little bit more, you come on if you would. Is that okay? Absolutely. I know when I'm supposed to yeah. talk. Okay, great. Thank you for all the work you've done to um, pull this together and, um, and really the energy around it. I am wondering if you could talk, tell us a little bit more about the rationale for having a task force. I and mean, with the city, we really love our task forces. And um, we, they take a lot of time and then that's additional staff time. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, it, task force um, comprised of whom, you know, timelines, et cetera. I understand the start date would be, move, and I appreciate the, Kind of recognition of, of our staff constraints, um, but if just it would be helpful to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. <clears throat> so, our again, uh, Claire outlined kind of our process. So we met with a bunch of people over six months, and it was pretty extensive. Um, we went into this. Uh, I was on that subcommittee along with a couple other commissioners, not knowing much about the program side, the process of it all, how a city would adopt it. We just knew that other cities successfully did it. And one of the biggest lessons we learned was kind of the, the best practices out of all these interviews, all these cities that have done it. And um, most of them said, don't adopt something right out of the gates. It's gonna take a lot of stakeholders, a lot of buy-in, and making sure that everybody, it, it, we wanted a, a very successful program at the end of the day. And that meant not forcing anything onto anyone, and it meant really a collaborative effort and establishing some kind of task force to, you know, I guess from our chan our understanding, kind of uh, all we're allowed to do is make a recommendation to you guys as council to make policy. And the specifics of that policy, we leave up to you, but we also recognize that if it came straight to you, council might not be ready to adopt a very specific thing and there would be some development time in there. Um, so, and, and I think all that coupled with, um, we think our, our number one partner in this was of course public works and transportation staff. And we wanted to be a partner together in that. And um, so uh, we recognize maybe it's a, a slower step than we'd take. And uh, like you said, task force take time and they take effort and stuff. But I think in the end, um, we want a city that, uh, or we want a policy here that everybody in the city can stand behind. Follow-up question. So, in terms of um, again, I, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the like the, the pieces of the puzzle and you know how, what, how much time and who and when and all of that. Um, and I know that's to be worked out. But um, I guess it, I'm just thinking 
again, because this is something that the Transportation and Public Works Commission has been very interested in pursuing, um, and we really rely on our our commissions to to really roll up their sleeves and do some of this work, or a, a lot of it in some cases. Um, is this something that the commission could kind of do some of the the heavy lifting to help with the staff time burden and resource burden to facilitate whatever process it is that is needed to have those conversations and develop the policy? I think uh, I'll say subject to Brown Act limitations of only three of us being able to work on it outside of meetings and stuff, I think it would probably be pretty easy to find three commissioners that would be on board to, to help support this effort as much as possible. Um, uh, that being said, um, you know, it's a, we, it left our commission thinking like there's a lot to develop here. We, we knew it and we decided not to go down that road at, at the, into those weeds of the policy level. Um, but if that's the direction you want to send back to the commission for us to further pursue, I, I think that could be one avenue to do it. Does that address your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Other qu Other questions? I have Vice Mayor Cummings. That was your question? That was my question. Okay. Then I had uh, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Cronin for questions. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at this report, um, drawing on existing resources. Um, uh, I did wonder about under the auspices of the city manager's office, I, I hear that the bulk of the work is going to fall on public works. But you guys will coordinate with other departments, is that? That's yeah, right, to help, to help coordinate, right. And, and I think particularly if there was going to be a, a, a community group, that was the other sort of reason for that. Uh, yeah, and, and there again, we get into the capacity issue. Correct. I'll just leave it at that statement. Um, is it anticipated that with the formation of the, of the task force in early 2020 that the action plan would be delivered, it says within a year of adoption, but within a year? Looking or at, so, is that? Yeah, I would anticipate that uh, early 2020, and really the 2020 timeline is pushing it out so that in the fall and uh, you know throughout the end of 2019, we can spend our time in transportation really getting our TDM program off the, off the ground, which right. is launching this right. fall, and so a lot of activities around that. So looking towards when we will have some staff time opening up. Um, you know, I think the first activities as recommended would be to do, do an internal audit and really talk about what are the things we already do and identify where those gaps are. I think we do already do many of these activities. It's just a rebrand of many of them and bring them under one umbrella of a Vision Zero program. I think a year long timeline is probably sufficient with the caveat that if the public process gets more robust than that, which it may, it might take longer than that. Just a comment, I have been on some committees and task forces in the past where they just say, you got until this date and you have eight meetings. Work it out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, it, it exerts a discipline on mm -hmm. the process. Um, I do not like the idea of you being pulled away from grant writing. That seems like uh, not, a, not a, not a good choice. Um, I see here that there's the statement, some existing and anticipated projects may be need to be filled with outside help. So that would be pulling in consultants or contract personnel. I mean, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, we can build more uh, outside consultant help into our, into our future projects. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's not a solve all because consultants need a lot of oversight and they don't have the same ownership. Uh, I never see the same kind of ownership with a consultant mm -hmm. as I do with city staff. Yeah. Uh, and um, so it, it helps, but it won't, but it's, it's not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just tearing off that, this is one that usually would be, you know, celebrating and cheering what a great thing. And we're just trying to recognize like, how can we make this happen right. within the constraints that we have? Mm -hmm. So I recognize that we're presenting you kind of a difficult a happy thing that is in difficult circumstances. And I, I don't expect an answer, but um, to the extent you can um, um, compromise to the least extent your grant writing, because that's just eating your seed corn, you know. Mm -hmm. so I hear then Council Member Cronin, then Council Member Myers. Just for clarification, did I hear correctly that ideally you would want to wait until January for the implementation, the beginning of this to happen so that you could have the rest of the fall to finish grant writing. 
No, uh, the rest of the fall to launch our TDM program for downtown. So we have a lot of activities coming up, September, October, November, December, and then we'll still have a lot of activities, but at least then we will have initiated them all and hopefully they're in a more uh, stable place at that point. Councilmember Crone Crone and then Councilmember Myers. Thanks, my question was asked, thanks. Just um, kind of a clarification, I think, from Councilmember Brown's um, question. When you asked if the commission could be involved, were you in kind of envisioning sort of a role for using the commission as a task force in a sense? I mean, in terms of, I'm just a little clarification on that. I mean, were you looking at that potential? I, well, I was, I didn't have a particular, you know, crystallized vision about that. I was just trying to think about the potential for the commission to have some official ongoing involvement um, as a way to, you know, get toward, get us to a policy, a, a recommendation to the council. Um, that, so I, not like not specific to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just maybe, um, well, I guess I'll reserve my, my comments until after we hear from the public. Do you have any additional questions? Is there any additional questions at this time? I have one additional point when you're considering making a motion. The sixth whereas includes the word accident, traffic accidents. If we could change that in the motion to um, collisions. That's my oversight. <laughs> whereas traffic collisions disproportionately impact bicycles and pedestrians. Okay. That could be reflected. I think um, it's appropriate to open it up for public comment at this time. Do you want to be our first speaker for public comment? Okay, why don't you go ahead and get started. Any additional members of the community who want to address us on this item, please uh, light up to my left and you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Okay. Um, so I'll just add to uh, some of the discussion that came up. Uh, one regarding grant writing. One thing we heard from jurisdictions, municipalities that had taken on Vision Zero and adopted it, um, they also recognized that it was a staff burden. Certainly every one of them said that. But one trade off uh, that nearly all of them pointed out to us without us asking is that they had increased success in grants because Vision Zero, adopting Vision Zero, gave them extra, I guess, safety points or something within the grant writing process. Um, and again, this was highlighted as a specific trade off. Um, uh, so, green salt there. Um, and then, as far as development, the the only path we went down, it was mentioned in Claire's presentation, as far as not necessarily how we would develop the program, but we did look to the the climate action team um, within the city here as possibly a model because that seemed like an interdepartmental cooperation thing where there's multiple stakeholders recognizing that um, it's not just one group, it's definitely not just public works doing it. Um, in Vision Zero, you know, the parallel is it, it involves police department, it inv certainly involves fire department, it involves public works. Um, there are all these groups. So we thought it, even if we don't know the exact content of what that a group would do, at least there's some kind of model for how they work together. Again, we had suggested on the aus auspices of the city manager, if that works out, if you can find a way to make it work. Thank you. Next speaker, please. You want to speak? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and just acknowledge you'll go after um, Brett here. Okay, good afternoon, I'm Brett Garrett. And uh, yeah, I strongly support Vision Zero and um, as part of the health and all policies, I, I think this is very important. And I wanna echo something that Mr. Butel just said, because I had it in my notes as something to say that I've heard Vision Zero makes it easier to obtain grants for those projects that enhance bicycle and, and pedestrian safety and well and safety in general. Um, and those are the projects we wanna be prioritizing anyway. So. So yes, whatever we can do, I definitely want to be a supporter for bike and pedestrian projects. Um, and I, I, I'll, we have a pretty dismal record of bicycle safety in this area, and I'm relieved to hear that it is improving. I look forward to seeing that data. Um, I, I am one of those uh, pedestrian safety statistics because uh, in 2012, I was hit by a car crossing the street as a pedestrian in Capitola. Um, so that's one of the reasons this is close to my heart to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. Um, please support, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and pause for a second. Uh, sir, I'm gonna go ahead and pause you for just a second. I just wanna acknowledge the uh, woman in the front who indicated she wanted to speak but needed to sit, is that correct? 
Yeah, my name okay. is Sherry. Why don't you come on up? Yeah, come on up if you can, and we'll go ahead and have you uh, speak for two minutes. And well, um, I just like to say I, I'm sure that you, maybe some of you know that um, Seattle has banned that orange bicycles out there, the electric bicycles, and there's been over 2,700 um, accidents in San Francisco. They're seriously considering banning the the bicycles, and I've heard people that they are kicking the bicycles. They're mad at them. They turn they turned off when they're they owe them money or they're charging their charge card or whatever. Or they went too fast. They can't control them. They can't control the brakes. They can't control the speed. I know that they go really fast, and even children are allowed to drive them. I saw a guy leaving the bus stop, and he said, I haven't been on a bicycle since before the 60s. And his kids were going, well, follow me. Let's go around the Santa Cruz. And I thought, some wobbly old woman like me wandering around with my load of garbage. Like, you know, someone like that and I are just, like, destined. It's just a scary I just wonder if you if you ever consider at least making them go 15 or 20 or something like that, or, you know, asking people, have you ridden a bicycle lately? Because I thought the guy was totally saying, oh, I, I guess I'll figure it out, like stepping on the gas. So that's all I have to say about that. I thought we were talking about the buses, and I want solar lights put on all of the bu the buses for women's protection. Thank you. Um, I'd like to. Uh, my name is Bill Cook. Um, I'd like to thank uh, city staff. Uh, uh, they. They, uh, they work really hard and they do excellent work. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, my thoughts are that um, uh, Vision Zero is a different concept entirely. Uh, it's, uh, it's been, uh, to my observation, extremely successful elsewhere in the world. Uh, <clears throat> this is a cultural change this w that, that we're embracing with this idea. Uh, it's a shift of paradigm. Uh, it's uh, Vision Zero has been uh, 30 years in the making. It's successful. Um, uh, embracing success is a heck of a good idea. Uh, so I'm here to encourage that. Uh, it's it's the it's not primarily uh, an infrastructure uh, solution. Uh, fundamentally. The speed limit is 20 miles an hour wherever bicycles and pedestrians are uh, sharing space with motor vehicles. Uh, in addition, there's all kinds of physical infrastructure, speed bumps, chicanes, and such like that are, are brought to bear on the problem of calming traffic. Uh, that seems, in my, <clears throat> in my view, uh, that seems like low-hanging fruit. That seems like that's reachable. Uh, we are, this, to, to fully implement this, it, it's a generational thing, but uh, in my view, we could reduce our speed limit in most of the areas where cars, pedestrians, and bicycles are sharing space to 20 miles an hour. We could do that. It seems very doable. And that would um, reduce fatalities dramatically if if there were a way to enforce that. Thank you. On the next speaker. Hi, uh, Mayor Watkins and council members. Thank you for bringing this um, item to your agenda. Um, I'm Teresa Rogerson, as Claire mentioned, from County uh, Public uh, Health, and. We've been, um, you know, helping different jurisdictions around the county to adopt Vision Zero. Um, our first city uh, was Watsonville to adopt Vision Zero, and so we've been assisting them. And I, I think of it as a way to help um, all the departments involved, especially Public Works and the Police Department that we've been working with closely, um, to kind of focus their efforts and create more efficiency. So I'm hoping that in the long term, this actually saves some time. Um, and we're also available to assist with grant writing. Um, 
and with the city of Watsonville, we also assisted with um, public outreach and um, developing their action plan um, and uh, doing some data analysis. So we certainly would make ourselves available um, to the city of Santa Cruz as well, and we'd be happy to do that. Um, so you have some free consultants, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, anyway, so thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you considering this item. Greetings, Council. Brad Snyder, um, no longer a resident of the city, but I, I want to talk about the jump bikes a little bit because um, I think she, had, she made some very valid points. You're talking about how uh, traffic, um, uh, like uh, uh, problems with with uh, uh, traffic, disproportionately affected people on um, um, on foot and on bicycle. Um, <laughs> well, electric bikes are on that continuum of motor vehicle, and it it, it is kind of a nuisance. And as someone who doesn't really um, care to have a, a smartphone because of the, the, the frustration and annoyance uh, factors of it. You know, basically I'm completely excluded from ever using a jump bike and I feel like you guys have engaged in, a, you know, kind of like uh, committing a lot of civic space to something that, you know, I frankly don't think I'll ever use. I've had an electric bike, they're fun, but they also are quite dangerous. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and City Council. My name is Gina Cole. I'm the Executive Director at Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm here to express my support for pushing forward with the Vision Zero policy in your city. Um, uh, again, as Teresa had said, Watsonville is moving forward with Vision Zero policies. Um, it is a belief that we can have zero traffic fatalities and zero serious injuries. Um, as a avid cyclist and as a bicycle commuter from Watsonville, um, I'm on the road a lot. And I'm on, you know, rural streets that, thank you to uh, smartphones and maps, are those rural routes are now becoming very, very popular as a means of shifting off of the highways. Um, but that is really greatly impacting all of, again, rural roads like Larkin Valley, um, where you wouldn't expect to be passed by 35 cars in less than a quarter of a mile, but I, I am. Um, and also on the surface streets. So if a policy like this that can be put in place that is going to slow traffic down, because we all know that speed is where it's at. Speed is what it makes the difference between what's a fatality and what's an injury. Um, and if we can put into place infrastructure and buffered bike lanes and calming circles um, and what have you that will help folks slow down. They're not gonna do it on their own. They need, they need guidance. Um, that we can create a safe and healthier, a safer and a healthier community here in Santa Cruz. What I really love about the city is that it is very bikeable. Um, it is very walkable, but I see close calls every single day. And if we can reduce that, more power to us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers who'd like to address the council? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Hello, Council East Casby again. First of all, I wanna um, just praise the Street Smarts Educational Program. I believe that it has definitively saved my life. I live very near the intersection of Pacific and Laurel Streets, and so I go through that very major intersection usually several times a day. That's like three or four times a day. So recently I was almost killed because um, I was moving into the far lane from downtown, moving across the street, and a uh, SUV, I don't know how it fit in that far lane, but it basically blew through the red light. And if I hadn't been um, extremely cautious, and I have been, uh, warned by those street smart signs in the buses. I'm a total pedestrian bus 
take her. I have no car and I don't ride a bike yet. So um, I just want to say um, I went to speak to that person who was a woman at Walmart or Walgreens rather in the parking lot and told her, you know, you just almost killed me. If I had taken one more step, you definitely would have hit me. I'm concerned because my friend is extraordinarily tired. He doesn't get good sleep and he works really hard and I'm afraid he's going to get killed at that intersection. So again, I think this program is extremely important, especially street smarts. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. I am very concerned. There's other things I want to talk about. Pacific Avenue, the safety is deplorable. I almost get hit every single day by skateboarders and bicyclists. I'm really worried about that. Okay, I'm extremely concerned about the implementation of this program. I believe that the, um, I just know his name is Dettel. Mr. Dettel is an anti-environmentalist. He is absolutely dead set against doing anything uh, that's environmentally friendly. Uh, when we brought in that parking uh, consultant who was so helpful, Patrick, somebody I don't know his last name. Mr. Dettel just said all his data was completely different and I really have concerns about the police also in, as a partner in this, in this uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. All right, then you'll... Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of Vision Zero and uh, enhancing the safety of pedestrians and bicycle riders. And one of the things that would actually help the most would be reducing car trips. The, the fewer car trips there are within the city, the less likelihood that there's gonna be an accident or a collision of some type, whether it's between other cars or car bicycle, car human. Um, so I think emphasizing the reduction of car trips is a very important uh, element of this entire program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead now and return it back to the Council for Action and Deliberation. I can't make a motion, but I hope that um, as we move forward, the element within the agenda report that has that timing for initial adoption of this policy can be a key tenet of the Council's new health and all policies effort be incorporated, because I think they really do have a lot of um, potential synergy and alignment. So I'll just sort of put that out there. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone. Yeah, that was, I think that this is something that um, our community could really benefit from, and I was actually going to oh, say that it fits very well within health and all <laughs> policies and what we just um, passed earlier with, on, with, along the lines of the Green New Deal and trying to reduce carbon emissions. So I'm prepared to make a motion sure. um, that we adopt a Vision Zero policy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious injuries on city streets by 2030. Um, that we task the Traffic and Public Works Commission to develop and implement a Vision Zero Action Plan <clears throat> within one year of adopting this resolution. That we gather, analyze, utilize, and share reliable data to understand traffic safety issues, to prioritize resources based on evidence of the greatest need and impact, and to evaluate the success of those efforts Affirm that no bike or pedestrian project should be delayed due to adoption of Vision Zero. Request that staff return with a recommendation on what projects would be delayed to divert staff time to Vision Zero implementation. And that we work with county partners as grant writing consultants. Second. We have a motion by um, Vice Mayor Cummings, second by Councilmember Crone. Would you be willing to incorporate the um, health and all policies as a potential area for alignment and adoption and synergy um, as a consideration? Yes. Okay, is that a, that's accepted. And just a question, but how, how do you vision or envision that in, in, in Vision Zero, like an example? I would say all. that if you were to think of how it would fit is the health and all policies framework would probably be sort of the more um, broader kind of uh, uh, initiative that encompasses sustainability, equity, and public health. And Vision Zero would be a tenant of one of those efforts that would fit and align perfectly, in my okay. opinion. Thanks. But I think we can explore and operationally how that could actually play out as we move forward. Okay, Council Member Governor. Thanks, yeah, absolutely uh, support the motion. Um, did want to just make sure that the staff request, I know it was 
made notes in our page, but I think the they sixth have, whereas change the word accents to collisions, please. Yeah, there's a friendly amendment to make that change in the motion. So essentially in the resolution at the sixth whereas the traffic instead of accidents, it was collisions. to be collisions. collisions instead. Okay, you made that. She got okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. Any other uh, comments at this time? Okay. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Did you catch that, um, Bonnie? Okay. Got it? Okay. Okay, so we have, um, this is it? Two hours. Yeah. Two hours. What? Hey, you know, <laughs> you never know. You really don't. So we'll go ahead and reconvene at 7 p.m. this evening for oral communications. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our 7 p.m. session of the August 27th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Before we uh, begin, if we do need uh, overflow, we'll go ahead and have the Tony Hill room available at the Civic um, for the evening session, but at this point, it seems that we'll have adequate space, so we'll see how that goes. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member, it's Crone. Here. Lover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown is currently absent. Thank you. Here. Vice Mayor Cumming. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. So we'll go ahead and move on to our oral uh, communications portion of our agenda. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. I am assuming that everybody who's lined up to my left is here to speak at oral communications. Um, and you will each have two minutes to speak, and we request, if possible, to have your uh, name signed in if you're interested in that. It's not required. I'll also just remind those who are here this evening that oral communications and the evening item, if you're here to address the council, we are here to hear you, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens and the process, even if you disagree with them. If you do speak out and you uh, speak up when somebody else is trying to speak, I will uh, give you a warning, and if you continue to disrupt the meeting, I will ask you to leave. Um, I don't want to do that, so I hope that there's an opportunity for people to um, move forward tonight with uh, the ability to have respect for their fellow citizens in this process, um, but want to be very clear about how tonight will flow and go. Um, if you do have signs, you're welcome to hold them below your shoulders, but please don't hold them above um, your shoulders or in a way that's gonna actually impede the person behind you from being able to see. If I see you doing that, I'll ask you to please lower your sign. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started so hopefully we can get to everybody. Can I get a sense of who is here to speak um, for oral communications? Okay, so we'll try to get to everybody. Oral communications is generally about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, we can potentially go a little bit over. I will um, go ahead and allow for, uh, since we're starting a few minutes late, until 7.40. And so if you need your full two minutes, you're welcome to take it. But if not, and you want to get your uh, point across in less than that, it will allow for other people to speak. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, please stand, uh, go ahead and get started on my left. And you'll have up to two minutes. Thank you, my name is Elise Casby. I am here wearing a Red Cross emblem because democracy is under assault in Santa Cruz. And so I just wanna say, first of all, the sentinel misrepresentation of our two council members where they put a large headline, conduct inquiry reveals misdeeds, and then they have their pictures prominently positioned, is so deceptive as to be a full on lie. Really, really sad for democracy here. I would recommend that, I wanna stop short of the B word, which sounds a lot like cottage cheese, B blank cot. Let's not go that far, but let's make sure that the Sentinel knows that we will not tolerate a misrepresentation of the truth because in fact, the Rose Report largely, completely exonerates our two council members from 
any wrongdoing. What is happening in this city when Cynthia Matthews, Martine Bernal, Bonnie Lipskin, Mr. Dettel of Public Works, Jim Burr of Transportation, with their completely reactive and anti-environmental policies, their contradictions of top-level consultants who try to tell the truth about the number of parking spaces and so many issues, uh, when our mayor is the first mayor in six years to shut down our public comment to 30 minutes, which by the way, she will counter after I sit down. She is the first one I've observed in six years, and whereas all the other mayors were willing to give every member of the public at least some time to speak, appointing hand-picked people to push their anti-democratic agenda, direct the library into a five-star parking garage, six dollars for a recall signature while lying to the signature gatherers. Folks, let's demand that we get more fair and true representation on council and in the media. I think we need to depose the elite cabal that is trying to absolutely excoriate our fairly elected officials. Yeah! Yeah! Truth and democracy, stand up for your rights! Okay, next speaker. It's and we'll... ridiculous. Okay. It's gotten we'll... egregious. It's oh. sad. All right. Yeah, I, I really hope tonight that the city council uh, speaks forcibly against uh, Martine Bernal's uh, vicious smear campaign against uh, uh, Drew Glover. And that goes hand in hand with all the other uh, illegal and corrupt things that we're witnessing here by the um, property speculator uh, um, supporting council people here. And it's, uh, it's uh, I really urge you to go on Netflix and watch um, The Edge of Democracy. And the edge of democracy, you will see some very shocking parallels to the, what is in that movie to what we have witnessed since the new council has been in office. Every single playbook by the fascists to subvert democracy has occurred here in the city council since the beginning of the year. Every single one of them uh, lies on, on uh, recall petitions, um, a, a smear campaign by Martine Bernal to claim that it's unsafe to communicate with Drew Glover, who's got to be the gentlest, most compassionate person that has ever sat on this city council. And that is outrageous. What well, a leading star of our community to be trashed in the media and, mani and to manipulate events so that Oh, there was, uh, when Take Back Santa Cruz like said, you know, spread a rumor about Drew being angry, and then Martine Bernal uses that as a way to smear Drew in the media. Uh, no mention in that in the media smear campaigns about the six dollar a signature, over and over again. Every one of those poor kind people that I meet that are doing the getting signatures for the recall are having to get, get to get six dollars to li to Your to uh, li live, okay, and that I'm is really really out outrageous that we have, have to, to do that. I hope it's that, really okay, it's quite and, upsetting. You're need to you know? leave. That's your warning next time. I, you speak out or go longer, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and leave. I'll have our, uh, our, have our sergeant of arms escort you out. So you've been warned. Next um, interruption, we'll have you escorted out. Okay, next speaker. How democratic to me. Hi, my name's Sarah Manildi, and I, I'm coming here completely independent of all of this. I didn't know any of this was happening. So I guess it's important to me to say something without because my style is a little different than their styles. I came here to support Mr. Glover. I um, had the experience of leaving uh, Trader Joe's and having somebody, I call it assault, but they were very aggressively giving me this recall petition. And I tried, I talked to them a little bit and I said, no, I don't, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I thought about it for a very long time and basically what I feel is that I voted for Mr. Glover. I support Mr. Glover completely. And I think the city council cannot function as a democratic unit unless we stop having, every time someone has a position we don't agree with, recall campaigns that produces this like ba -ba 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 chaos rather than government. And I can't believe it. 
I live, my federal government has a, a leader that I completely 100% disagree with. I don't get to recall him. I have had to live under governments that I don't agree with. And so I am so offended that people who take a different position, no matter what your position is, whether you think the homeless uh, situation is good or whether you think it's bad or whether you're a homeless advocate or whether you're not, you have no business trying to recall Mr. Glover and I 100% support him. He's one of the few people I have voted for that are um, representing me right now. Thank you very much. My name is Lee Brokaw, and once I start reading, every word will be from this report. Watkins statement to the public, 2 12 19, 7 o'clock, page 10. Quote, I'd like to speak to the perceptions that are floating around in the community. There are perceptions that my colleagues, both council members Grover, Glover and Crone are intentionally bullying me because I am a woman. I say this perception out loud, not to validate its truth, but rather to stand alongside my fellow council members, staff and community members who may feel pushed around or bullied. Page 14, Mayor Watson's father, who was county superintendent of schools for many years and other men and women she respects have suggested to Mayor Watkins the council members Glover and Crone would not interrupt her every question, every decision she makes or try to override her if she were a man rather than a woman. Page 52, footnote 32, Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor, uh, that was editorial. Vice Mayor Cummings told me he believes the complaints leading to this investigation may be politically motivated to undermine and make less effective some of the policies, efforts, and those of his council members, Crone and Glover, Sandy Brown, investigating alleged political motivations. Complaints are beyond the scope of my complaint. Recommendations, page 89. Council members, all members, number three, all members of city council should immediately participate in professional mediation and conflict resolution. I support you too. Yeah, hi, Bruce Thomas. I'm an 18 year resident of Dufour Street and I'm here on behalf of Dufour Neighbors. We presented a petition a year ago after the uh, openings of Starbucks and Blaze Pizza at 1901 Mission Street. And I wanna um, reiterate that there are ongoing problems. Contrary to a report that was posted in the meeting, uh, the addendum of last week's, uh, two weeks ago's meeting, council meeting agenda. So I'm soliciting help. I've got some help from Ralph of the um, city manager's office, but it's been really slow. And I'm gonna ask the council if they can help intervene to try to make sure we can finally get some meetings going or something where we can draw a solution. One of the key problems is a bank was split into two two fast food franchises and no loaning zone was specified. So after the fact, a very ineffective one was put up and it doesn't get used, it can't be used because people don't honor it. The neighbors have a lot of ideas we want to help. It would be really good if the, someone on the council could help bring us together and have action items that are responded to. We had action items from a meeting last October and by and large they were dropped. And some of the ideas, those action items were actually, would have been very helpful. So again, um, do four neighbors are soliciting help from the council to help us try to get a solution that's gonna be long-term and effective. Thank you. Hi, uh, how was your uh, bike ride on uh, the 24th? You can go ahead and pause it. This is a chance for us to hear from you. Okay. We're not going to respond. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, I think, I think there are kind of parallels to like public comment to like your uh, bike ride. I think like in some ways you should consider um, letting people talk longer. Um, I mean, it's a little thing to ask um, if you look at it in the larger, in the larger picture. Um, uh, I wanted to say something about the library um, concept of the parking garage above the library. Um, I think that that idea is so bad it belongs in North Korea. <clears throat> it's it's utterly, remarkably, remarkably bad. And um, it's offensive to people who love libraries. Um, so 
I think you guys should consider um, – because uh, the uh, um, uh, Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary Visitor Center cost about uh, 13 million is what I've heard, and that's including the land it was built on. And um, that structure um, is, is only slightly smaller than you would need to make a really uh, nice library for a community this size, and you wouldn't have to put a, a, a ridiculous parking garage on top of it, and, and, and you wouldn't have to use up. I mean, if you, you look at this parcel over here that it, the library is currently on, um, with the, the parking um, lots that are adjacent to it, the whole thing um, would um, you know, easily support uh, a new structure. Um, you know, the footprint of that area would support a new structure and there's plenty of, um, you know, parking garages and things nearby. So I think, um, I think that would be a better option. Um, uh, this winter, uh, you're going to have, uh, holiday shoppers. And, uh, by that, that's a euphemism for, uh, the campers. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit like holiday shoppers, uh, looking for aggressively advertised substantial bargains on popular merchandise. But um, they, um, I think they deserve amenities um, because in, in some respects, they're just looking for a little tiny slice of, of the American dream. Um, Next speaker. Next speaker. I'm not sure if there's any paper. Okay. Yeah, you left your newspaper up there, but it's not. Okay, next next speaker. We'll go ahead and move. I'm sorry? Oh, you're speaking to the agenda. Okay, this is oral communications reminding you who um, is in the audience that this is for items that are not on today's agenda. So if you're interested in addressing the council on an item that is not on today's agenda, please uh, line up to my left and we'll try to get through uh, everybody who is here to speak on any item not on our agenda um, within the next uh, 25 minutes or so, please. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos, and I'm here to speak to you. I was not able to come to de, um, Rosemary Menard's earlier presentation to you today about the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and the draft <laughs> uh, sustainability plan. This is it. And I would like to ask that uh, you and members of the public attend tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the Simkin Swim Center, the uh, question and answer period with the Mid-County Groundwater Agency Board regarding this plan. This is huge. This is huge. It is biased for uh, support of uh, SoCal Creek Water District's Pure Water SoCal project, which will inject 1.3 million gallons a day of treated sewage water into the drinking water supply aquifer. Nobody's giving a vote on this. They're just doing it and pushing it through. The last time I spoke before your council, it was to make the agreement with SoCal Creek Water District regarding the tertiary treatment plant at the wastewater treatment facility. And again, Councilman Crone, thank you for pulling that item off the consent agenda that day. Mr. Basso that day, uh, who is the attorney for SoCal Creek Water District, told your council that I am the only one that's complaining. That is not true. I am the only one that has been able to have the time and the energy to put forth a pro per litigation against the district for a very sham of an EIR on the project. <coughs> But I represent hundreds, and many people are thanking me for trying to take this action because many people feel it is wrong, and, and they worry about the long-term uh, health effects that are unstudied uh, as to low levels of endocrine disruptors and pharmaceuticals in the water, which cannot, and the facility operators know this, it cannot all be removed. Corolo Engineering has told the Water District this. Your time is up. Thank you very much. <coughs> Speaker. Hi, Sherry, Sherry Peterson. I'm here to speak about MHCAN. Well, I've been visiting over there lately. I've been going over there for 35 years since it started. And, um, you know, I've 
I do art, and there's a Dennis and Colleen make breakfast on Monday, and I just wish that you'd listen up to the police is outside, and he's wondering, what am I doing here? Because everyone says, oh, good morning, and we're all very friendly, and we we get along well, and we watch TV, and there's a lot of groups in there and things to do. And I, I just wish that you would think of other daycares for the, it's coming, it's going to be a cold winter, I feel, and there needs to be more things open to people, just even if it's just an open building with yarn in it or something simple like paper with color crayons or whatever it takes, you know, showing people how to um, become carpenters. or th There's a million things that the city could do to help people get better, and image can help people in a million ways. It's helped me. And it's also, a, um, it doesn't allow any alcohol over there, and, that, and that's really good, so drop-in centers would be really handy. It would help people around here that I noticed too many people are on alcohol or drugs, and they'd have, they'd have something else to do. And I wish that you would think about that in your budgeting, making room for other daycare programs, and also letting loose image cans restriction where we can actually take food out of there because like 50 to 70 percent of us are homeless and it'd be really nice to take a bunch of grapes out of there. Today I had to eat five bananas because I wasn't allowed to take two home. Thank you. Next speaker. Hey, hi, Gareth Phillip. I, um, I, it's gonna cut into my time, the thing I really wanted to speak about, but uh, I, I do feel compelled to say as a member of Santa Cruz United that uh, nobody's getting paid $6 a signature for anything. It's a grassroots effort. We're all doing it for free. Okay, you do it. And, you know, well, pause this. well Elise, I, I, I know of no one I'm gonna go that ahead and pause. Paid. So you can, I'm gonna go ahead and pause your time. At least that's a warning. You. Next time there's an interruption, I'm gonna ask that you please no leave. No problem, thank you. Thank you for warning me. Uh-huh, next, uh, please continue without disruption. Whether or not we agree with you, we're we welcome your comments. Okay, yeah, and and the narrative for the reasons for the recall for me personally are up to about 30 minutes. So there's a lot of reasons I su suggest that the public listen to the reasons and make up their own mind whether they are sufficient to justify a recall or not, and not listen to the grievance monger fan club that, so far as I've heard, has doesn't have any you know actual reasons not to. Uh, anyway, I'm going to continue. Generally, I'm not in favor of the city engaging in large social program funding with city money for select special interest slivers of the population. To start, the tax base of the city isn't intended or suited for such things. Federal and state taxes are progressive and based on profit, no profit, no tax. As long as all the profit is not taxed, the economy pie grows and prosperity ensues. The Fed has constitutional authority to provide for welfare, the city does not. Normal property taxes, sales taxes, other fees depend on the economic pie and don't respect profit. If too large, they damage prosperity. They are properly intended for residents to collectively buy city services such as streets, parks, libraries, police, fire, and no barrier public municipal offerings and improvements that all can access. National social problems are beyond the scope of the city to solve and should not use such funding sources. The use of false oppression narratives to justify higher taxes, rent control, or the outright theft of personal wealth in rumored transfer taxes and business licenses of minor housing providers are ill-conceived economic and political attempts at violations of individual liberty, individual liberty approaching oppressions of their own making. Even worse, for example, is when the social engineering goals of the Council Advisory Committee on Homelessness did not unbelievably include explicitly at all whatsoever the specific goal of reducing homelessness by some measured amount over time that we may judge their effectiveness. Next speaker. Next speaker, please. The, the gentleman in the left is waiting for the evening's item. You're welcome to come forward. <clears throat> Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. Um, I bring up a subject frequently because I feel that it's very fundamental and most people are afraid to bring it up even though it affects just about everything that we try to accomplish. And that is specifically the Israel lobby 
the Israel lobby basically intimidates people into actually confronting them with facts. If you do confront the Israel lobby with facts, you will be um, pleasant, unpleasantly treated. <laughs> I can speak from experience. But that does not intimidate me because uh, I just figure, hey, if you can refute what I say about Israel or the Israel lobby or anything related to it, I will apologize. And uh, I've made that offer to everybody who doesn't like what I say about the Israel lobby. But the fact is, nobody ever tells me what it is that I'm wrong about. They just hate me for stating facts about the <laughs> Israel lobby. One fact, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. I don't know if this is gonna show up on TV. But anyway, uh, this goes back, but the Israel lobby's uh, nefarious activities goes back further than 1967, when they actually, Israel actually knowingly attacked an, a, an American U.S. Navy ship. And they did it with the intent of getting the United States to start a war with Israel's Arab enemies so that uh, Israel won't have to do it themselves. This is customary practice with the Israel lobby sucking us into wars for Israel so Israel can take over the Mideast. And I say, if you look into the Israel lobby uh, and speak up, you'll be doing us all a favor. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Sarah Smith, and I feel like democracy can't function without respect for all people. Our community is in a crisis with a pervasive lack of respect. Our government will be dysfunctional until we regain it again, and policies matter and behavior matters. I've learned about standing for social justice throughout my life in West Africa, in Alabama, in India, in Mexico, and at home. I'm working on a movie called The Boys Who Say No, Who Said No, about the draft resistance movement of the 60s. It was our movement, and we used nonviolent action to bring about change and stop a war. We felt betrayed by the policies and actions of our leaders, and we took a stand. Today I take a stand and ask our leaders and all the members of our community to show deep respect for each other, stop name calling, and make serious efforts to work together for the good of all in our city and our country. We have a big job ahead of us to build a stronger nation that takes care of all of its citizens, where mistreatment of people in any situation is not condoned. David Harris, a leader of the draft resistance, said clearly, you don't change people's minds by calling them pigs. I say don't call people names and expect to change anything. I want our community to stand for respect and justice. This is who we are. In 1965, I marched in the streets of Selma, Alabama with 60 other white people who clearly said, we stand for the rights of black people to have full voting rights. It was scary. We were surrounded by white people yelling at us, throwing things, and we marched on. Many of us in this community have stood up to oppose racism and stand for social justice. I walked with Martin Luther King in Montgomery. Time is up. Thank you. You're welcome to submit the comments as well. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker. Please come forward. Next speaker. You're, you're, well, you're welcome to come forward. <laughs> well, <clears throat> first of all, I really do want to save our library over there in that beautiful setting with the view of the, the city hall here. Unless we, maybe we could move the library into the city hall and move city hall into Logo's old building. It's just not fair that we keep threatening our parking lot, which has that beautiful farmer's market, which is the one big beautiful thing that our community manages to do every Wednesday. 
It's a beautiful thing, that farmer's market, and we need to keep it. And we need to keep those trees that are over 200 years old that have been sequestering carbon for us for over 200 years. It's just wrong. They've set up a little shop in the farmer's market trying to push the library and the parking garage, but they never actually tell you what the outside is gonna look, and they never actually show that the trees are gonna be gone, and it's just gonna turn our city into a, a Nazi worship worshiping thing downtown. It's just wrong. Okay. And we need more bathrooms. And why do we, that beautiful San Lorenzo Park has that, that shindig for alcoholics always at the last of the month. $40, they charge $40 a person on Saturday to go in there and drink tequila and tacos. And they do it on the last few days of the month because they know poor people can't do it. They can't afford that. And they're just drunks and, and people. What happened to the Wham Festival? We haven't had one of those for 10 years. It's just wrong. <laughs> we need to have something good in that park every weekend. It's a beautiful park and we need to let the gay pride people end there too and have a beautiful celebration. And the farmer's market needs to stay in that park. <laughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Cynthia with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. A person who's collecting signatures for the recall told me that they received their paycheck from Planning Commissioner Robert Singleton. Is that true? Maybe that's not true, but I did tell them that they were paying $40 a signature in Alameda and they were just shocked their jaws dropped and hit the floor. Um, so regarding district elections, Santa Cruz will soon have district elections or if fought, a ranked choice system, which would be 100% more fair. Uh, difficulty, uh, so the drawing of electrical district lines is contentious. Those who are in office have a strong influence over redistricting decisions. Political leaders will often influence the drawing of district lines in ways that help perpetuate their own power or the strength of their group. If, for example, if, uh, if a councillor wins an election by a narrow margin, he might have the lines of the district redrawn drawn in an attempt to exclude a neighborhood that voted against him. Um, <clears throat> if, a if the downtown is surrounded by, if, if a multifamily downtown is surrounded by a single family neighborhoods, people in power might try to redraw district lines in a way that chops up the downtown area so that several single family home districts each swallow up a small piece of the downtown district, or thereby leaving no downtown dis voting district at all, or no UCSC district more likely. Um, <clears throat> can also allow politicians to separate wealthy populations from poor ones or to make racial divisions. Um, so um, white, white districts were ruled to be acceptable while a majority African American district and a majority Latino district were ruled unacceptable. This was in Texas. Um, the uh, ranked voting or distributing multiple votes could be useful changes that might get us away from the all or nothing winner takes all electoral system, which encourage people to vote against someone ra rather than for someone. In ranked voting, which is used in, in uh, Cambridge, voters get to assign ranks to all the candidates, not just one in their district. The other proposed system of distributing multiple votes would allow each voter to have, for example, seven votes. Speaker. Okay, let's see if I got this right. So you decided to have 18,000, spend $18,000 to do an investigation on our two most progressive city council members. There were about, I might have this a little off, but seven allegations, all unfounded, almost all unfounded. One substantiated for a sarcastic laugh, and one was substantiated because a conference room, a comment about a conference room leaving late. Um, so really, $18,000 to find out you need mediation? Mediation that was asked by Chris and Drew on multiple occasions? Really, $18,000? You could have done the mediation without the $18,000, and the $18,000 could have gone to people such as uh, maybe our homeless population. The real reason this witch hunt was started is because these two people on the city council do not play the game of I'll vote for this if you vote for that. They represent what we voted for. They have not changed their views. They stand strong. And the headlines on K-O-I-O-N, 
And Jessica York, I'm really disappointed in you. Sometimes you do good, but that one you mentioned, you you do the wrongdoings, you mentioned that instead of most of the allegations were unsubstantiated. The real headline should be anti-homeless anti and pro-gentrification city council spend $18,000 trying to get rid of their fellow progressive city council members instead of mediating. Right. So, in the end, I would like to dedicate this shirt to you. And okay. I will wait. I vow to wear it every single your day. Up. Your time is up. While okay. you Next are our supposed okay, your time is asshole up. mayor. Oh, okay. So you've been warned, and next time there's a disruption, we'll go ahead and ask you to respectfully leave. I'm going to go ahead and close, um, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and close oral communications after the person with the hat on and the flower and the, and the hair. You will be our last speaker. We have an evening item before us. That's it. I just didn't want to stand my foot hurt. So, no, I'm sorry. We're going to have you have other opportunities to address us. We're going to go ahead and close oral communications after the person with the hair, with the flower in his hat. You're uh, too okay. many. I'm, sorry. We'll go ahead and remind people that even if you don't agree with what they have to say, we're going to respectfully listen to them and we're going to respectfully hear them. Even if I don't agree with what they have to say, I will respectfully ask that they have the respect of all citizens to be heard without disruption. So I ask you to respect your fellow citizens and those with the signs, I ask you not to disrupt those behind you and to please lower them so that the people behind you can see. Please, you have your two minutes. Hi, Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union. Um, as we know, all people that were living at the Ross camp were not adequately housed and so we have homeless encampments all over the city right now. So on behalf of the current situation, I'm asking you to consider agendizing in the near future another plan for a transitional homeless encampment uh, to be set up sooner than later. Uh, winter is fast approaching. And so I have great concerns that people are outside, they're unhoused, they're unprotected right now. And in the interim, I'm also asking you to consider their basic emergency needs and think about distributing things on a regular basis, such as motel vouchers and laundry vouchers. Um, it's going to be really hard in this rain and fog um, for people to get their needs met. Uh, we don't have enough sh shelter availability. And so I, I'm asking you to consider you know, placing those things in place immediately. Do the data, do the research. I mean, I think it's clear that we need those things and, and those are things that you can immediately do to help our unhoused individuals. And I would also like to thank Drew and Chris for all the work that they've done, for all the time that they've taken. They represent voices that often don't get heard in these matters. And so I appreciate all the work that you guys have done. Thank you very much. Hi, Council. I thought I'd tell you a quick story and ask for your help. So I was at Chopper's Corner three hours ago. I was approached by a petitioner for the recall campaign. Who, who my name is Micah Posner. And I was informed that the reason we should recall Glover and Crone is because they don't support transitional housing for homeless people. Um, and then I was told that Councilmember Glover had, had verbally assaulted someone at City Hall recently. When I asked the woman why this wasn't in the exhaustive report that I just read, she said, well, I don't know, but I know it's true. I'm sure it's true. So the people who are gathering the petitions are lying. Um, and then I said, well, why are you doing this? And they said, we really need the money. So they're getting paid and then they're lying. So my ask of you, um, and especially Cynthia Matthews, because I know you care about civility and I respect you for that, and Mayor Watkins, because I also know you're calling for civility, is go to, go to shoppers and ask them why you should recall these council members and if they lie to you, then tell the newspaper or use your position to ask them not to do that because, you know, I'm not claiming that my side doesn't stretch the truth either or whatever, but all of us, it's incumbent on all of us to try to keep the dialogue truthful and civil, and that's not happening with the recall campaign right now. So I'm also asking you to do that, Jessica. Just go ask them, you know, just go ask them why, and if they lie to you, then, you know, 
put it in the I'll newspaper. Pause. You're welcome to address the council at this time. If you want to address somebody else on a, on a different time, you're welcome to do that on your own time. Okay, I was just but including this is your the, opportunity to address the council. I understand. You can and go I, ahead and restart. I that. was asking you to do that, so I hope you do. So thanks to your help, I hope that we all work on you know, having a civil and truthful dialogue. And I know I'm going to do that when people say erroneous stuff about, you know, people that I'm not allied with. And anyways, I hope we all work on this together because the other speaker that marched with Martin Luther King is right. Things have gotten to a new low and we really got to work a little bit harder. Thank you. We'll go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please lower your signs for the last time, no higher than your shoulder. If you're not interested in doing that, you can go ahead and stand in the back. If you're still not interested in doing that, then I'm going to go ahead and ask that you stand outside. It has to be lower than so you're not disrupting or uh, uh, um, not allowing the people behind you to see. Okay? If they can see them. If they, this person is saying they can't see. Or can you see? Okay. No higher than that, a place that they're not going to be able to see. Mr. McHenry, the same for you, please. Go ahead. Monitor up there too. You can go ahead. You have two minutes. Hi, I'm Ryan, and uh, it's very disruptive right now to have so much people not having good harmony with each other. Let's try to be together more, please. Let's have more love and cooperation with everyone. Passion, of course, is going to come into it, and every time you add one more person, it exponentially makes problems, right? So let's just try to work on it and let's just keep working forward. And the main thing I want to see right now for everybody to forget all the problems and we need to look at our planet and our universe. And we got to start at the bottom here and we got to do introspection, retrospection, and set in the backwards order, and future spection is a word I want to add to that if it isn't already there. And we need to work for our planet more than all the rest of this stuff. This other stuff is kind of moot if we can't keep our planet together. Species extinction is a very real thing that's happening right now. We got to work on that. Tying into that is a sacred ceremonial village site where the Amamutsan people that were here originally that knew how to steward this land in a very excellent way with spirit, <laughs> with knowledge, with working on the land, not just destroying it. We don't only destroy either, but they really could teach us a lot about how to take care of the land and steward it and give us all strength and soul. We're gonna have a walk to support them in two Sundays from now on the 8th of September. Everybody's invited, one o'clock to six o'clock. In San Juan Batista, we're gonna walk five miles for those who can. Otherwise, we're gonna take people on. We're gonna have, you know, talkers and you know ceremonies at the beginning and at the end we're gonna have a big feast at the Federal uh, RV park they're hosting it which is right next to the sergeant quarry proposed site so what they want to do is take their sacred land and make a quarry there so please we All right. can't have next speaker happen. next speaker Come to the walk. Thank you. Members of the community and uh, city council, it's public record, though not reported by the Sentinel, that the city's motion to dismiss the Ross Camp lawsuit has not been dismissed. Instead, the city and the Ross Camp refugees have been directed to return to federal court in October after some substantive meetings to resolve real problems. Huff, one of the parties of the lawsuit, calls first for a public apology to the community of Santa Cruz. This would admit that most of the residents of the Ross Camp were not offered alternative shelter, nor are they sheltered now. We demand immediate action by City Council to rectify this by implementing delayed, stalled, and buried plans for survival homeless encampments, as well as safe RV and vehicle lots to be opened no later than November 1st, considering the coming winter. Considering the current violations of the Martin versus Boise prohibitions on punishing homeless people in public places for simply being there, City Council must declare a moratorium on the enforcement of all ordinances shown to unduly impact homeless folks that have little to do with health and safety. These include, but are not limited to, obstructing the sidewalk, being in a park after dark, being in a closed area, and no trespassing on public property. Considering the city's continued seizure of homeless survival gear, city agencies must make tents and blankets available, expand to reasonable business hours, times when confiscated property can be recovered, and distribute laundry and motel value vouchers to unhoused individuals, particularly for the disabled and elderly, until affordable housing is more than just talk. 
Make survival tents available. More closely monitor the seizure of tents and homeless property as abandoned. Expand police hours for reclaiming property. <coughs> Provide regular distribu distribution of these vouchers, as mentioned before. End the sweeps of existing homeless camps unless actual shelter alternatives are available prior to the destruction of the camp. Thank you for not interrupting my sentence. I'm going to go ahead and have our last speaker, unless, did I see that you switched out with the woman in the, okay, you'll have two minutes and then you'll be our last speaker after him. I forgot to say Hello, my name is Alex Londos. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I've lived in this community for 30 years and I value the opportunity that we all have to speak to you. So all of us in this audience, everyone here, everyone watching in our community, we have um, different opinions and we wanna express that. We want people to listen to what we have to say. And there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of important issues that we deal with here in our community, uh, locally, regionally, and internationally. And I think we're just getting distracted from the main issue. And I'm gonna reiterate and go over what the last gentleman said. Right now, we're going through the global warming tipping point and we're headed into the sixth mass extinction where um, all of the, this is just such a misprioritization of resources for us all to be here. All the people that drove vehicles, that walked here, that rode bikes producing this uh, through the TV, it's just such a, a bad use of all the intelligence here when we should be redirecting all of this to help make the world a better place. There's a lot of important issues, but we should be prioritizing climate change, environmental issues. There's, um, we're passing so many different thresholds uh, animals are going instinct. There's a continual increase of parts per million in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The earth is warming at an exponential rate. We're seeing more global heat waves, more forest fires, super storms. Uh, the glaciers are melting and the ocean levels rising. I don't understand why we're doing any of these new construction projects when we know eventually the ocean's gonna rise and we're gonna have to relocate cities like other communities around the world. I've lived in this community for 30 years. I've known Drew and some of the other members um, on this board for quite a while. I fully support Drew Glover and Justin, and I think that they are very progressive and they're dealing with these important issues. Not all this drama that, I don't even know what's going on with everything in this council. I just know that we're here and we're not addressing environmental issues. We're not addressing the homeless population. We're not helping animals or this, this just seems like such a waste of time and priorities and it's upsetting that we're all in here and this is what we're talking about. So I hope um, that I can continue to support Drew and Justin the best that I can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you'll be our last speaker for oral communications, and then we're going to go ahead and close oral communications after you. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Bengtson. Um, I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I'm a registered voter. Um, I was a Ross Camp resident and council member, whatever that means. But um, nonetheless, I did witness, and we have it on video of, um, you know, um, Jason Hyduke, who's a person I do respect a heck of a lot, uh, saying stuff about our camp and about its uh, safety, et cetera. Um, and then I have video of him saying, hey, we fell down on that, we're, we're human. We just, we're so sorry. And then the, the police didn't communicate with us and they put up these um, nuisance signs and so it totally tore apart your things. Um, Drew Glover, you know, he's accused of saying that the camp could save itself. Yeah, it could have if somebody would have fallen onto their word and actually carried things out. Justin Cummings came out to the camp and had awesome, I appreciate that. And people, I mean, you came out there, it's real. People, uh, you know, are undercutting you now or whatever, but I mean, it's politics. I understand that, okay? I understand exactly what's going on. Um, and unfortunately, everybody does. And I'm gonna bring, because Berlin der Stern, you know, um, you know uh, Paris match, we're bringing in international eyes because this has now become a fiasco. And this should not be a fiasco. Chris Crone, that's a badass, Dude, um, his, just because of purple shirt, Drew Glover, nonviolence, um, nonviolence is power, my people. Nonviolence is power. Martine, um, we haven't had time to talk, um, but I mean, we need to bring this place together. We need to stop this. I mean, the stuff that's happening here is ridiculous. We don't need to be a fiasco. Um, 14 seconds left. I'm gonna yield the floor and just say, um, let's, let's get it together. Let's be people. Let's be Santa Cruz, for gosh sakes. We can do it. <laughs> so we'll go ahead.
ahead and have um, oral communications will be closed at this time. If you are here for our evening item, I will go ahead and um, allow you to stay. It doesn't seem like we'll be needing our overflow space here this evening, but um, that was available. So we'll go ahead and um, continue to have all of the folks here who are interested in staying for the evening item to uh, stay in the chambers. And we'll go ahead and have staff come forward. And if those that want to leave after oral communications, now would be the time. So please come forward and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, good, day. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. My name is Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation uh, for the city, and forgive me, I've got a bit of a cold here. Um, but yeah, tonight, uh, as soon as this presentation comes up here, just one second. Tonight, in general, what we're talking about tonight, um, as is on the screen, access and hours of parks and recreation and public facilities uh, this evening. And so this uh, encompasses a couple big things. The uh, existing ordinance, um, under the city's code. Uh, this is 13.04.011, uh, and this is regarding uh, the department's authority to regulate uh, park hours, um, park and facility hours within the, the parks and recreation purview. So that'll be a big focus of tonight. We'll talk about a few options on that. And the second piece of it, um, will be really, I'll call it a case study, but kind of an example of, um, of this policy in action, if you will, at the Loudon Nelson Community Center. So we'll look at that specifically as well. All right, so the history uh, on this, uh, on February 12th of this year, the City Council directed staff to return to a council meeting with updates and responses uh, to a few different items here, three uh, key items. Um, status and reasoning of current park and facility closures. Um, uh, possible ordinance change for park and facility hours. This would be an ordinance change to uh, 13.04, as uh, I just mentioned. Um, and then the Loud Nelson uh, Center restroom policy. Uh, staff returned to City Council on February 26th with a project charter um, uh, detailing exactly kind of what we were gonna go through, the process we we're gonna go through uh, to bring this back to the City Council. Uh, we did review this matter with the Parks and Recreation Commission um, on July 1st. We have a few commission members here tonight that I believe uh, might speak to this issue um, as well. At the Parks and Recreation um, Commission meeting, I, th I think I'll reference that here just a little bit about what happened at, the, at that meeting. So just to start, status and reasoning of current park and facility closures. So as uh, kind of on a high level, um, uh, our parks and facilities really are virtually all open at this point. As we'll talk about Loudon Nelson, we've got a, a limited access or restricted access policy in place, uh, but we do not have broad closures of, of, uh, of parks at this point. Um, so uh, as a whole, kind of a snapshot of what we do in parks and recreation, we manage 50 parks, open spaces, and beaches, about 1,700, more than 1,700 acres, and 35 miles of trails. We have 20 restroom facilities throughout our park system, uh, and in addition, uh, restrooms at the Civic Auditorium and Loudon Nelson Community Center. So we, we often close parks. We often uh, close parks for a few different reasons, and those are based in operational and environmental reasons. So uh, maintenance and repairs. Uh, we talked about the Harvey West Playground installation earlier uh, this morning uh, as part of the city council meeting. So we'll close aspects or parts of parks uh, for capital improvements, repairs, uh, maintenance. So that's a very common thing. Uh, protection of the environment. Uh, Arana Gulch is a great example. We have closed off areas to the public uh, to rehabilitate and restore um, and hopefully save the, the tar plant at Arana Gulch. Uh, public safety, there's an area of Cowles Beach that's been closed the past few weeks because some of the cliffs are unstable and collapsing. So we have areas of Cowles Beach that is closed due to public safety because of the, the collapsing cliffs. So we close areas of parks often. Um, and this is really part of that authority that's established by the municipal code to allow for that for these environmental reasons, uh, maintenance reasons, um, and public safety. In very rare cases, um, we will close uh, restrooms or parks or areas of parks um, for some of these issues uh, that are also uh, enabled through the city's ordinance. And that uh, would be things like number one on the bottom. So response to ongoing situations such as vandalism uh, that inflict damage to a park or facility um, or require uh, repair or rehabilitation. Or number two, um, ongoing unlawful activity. So in the city's ordinance, this is a key part of it 
to um, essentially uh, cease or prohibit uh, unlawful activity uh, in the parks. And so this is rare. This is rare that we would close parks for, or close parks or facilities for this reason. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in just a moment. Um, so just for reference, here's the code I've referenced a few times. Um, I'll just read this out loud here. The Parks and Recreation Director may, by regulation, establish hours during which any park, park road, trail, grounds, building, or facility is open to the general public. Uh, said hours shall be established for the purpose of protecting park properties, park roads, trails, and other areas from acts of vandalism, and to prohibit the general public from engaging in unlawful activity. So that's currently what is on the, on the books. So I wanted to share just kind of a brief operational perspective before we get into some um, some more details here. So I'll just read from my paper here. Um, it's a key priority for the Parks and Recreation Department to provide open, accessible, safe uh, parks and facilities. Um, as I mentioned, all parks and facilities are currently open. Um, in the case of the Loudon Nelson Community Center, which we'll discuss in just a moment, it's open on a limited basis to individuals using the facility for classes, uh, programs, and activities. Um, the Parks and Rec team maintains and cleans restrooms each day uh, without fail across the park system to ensure that they're open to the public. And despite ongoing incidents uh, of vandalism and illegal activity in virtually uh, all of our park restrooms across the park system, they remain open. We, we make that a priority to keep the parks open. The community is acutely aware of the issues in our park restrooms. And so each week we hear from members of the community uh, that demand that our restrooms be closed. So we hear this in neighborhood parks all the time, close the restroom, close the park, it's not safe. We hear this every week. But also we hear every week from members of the community that say uh, and really demand that parks and restrooms and facilities be open. So we hear both sides of it. And um, again, I, I say that to just uh, sort of acknowledge the complexity of this, that we're trying to figure out how to, how to best operate, best serve the community. But we do hear from both sides uh, every week. Um, so the following slides that we'll get into, um, we, what we did in preparation for tonight is we did a two-week uh, subset, a two-week assessment um, of restroom maintenance um, in our city parks. Um, and so this is, um, this is sort of standard operations. This is literally from the first two weeks of the month of August. Um, and just a f kind of a heads up on this, some of the, the images that we'll share and some of the details are a bit graphic, so just a, f a warning on that. Um, so over the past two weeks, this is August 5th to the 18th, um, a snapshot of our parks. Um, we spent 344 staff hours cleaning restrooms, and that's about 13% of our park maintenance uh, labor hours in total. Um, in those two weeks, we had 226 uh, unique incidents um, in our restrooms. Uh, eight encounters with uh, blood, uh, 35 clogged toilets, 66 instances requiring removal of graffiti, 12 needles found, two observations of active drug use. In detail, August 5th, and this is just a snapshot of a few, just a handful of them, Garfield Park on the west side, the toilet was plugged with a drug cooking can. August 6th, uh, San, Lo, San Lorenzo Park, uh, men's toilet clogged with a flannel shirt, toilet paper, feces, watermelon in the urinal and sink, gar uh, needle in the garbage can, um, missing toilet paper. Uh, August 10th, blood splatter on the wall in the women's restrooms, fireworks set off in the sink, uh, blood and needles found in the sink, and, and on and on, graffiti, uh, trash, debris left. And this is just, this is a snapshot. The, these are just, again, a handful, a handful of those 226 incidents over the last two weeks in our restrooms. Here's some images, um, just briefly. I'm not gonna describe exactly what's going on here, but these are some of the, the examples here. Blood splatter on the wall and floor, um, syringes in the trash can, a variety of different uh, items in the, in the trash cans here. Um, again, um, uh, syringes, needles. These are some of the older pictures. This is gonna lead us into the Loudon Nelson discussion. Some of the graffiti and items that we found at the, the um, Loudon Nelson restroom when it was open uh, prior to February of 2018. So again, vandalism, doors ripped off, kicked off, uh, human waste um, all over the, the interior partitions in the restroom. So these are, these are just ongoing issues. Again, um, in a two week snapshot, I just hope that paints a picture of, of what our staff uh, is, is dealing with and, and managing. And I guess before I move to the next slide, I just wanna say a, a quick thanks to the Parks and Recreation staff. This is a hard job. Um, and uh, every, every day, 
Parks and Rec prides itself on being a can-do department. We're going in, we're managing these things, we're handling these things. Um, and in all of these contexts, so all of these things that I mentioned over two weeks, all of these restrooms are still open. We're not coming to the council. Um, we're not coming to the council saying we should close these. We're not. Um, we're not enacting this authority through the municipal code. So we we don't abuse this. It's it's very rare cases. And so between the police department between and, and the enforcement side, the parks and recreation side, I just want to give a, a thanks and kudos to the parks and rec staff who deal with, with these things every day. Um, so, okay, so moving on here, um, one of the other questions that city council had uh, for us um, um, in, in the February meeting was, was really to come back with some pricing in terms of what it would cost to have attendance at our restrooms. Um, and so what we did is we broke this down in terms of, uh, we looked at a temporary maintenance worker aid um, in terms of what it would cost to staff our restrooms. And so we broke it down by restroom and the different needs at different restrooms. Um, the one that's not included in here uh, actually is uh, Loud Nelson, but we would expect that would be very similar to San Lorenzo Park that you can see in green about $150,000 per year. So uh, in, in total, as a possible solution or, or a possible mechanism to help curb some of these challenges that we face with restrooms, um, it would be about $2 million per year um, to staff up uh, our restrooms. Um, so that's just a snapshot. I'm happy to talk about that or answer any questions that, that you all might have associated with those costs. So shifting gears to the ordinance change uh, in park facilities and hours. Um, again, this is the existing municipal code, 13.04. Um, and again, we, we read through this just a moment ago, but uh, just for reference, and we can come back to this um, as we discuss, this is the ex existing ordinance that allows for the authority to set hours of operation in parks and park properties. When we went to the Parks and Recreation Commission on July 1st of this year, um, the recommendation from the Parks and Recreation Commission was unanimous, um, a unanimous vote uh, for to recommend these four items to the City Council. So I'm bringing these forth uh, for your review. And this is all in, uh, included in your agenda packet uh, as well. So the direction uh, or advisement that we got from the Commission was to create a set of health and safety and environmental conditions under which uh, the Director has discretion to close uh, either parks partially or entirely a park, open space, or facility. Notify the commission and the city council within 24 hours of an emergency closure of a facility or within seven days before a planned closure and estimated time for reopening. Establish a 21-day requirement um, or the closest city council meeting to present an update uh, to the city council after a closure to receive additional direction. Uh, and the final piece, uh, work with the county's health services agency on addressing syringe litter. Um, as well as public uh, urination and defecation in parks and open spaces. So that was the recommendation from the commission that was a unanimous recommendation to the city council. So one, I think one policy decision really that's before the council tonight uh, is in terms of the, the updated language to the city's code, to the municipal code. A couple options that the council could take should the council wish to update this language in accordance of what the in accordance with what uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission recommended. So the council could uh, direct us to update the municipal code uh, with language that we'll review here in just a second, or as an alternative mechanism, could. Uh, require staff or recommend that staff um, update the, the council policy, which is 7.1. In either case, either mechanism will create a mandate for city staff to adhere to council's direction. So either the updated code or the policy in this case will give us direction and, and will be, uh, be that solid mandate from the city council. At the bottom, uh, we have this plus, plus a complementary uh, administrative procedure order, an APO, to create greater transparency, consistency, and openness of the process. This was important to us because um, the, uh, the, the motion that was made back in February and the direction that we got from City Council, what we read between the lines is that we needed greater transparency of the process. We needed greater openness of the process. So if we are utilizing this authority, why are we using it? And so in either case, if the city council um, directs us to update the code or a council policy or, or no update, um, what staff is, is doing, planning to do is craft, and we've got a draft of this uh, APO tonight, um, 
craft this APO to provide guidance. So if any member of the community or if the council or anybody said, why are you closing a restroom or why are you closing off um, a riparian area or why are you doing this? We can look, go through that APO and said, we evaluated these criteria and we're closing something for, for these reasons. And so that APO really is just a, a step in transparency um, lending toward um, either the policy or the municipal code update. So the draft language for the code, uh, this is included in your packet as well, really just encompasses the direction that we received from the commission. So 24 hours within an emergency closure, seven days before a planned closure, um, or in, in reporting back to the city council uh, for any closure uh, lasting longer than 21 days. The council policy really is the, is the same thing. So very similar language, virtually identical language, um, but just codified in council policy rather than uh, the ordinance. So again, these are the two options um, that council could choose from. And in the APO, again, mirroring the same language, this is the intro uh, in the APO that just references either the code or the policy. And then here are some of the criteria, again, as we talked about operational criteria, environmental or public safety. So these are some of the different things that we would look at in going through that process to, to decide if we are to restrict or, or close something. So again, it's part of that process. Um, again, just referencing, these are the two options uh, for city council. And what I'd like to do now um, in talking about the Loud Nelson Community Center in particular and the existing policy that we have, um, again, recapping that policy that the restrooms are open at Loud Nelson Community Center. They're open to people using the facility uh, for programs, classes, and activities. Uh, but what I'd like to do is invite up um, our Loud Nelson uh, supervisor, Isith Ray, and then following um, Isith will be Robert Acosta, who is our recreation supervisor who oversees the teen center um, at Loud Nelson. And uh, so with that, I'd like to invite up Isif. Good evening, council and mayor. Um, my name is Isif. I'm the supervisor. Um, I'd like to start off by just giving a very brief picture of who I am, then what the, the, the center is, and then experiences we've had. Um, I... Um, I'm a person that at the age of six started uh, participating in community theater with my family, uh, my mom and my brother. I learned what it was to um, be a part of a community, create something and then give it back to the community, being part of a bigger picture and, and, and part of the community. At the age of eight, I ran home, told my mom, I have to play soccer, I wanna play soccer. She not being an athlete or ever having participated on team sports, did a little research and got me onto our um, hometown recreation department soccer youth league, which ended up being a wonderful experience for me, led to a lifetime career of athletics led me to college. Uh, at college, uh, I, I'll be honest, I went there to play basketball, but while I was there, they said, hey, you need to pick a major. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but when I reflected on the experiences I've had, the positive influences in my life, I recognized the opportunities that had been provided to me through recreation and community, and I decided that's how I wanted to focus my career and give back to my community. I received my degree in recreation administration. And since that time, over 20 years, I have dedicated my life and career to providing quality and, and enriching programs to the communities that I have been a part of. It is a passion of mine. Um, the Loudon Nelson Center started out as a, a school, Laurel Street School. Um, there had been a previous building from the 1800s, but the current building now, uh, built in, in early 30, 31, opened as the Laurel Street School in 33 and served as an elementary school uh, to which many members of our community attended as children and, and was such for many, many years. Um, and then in the late 70s, I, I think it sat unused for quite a while, but then in the late 70s, there was a joint use agreement between Santa Cruz City Schools and the City uh, Parks and Recreation Department, and they decided to make it a community center. And it was named, um, you know, the, the historical story of Loudon Nelson, it was named after him to honor him and his contribution to um, the school children of, of Santa Cruz. 
At the center, uh, we provide an array of social, recreational, and cultural experiences. It is a hub for our community. Many of the classes that we offer um, range from the mom and dad and me ballet class, where some of our youngest participants are less than two years old, to uh, the Meals on Wheels lunch program, which our most seasoned attendee is 102 years old. We also house the County Office of Education Alternative Ed High School class, which operates year-round during the regular school year as well as summer classes. We have um, multiple 12-step programs who utilize our facility to um, better their situations and get help with challenges in their lives. We have the Teen Center. We have the Senior Center and the Senior Computer Lab. Many of our Senior Center classes are free to the attendees or they are for a very, very small suggested donation. We also offer annual events to the community, mostly with a family focus, also some with cultural focus. Fungus Fair, Juneteenth, Wacky Water Day, Halloween Festival, Frosty Fun Fest. And then additional services that we provide to the community where we partner with outside agencies, such as Project Scout, where we offer free tax service for low-income individuals. HICAP, where we offer free health insurance counseling and advocacy, free blood pressure screenings. The Meals on Wheels program, again, offers um, free or very low cost, if the individual has it, um, meals Monday through Friday at the center. We partner with uh, Community Bridges additionally to Liftline to provide um, free transportation to the center and access to all the programs to anyone in the county. It's not just limited by city residency. We, offer, we partner with Hospice of Santa Cruz to offer free grief support for individuals experiencing loss in their lives. Outside of the programs that we offer, myself and staff on a daily basis provide outreach services and, and do our best to connect those in need and those that we identify not only in the building, in the programs, but also in the park with the, the appropriate providers such as Encompass, Community Bridges, Senior Network Services, Homeless Services Center, Second Harvest Food Bank, Adult Mental Health Services, Family Service Agency of Central Coast, Monarch Services, Walnut Avenue Women Services, and um, other services such as offering to provide um, sanitary incontin incontinence uh, products, I'm not sure what those are called, but you know, we, we do outreach. We are there for our community. We are trying to help the people that we can. Um, unfortunately, uh, when, I, when I became the supervisor at Loudon Nelson in February of two, 2017, I was so appreciative to step into a thriving community center that offered wonderful programs and services. But something else that I noticed too, and experienced on a daily basis, along with my staff, was some really outrageous, unhealthy, unsafe conditions that were occurring in the restrooms. These included daily instances of staff and patrons witnessing drug and alcohol use in the bathroom in the stalls, discarded paraphernalia, sometimes still containing the substance that was being used, such as needles, alcohol containers, um, marijuana leaves like on the ground, the, the dispensers, the toilet paper dispensers, a foil with burn ash in it. Um, uh, frequent discovery by staff and or patrons of unconscious individuals in the stalls. Uh, in September of 2016, a newly hired Rec 2, Recreation 2, it's an um, entry level position, walked into the restroom to found an, find an unconscious man in one of the stalls with a needle on his person. Uh, staff called 911 and, and staff tried to revive this individual while waiting for paramedics to arrive. Uh, and they were unsuccessful as were the paramedics and the gentleman was pronounced dead at the hospital. He had overdosed from drug use. And this had a profound effect on the staff and the patrons and, and this was during teen center operating hours. And this was something that we, that was the one tragic end, but there were so many instances of individuals who were engaging in the type of be behavior that could lead to that circumstance. We had daily occurrences of intoxicated individuals using the restrooms, um, 
not only being disruptive and, and intimidating to some individuals, but also um, not intentionally, but just as the state of their condition, missing the mark when trying to use the restroom. Uh, in addition to that, there were several instances of people who clearly were intentionally spreading or, or spraying urine or feces around the restroom for, for whatever reason or whatever condition. Staff was subjected to individuals with aggressive, disruptive, and at times physically threatening behavior. We have an instance of an employee who was chased out of the restroom stall, of which he approached someone who was engaging in illegal activity, who was able to see a um, injection kit on the floor of the stall. And a gentleman chased him out of the restroom with a loaded syringe, and, and my staff member had to run out from the men's restroom down the hall behind the front desk and into a senior program's office where he could get behind a locked door. This was in uh, 2015. There's also been examples of violent vandalism in which two uh, brand new uh, partition doors that had just recently been purchased during a re renovation in 2017 were torn off the hinges where the hinges were literally snapped in half. Um, just the week prior to that, um, paper towel dispensers had been torn out of the wall and on and on. In addition, paper towels and toilet paper were routinely taken or hoarded, and frequently we would walk in uh, to individuals just pulling the paper towel into their backpack <laughs> repeatedly. Um, also, uh, graffiti, uh, often gang, uh, gang tags, I guess they're called, <laughs> in the restrooms, um, and then the frequent discovery of inappropriate sexual acts, um, either with another individual or by oneself, but visible to people attending the, the restrooms. Um, one example in June of 2017, uh, a man was discovered inside the women's ADA stall with his clothing partially removed on the floor of the bathroom engaging in a sexual act with his, his luggage. Um, <laughs> we, there's been questions about the documentation of all these instances. Uh, we have some documentation. We've provided some, we've provided pictures. Um, there's been some that we have that wasn't captured in, in public records requests due to the timeline. But the truth of the matter is that these instances were becoming so routine for my staff that it, they stopped being noteworthy. It just became this everyday occurrence where our main focus was just to mitigate the issue immediately and get back to what we were there for, which was to provide programs for our patrons in a safe environment. <clears throat> the center's mission statement is to seek, the, the center's mission is to seek a balance between social, recreational, and cult, cultural services to the diverse communities of Santa Cruz. The center strives to create a space that feels welcoming, comfortable, safe, and accessible to all who use it. I do understand that there is a need for additional services for individuals who don't necessarily have a restroom of their own to go to. I do not believe that the Loudon Nelson Center is the place for it due to the many populations and the many groups who attend our, our center um, that could be threatened by the activity that was going on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to introduce Robert Acosta, who heads up our teen center. Thank you, Council. I appreciate the time. I always, people don't believe me when I say this, but I, I like presenting in front of City Council. So I thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, I didn't know what ISIS was going to say, so it's funny because as part of my conversation, I like to give a brief intro introduction about myself as well. Um, I was raised by a single mother who eventually became a heroin addict, and I can say that now because she's very successful. She's a drug counselor, a retired drug counselor. Um, but um, the reason I mention that is because of that much longer story than what I just said, I've always wanted to create a space um, that I didn't have when I was growing up, when I was a youngster growing up. Um, 
And that was, that was very important to me. The teen center, as many of you know, used to be located at um, where Walgreens is at downtown. And, and in 2010, we moved to the current space at Loudon Nelson, which apparently used to be the kindergarten class. That's what some of the people working on our re, when we rebuilt it were saying. Um, and part of the reason that this subject to me is so heartbreaking is because I work directly with staff who really do care about um, this community. And they don't, they don't just care about it, they're like truly passionate about it. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you guys in this council, even if, even if you didn't do any of the stuff that you guys do in the community, if this was the only thing you did for the community, I could not have more respect for you. And I do know for the fact that you all do much more than, than that. And so that's the passion that our staff has as well. And it's the same kind of passion that many of these people here have for the non-housed community of Santa Cruz. Um, I understand passion. Making sure that teens thrive and survive is one of my passions. I've worked directly with some of you and still work with some of you on, on many of these things. The staff that works for us is not doing it for money. Um, we want our money, don't get me wrong, but that's not why we do it. It's done because they care about Santa Cruz. The people that work in this community care about Santa Cruz. People with the degrees that, that our staff have could be working for a lot more money over the hill, um, could be working in the private sector, but when I ask pretty universally, the answer is because we love Santa Cruz. That's why we want to do what we do here in Santa Cruz. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate that these people who I care about, who have the passion for, for this town and for the people in this town and for the community are having to deal with members of the, of the public attacking them personally. It's, it's something that has started at our highest office and it's unfortunate that the people I work with are having to deal with name calling from our community, um, from our community that they will still go passionately and work hard for even after that. So that has always been something that is heartbreaking to me. Um, they love Santa Cruz and they wanna be part of the solution to the city's problems. Um, and all of us just want things to be better. So, so to get specifically to the teen center and why this is such a big deal to me. Um, the teen center is very important to me because it's a place where, where our youth come and they can hang out with their friends, they can just relax, they can just chill out, um, and they can spend time with the positive mentors that we have working at the teen center. You know, often um, one of the things that drives us crazy about in our profession is, well, it's just a recreation program. And true, we are just a recreation program, but the teen center is a big deal. And no matter what someone's going through, we have the resources to get these youth to what they need from our, from just our recreation program. Um, some of the things that our teens are currently dealing with right now, um, outside of their regular teen angsty, oh my God, why do you hate me? Things that teens just do. Um, we have teens that are dealing with drug use that whether it's them using drugs or their parents using drugs. We have teens that are using drugs and don't wanna stop using drugs. We have teens who are having a struggle to quit the drugs that they're using. <clears throat> and, and we have teens that are just dealing with who they are with their sexuality and we have our resources that we can send them to. Um, we have teens that are treated badly because of their skin color. And yes, it's not as bad as it might be out of California, um, but, it, but it does happen even, even here. It's, it's, we're lucky that it's not as bad as elsewhere, but it does happen. Um, I have teens who are from all walks of life that come to the doors of our teen center. Teens who live in $2 million homes and teens who are homeless living in their cars and or living at the shelter. Um, Teens are dealing with abuse, both physical and mental. And the last time, just a few days ago, that someone called um, to make a report because teenagers are being solicited sexually from their guardians 
partners. These are the kind of stuff that the teens talk to us about that we send them onto the resources or that we just have conversations with them about. And they know that we will guide them through those CPS talks, through the police officer coming into the teen center. Um, they know that that's what we are there for. Um, before the restrooms were closed at Loudon Nelson, these same teens that I'm telling you about had to deal with walking into a rest, literally cloud-filled restroom, you know, marijuana. Um, and teens offered hard drugs, offered meth, try it, it's right here, do it. <clears throat> We've had teens walk into the restrooms and be told to get the F out of here because they came in mid-transaction to somebody selling drugs. Um, and sorry for the graphic nature of this, but we've had teenagers open the stall door to two men, one giving the other oral sex while the other one was shooting up at the same time. That's what our teens saw at the teen center. <clears throat> and some parents stopped letting their kids come to the teen center because, because of some of the things. And I will tell you, it's night and day since we've started this new policy. Night and day. There is not... There, there is not, it's just, it doesn't happen. There's no hassling anymore. And I will tell you, there is, there is, it is, in, the, we, the staff at Loudon Nelson is very, it's a policy, it doesn't target one population. I had a friend coming looking for me. I wasn't at work that day. When I saw them later, I said, they wouldn't even let me use the restroom. And my answer was good, I'm glad. They're not supposed to let you use the restroom. I've had people say to me that, um, come on, Robert, if you just give me the code, come on, I just need to go use the restroom, give me the code. And then I can joke around and say, well, if you sign up for a parks and rec class, then they'll give you the code and you can go ahead and use the restroom. But it's something that is important to us. I know you guys care about our space, I know that. You showed it during budget hearings, you have showed it during one-on-one -on -one meetings I've had with some of you. I know you guys care about our space and our teens are counting on things staying the same the way they are now. Um, again, they have not been hassled since this process started. The, the last, the, except for one time, one of my teens a few weeks ago went to use the restroom, the women's restroom, and she was hassled by people protesting the bathroom. She was told, why do you get to use the restroom and not other people? And she had to come and talk to me and say, why are these people bothering me? And that's the only time since we've started this process that my teens have been hassled. So this is why this is very important to me. And thank you for your time. All right, thanks to Isif and Robert uh, for their testimony here today. Really appreciate that from them. Uh, from them. Just really quickly to conclude, and then we'll uh, uh, move it, move on and send back to city council here. I um, just wanna say, um, so in summary tonight, we're seeking policy guidance uh, from the city council related to park and facility hours. Uh, also seeking for your direction related to this existing restroom policy, uh, Loud Nelson. Um, staff's recommendation tonight is consistent with that of the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, to uphold the existing policy at the Loudon Nelson Community Center. Uh, and should the council wish to include new mandates for park and facility closures, we would recommend an amendment to council policy 7.1 uh, to establish that mandate to staff um, uh, with those new provisions that we talked about earlier. I do want to mention, we, uh, Robert uh, touched on it briefly. I want to mention that um, in this conversation tonight, we're really only looking at parks and recreation restrooms with a focus on Loudon Nelson. Um, and I think one thing that, that Robert or Isaac didn't mention is that we have a, a resource at the front desk at Loudon Nelson. So if people come in and need to use the restroom and they're not part of a program or class or activity, we have a resource list of nearby restrooms um, in the area uh, for people uh, who, who need a restroom in that moment. So we provide that resource to people who are coming to the center. What is the closest area uh, that has an available restroom? Big picture, we know that the big picture, we know that there are, uh, we'll go ahead and pause it. Sure. We're going to have an opportunity for to hear from the community. Um, we're going to go ahead and conclude the presentation. We'll ask questions. Then will be the opportunity for us to hear from you. At that time, we'll respect you and your uh, your opinions. And we ask that you also respect our staff as well as our opportunity as well. Please continue. See so again, the resource that I mentioned. Um, 
but I think this discussion tonight, it, it, again, is very focused on Parks and Rec and on Loudon Nelson. And I think we recognize that there there's a need for public restrooms. There are public restrooms all throughout downtown um, in, in uh, parking garages, portalettes, different locations. And so that really is beyond the scope of, of Parks and Recreation, uh, how many restrooms are needed, where they're located. Um, and uh, that, that could be, I'm not sure exactly what the, the Council Advisory Committee on Homelessness is reviewing, but that may be a bigger discussion in terms of where restrooms are, what's the inventory, um, how are those run and managed, um, uh, the budget tied to that and so forth. So again, tonight I just wanna kind of put that in context that we're really just looking at Loud Nelson. And to reiterate what Robert and Isith said, again, our request is um, that the council uphold the existing policy because of the intersection of these different uses, both at the community center and at Laurel Park. So I think the idea of a portalette at Laurel Park is uh, from our standpoint, uh, we come with the same recommendation to uphold that policy to not have a portalette at Laurel Park because that same intersection um, uh, with different activities and, and uses. Um, so very similar to Loudon Nelson, if I hope that makes sense. Um, finally, moving forward, I, I know this is a, a, a heated topic, but I just want to ask that we move forward tonight and really focus on, on the policy and on the process. Um, uh, there have been uh, claims uh, about, about staff, and I would just respectfully ask that uh, we don't uh, demonize or attack the people and the human beings as part of this. Let's attack the process and the policy and figure that out. So I would just respectfully put that out there. Um, the Parks and Rec team is a very, very dedicated and, and passionate team. Um, and we are, again, we, we hear from the community on all sides of this issue and many issues. And so that's why we're here at council tonight to get your direction, your policy direction in addressing this. It's complex, um, but we are a can-do group uh, and want to do everything we can to make sure that the parks and facilities uh, can be open, but also safe and, and serving everybody. So I just wanted to say th uh, thanks uh, to the council for the opportunity to, to share here from our perspective uh, and happy to answer any questions. Well, we'll go ahead and um, first I want to just thank you for your presentation this evening, um, but above and beyond that, just your commitment and your dedication and your authenticity is very clear in terms of the presenters here, um, but your entire team. So um, I just really want to acknowledge that and acknowledge the work. Um, so as uh, I mentioned earlier, now will be the time for questions of our staff and we'll um, go ahead and have an opportunity to hear from the community after that process and then return back for comments and uh, council action. Are there any questions for our uh, the staff at this time. Okay, Councilmember Brown, uh, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crown, Councilmember Myers. Okay, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for being here, and really thank you for all the work you do. It's um, really um, just it's it's an honor to um, be able to work with you all and know that um, that people who really care that much are working and that all that great stuff is happening at Loud Nelson. It's why it was my favorite park when we were asked. Um, so I ha my question is related to um, the report back on the cost to staff all restrooms with attendance. Um, and I realized that was the request that we made for, for information. I'm wondering that if, um, you, have there been conversations with the um, parks maintenance staff about what they think might be helpful for them? And, you know, I mean, there may be something that's not like an attendant at every bathroom that um, could be help them um, get their job done. Um, that, And I'm just wondering if there's any of those conversations have happened. I personally have talked with parks maintenance staff who talk about um, the, you know, the, the other challenge that, or one of the other challenges they have, which is cleaning up um, feces that's out in public because, <coughs> in part, because we don't have sufficient facilities. So um, that's a workplace issue, just like these other issues are workplace issues. I take that very seriously, um, and we'll talk about that later um, as we proceed with our deliberations. But I'm just wondering, like, what, what are the people on the ground think would could might be work 
might be helpful. Yeah, I definitely want to lean on Isith and Robert here from the perspective of uh, operating the facility at, at Loudoun. I think from the park maintenance team, these are all discussions that we have uh, continuously. We, I would say we don't have a solution. I mean, we, we don't have a, a recommended path. I think staffing the restrooms is, is, um, is certainly an option, and I think that would give staff uh, a level of peace of mind. I think one challenge for staff is going in in the morning, a uh, place like Grant Park, and you don't know exactly what you're going to encounter or what you're going to uh, find in that park as you go in in the morning. And so in a lot of cases, they're facing threatening situations or um, you know, d different scenarios that, that you know, could, could threaten their own safety. Obviously, there's the, the, um, the side of it that you mentioned, the cleanup side of it. And I think that's just a bigger, a bigger discussion. I mean, where, again, we have got 20, 20 restrooms in our park facilities and, um, it, you know, sometimes they're used, sometimes they're not. And so I think we, I would say that we don't have a great recommendation or strategy on how to handle that. I think the, the restroom attendant is one of the, uh, is one of those options out there, but it's very expensive. Um, and, and uh, yeah, volunteers could, could, um, uh, could do that potentially. But I think, yeah, who's managing those people? How does that work exactly? There are a lot more questions we have than, than answers in terms of um, how to manage that. Um, I have just kind of a um, technical question here. The recommendation before us is to accept recommendations from the Parks and Rec Commission regarding access and hours of public facilities and direct staff to incorporate recommendations as appropriate to update the municipal code 13.04, et cetera, and or council policy 7.1. And the, I, we had this conversation, but I just want to clarify. Either one of those achieves the same end for you. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And uh, updating the municipal code would take a couple of readings. Updating a policy would be a single action and uh, would be simpler to modify at any point in the future. And then is there an APO? I'm, I'm kind of flipping back and forth between my... That's in addition. So you'd want either the code... Um, adopting <coughs> the code or the policy plus an APO? Am I administrative procedure? Am I cr reading that? Correct. And, and we can, as it's an administrative uh, procedure or policy order, we can do that uh, uh, in-house um, administratively. And we're committing to doing that regardless of whether what council decides to do. So I think the decision for council is, yeah, the code or the council policy, the recommendation from staff being the council policy. As you mentioned, it gives us a direct mandate um, and it's effective, uh, effective tonight, essentially. And giving direction on that assumes action on the APO. Is that correct? Correct. So the you APO. You don't need to give additional direction on that. No. Okay. I just want to get clear on sure. that. Thank yeah. you. Vice Mayor Cummings. This was more of a question for, I think, probably the city manager's office. Um, so recently we received an email, um, and I think it was from Food Not Bombs interested in paying for and contributing financially to the city for in the installation of porta potties portal lights, however you want to call them. And I was just wondering, is there any potential mechanism for if members of the public would like to donate money to the city for the installation and maintenance of these types of structures, is there any type of pro protocol for allowing that? <laughs> Well, I think it just depends on what the particular request is, the location, the hours, the need, all that has to be evaluated. So we did get a request. We did forward it to the appropriate departments to review. Um, but I think generally it just depends on, on what, the, what the request is and, and uh, whether uh, it's able to be compatible with wherever the request is and, and all those factors. So that all uh, has to be taken into account. I just want to also say thank you all for this great presentation and for taking the time to be here and <coughs> share with, your, with us and the community your experiences at Loudon Nelson. Councilmember Crone, Myers, and then Glover. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, Tony, um, what constitutes a patron at um, Loudon Nelson? Because I know I played basketball for years there and always use the bathroom. Not all the basketball players use the bathroom. Well, I, I don't think it's an official program, but are they, how do, how do you judge someone who's using the facility? If I may, I'll let Isith uh, speak to that. 
Hi. Um, so anyone who is attending a class, a program, an event um, is using purchasing something at the um, little cafe that's located in there, someone that's there to do business. Um, it is not related to us receiving revenue. It's anyone, you know, there, we, yes, we have revenue making programs there, but we also have free programs there. Um, the, we also extend the access to the restrooms to um, children playing in the playground who are there, um, you know, from the neighborhood, most likely, um, who are there accessing the park. Uh, so if they're accompanied by an adult, um, also, as well as individuals who are um, come to the park at times, part of Hope Services or other agencies that have um, individuals with de developmental uh, disabilities uh, who have an adult attendee, uh, we welcome them. And that's based on the notion that a, a young child or someone who might not be able to communicate their need to use the restroom before leaving their home or, or nearby area um, is, is not able to identify and communicate that at their previous location. That's why that's extended. So the basketball players can or can't use the restroom? Uh, no. And uh, neither individual is using the ping pong table or the chess table. Tony, I have another question um, for you. What, what you called it a portalette? Where did that word come from? That might be my Midwestern roots. <laughs> oh, 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 I was like, Porta potty. <laughs> um, what would be the problem if, um, well, first of all, would you be willing to use volunteers? And what if someone, if we did a, um, like sort of a prototype six month bathroom that was staffed by a group of volunteers for certain hours uh, near the basketball court? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think, I think in general, I mean, again, what we uh, would want to do at Loudoun and at the park nearby again, because that intersection of uses um, would be would be to not have public restrooms um, um, at that location uh, for the the issues that we've talked about tonight. Now, in the broader discussion, um, looking downtown, where are the closest restrooms um, could we have some in an adjacent area? Could we have some in a nearby uh, area? Um, I think we would be supportive of that, so that you don't have that intersection of uses, youth and Meals on Wheels and different things like that, um, uh, where you could have kind of a pilot program, if you will, and staff it with either volunteers or, uh, or paid staff, um, as we talked about, you know, from a, from a costing standpoint. So uh, Isith is coming up, so I want her to speak to it. But again, I think we would like to, I think, generally keep it away from the, the property and, and maybe run a pilot in partnership with uh, Public Works and other appropriate departments. Um, one item I'd like to add that I didn't cover in my initial presentation, and it's a very real and ongoing and established situation, is that um, for over a decade now, there has been a well-known um, open drug market, so to speak, on the corner of um, Laurel and Washington Street. Uh, there has been police uh, involvement many times. There's been a sting operation prior to my uh, in, involvement at the center. There's been various attempts to, to mitigate that for whatever reason. I don't know if it's some sort of vortex, but that corner uh, it ha has had ongoing drug dealing. If we put in public restrooms in that location, we've just provided a one-shop stop for these individuals. They buy their drugs, they go into the restroom and use them. I'm not being dramatic, that will happen. That is what was happening um, in the restrooms at Loudoun. Um, so I, I do have very real and justified concerns about that, about putting the restroom there and, and um, what that will attract. Again, to, as Tony mentioned, the intersection of our activities that we're there to provide to the community and, and those activities. Last, last two questions. Um, so you really sincerely, don't think that a having an attendant there would could be eyes and ears on the street as well as um, willing to clean up uh, the, the restroom and make sure it operates. Are you are you referring to an attendant at a porta potty or in at the restrooms at inside a, at the porta potty? Um, I don't know. I can't. I mean, I don't, I haven't seen that situation. I do think that the. Um, 
it would take a very unique volunteer to, to put in that time and that commitment and, and uh, be able to <coughs> interact and intervene with those situations. And um, they would have to be somebody that is thick skinned physically comfortable being threatened, you know, but I, I don't know because we haven't, we haven't had that specific instance. Thank you. Okay. Last no. question is, okay. um, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt you. I'm sure. going to go ahead and ask that members of the community refrain from speaking out at this time. Ms. Cool, I'm going to go ahead and ask that you please, uh, wait in your, tell it's your turn and we'll have an opportunity to hear from you at that time. Right now is the opportunity for the council to, um, ask questions of our staff. You'll have an opportunity to speak as well. We'll go ahead and consider that a warning. Please continue okay. council. Member Crum with your questioning. I hear different things about the PD, uh, the police department um, community room restroom. Um, are people uh, have the ability to use that restroom? Is it open or is it only during like community events that go on in that room? Um, our understanding and what's been communicated to us from um, PD is that it is generally open. However, if there are trainings being held, uh, police related trainings being held in the community room, or if there are like the teen academy, um, if there's vulnerable groups who may be there um, attending something at the community room, we have the calendar. Of, of what's going on in the community room so we can look at it and say, okay, it's open. And then it's open during their their front office hours. It's not 24 seven access, um, but we do offer that um, service to, to look at the calendar and let them know if that one's an option. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, thanks to the staff and um, most importantly, thank you for running an amazing uh, community center and uh, serving, it sounds like everyone from 101, 102 down to uh, very young and uh, just being mentors for them and, and being a safe place for our community to be. So thank you very much for whatever you guys do. I have a couple of questions about some other facilities. Um, the depot, I know, uh, the carriage or carriage building there, is that, does that have restrooms in it or is that available at all? What's, I don't know enough about that facility to know what's there or not there, except I vote there, so. <laughs> uh, yes, it's open. Um, I believe park hours is all that's open. I, uh, Travis is not here to, to speak to that from the park side, but yeah, I think it's just park hours that that's open. So that would be typical park hours as in, as in any Sunrise other Sunrise to sunset, okay. yeah. Okay, and is that similar at the restrooms, uh, both at, at both of the restroom facilities down at the beach? Correct, correct. Uh, and really the same with virtually all of, of our restrooms. So Grant Park, the same thing. We open those up first thing in the morning. Um, Near your lagoon? Near your lagoon, yep. As a restroom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And, um, Downtown, it would be Civic Center, probably Civic Auditorium would be the closest. And Civic Auditorium, and there are public restrooms as well. Um, I won't get all these right, but uh, through parking garages and por porta potties, porta lets, um, uh, yeah, a variety of restrooms downtown as well. And have you had cause to close any of the other um, restrooms, such as the one at the Depot Park, because of vandalism or other things like that? Yeah, we've closed San, <clears throat> excuse me, San Lorenzo Park uh, temporarily. Um, in the past year, we've closed Grant Park uh, restroom a uh, handful of times uh, in the past year. Um, and those have been relatively short durations. Um, Grant Park, in all cases, um, it was due to vandalism and maintenance needs, uh, repair needs. Um, similar to San Lorenzo, where uh, we find a lot of syringes, um, kind of jammed down toilets and, and different debris jammed down toilets to uh, to clog, thank you, uh, to clog up the plumbing. And so in a couple cases, San Lo in particular, um, we installed essentially new infrastructure, kind of a new daylight in the, a new access point in the sewer lateral so that we could snake that uh, out rather than having a contractor come in and pay a, a lot more money to do so. So. Um, yeah, Due to vandalism, um, uh, yeah, a lot of syringe use, um, uh, graffiti, those type of things, both Grant and San Lorenzo have been closed um, uh, at least a handful of times uh, in the past year. Has Neary or the beaches or the depot site park been closed that, that you can recall? Not that I can recall. Um, not that I can recall. Okay, thank you. Yep. We have Councilmember Glover, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then I'll come over to Councilmember. Thank Glover. you. Uh, was that one of the resource pages? Uh, that's the list of all the um, restrooms. Restroom hours. Provides, including the hours and um, I think on some of them kind of the distance from 
Oh, okay, good thing. That's yep. we also oh, so the resource list. Okay, yep. awesome. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that uh, when you have a second, maybe while we're hearing uh, public comment. Um, so, what's the just what's the closest bathroom that you recommend people go to? Was it what you'd say that's depot if, say, the uh, police department's closed? We, we, there are some kind of in different directions, but. Um, PD is one of them, Depot is one of them. Um, there are other known um, businesses, but we don't necessarily, because they're not city ones, we don't necessarily say it out loud, but there's like the bagelry, um, the laundromat, the uh, La Hacienda Mexican restaurant is, is um, frequently open, possibly not always, mm -hmm. but... Um, yeah, so that's what this list is for. Okay, thank you. Um, the I appreciate the presentation for the research that was done as well as the sharing of your personal experiences and your work over at the, the center. Um, it's just, uh, what are your policies for people with different levels of ability and mobility? Um, specifically, if they come, let's say at 4.05 on a weekday when the police department lobby's closed? Are they forced to go and find alternative um, bathrooms? And if that is the case, if Depot Park is the closest one, it's about 0.3 miles away. For an able-bodied person, that's not that bad. But for someone that has uh, mobility issues, that could be five miles. Uh, so what, what's the policy around people with mobility issues? Uh, if they're not there to attend a class or a program or an event uh, at that time, then they would not be given access to the restroom. Mm. Uh, the one, the one exception, like I mentioned, is for individuals with the developmental disabilities with a, with a, um, an attendee. Yeah, because um, there was a, uh, it was also interesting to hear the statement about the young children that can use the bathrooms. Because I had a mother come and tell me that she wasn't allowed to use the bathroom because her even though her child was using the, the, the play structure. <clears throat> so un unfortunate to have that account, but maybe it was just a mistake or an oversight or something. Um, with uh, the po policy at the center, I mean, I brought, you know, I was one of the councilmen who brought this forward, so it's really important for me personally with regards to access to bathrooms for people. Um, what does it take to get involved with one of the programs? Uh, can you walk in and say, hey, I'm a part of what's going on in room C, and as long as you go into room C and spend an hour, 30 minutes, five minutes, what's, is there a policy specific, specificity with regards to participation in the program? Do they have to pay? If it's a free program, can they just walk in and say I'm part of that program? Um, I w it depends on what the program is and who's facilitating the program. Um, so some, some of the programs or classes that are offered are by private parties who have leased that room and then are, are given a presentation um, or class or service. Um, there are certain programs that are for spe specific groups, seniors, teens, um, toddlers. Uh, there are some groups, uh, some classes that are pretty much wide open. Um, but, you know, so say, for example, um, the high cap group, which is there to provide um, insurance counseling. Theoretically, someone could walk in and uh, maybe who wasn't actually there to seek those services and they could go in and engage with those individuals. That does seem like it would be disrespectful to the facilitators of the class because then they're you know, um, engaging that person and taking their time and resources. Um, but, you know, we, we do trust people. We're not looking to catch people in lies or, you know, we're not looking to, to put people in a situation where they're going and, and um, misrepresenting their purpose in a class or, or a program. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, I, I'll look forward to seeing the, the list that is distributed to people. Um, the concern I had there um, and was just the statement uh, that sometimes they're directed towards other businesses uh, because I think statistically, uh, looking at businesses and how we've seen in Santa Cruz with all of the messages of no restroom use for non-customers, and I think there's, a, there's an article out of Washington, D.C. that cites like at least 65% of the experiences of people trying to use the bathroom if they're experiencing homelessness, experience oppression. So just 
you know, thinking about just access to bathrooms, if someone that had mobility issues came to L London Nelson and needed to use the restroom, but then was told to go 0.3 miles away or try across the street at La Hacienda, but <coughs> if they turn them down, then they're forced to then have been delayed that much longer and get to where they're at. So. There's just a lot of problems, uh, but, I, but I do want to figure out a way to address the issues that your staff is facing with regards to the impact and also uh, an acknowledgement of the uh, issues, concerns, potential dangers and impacts it has on the youth there uh, to figure out a good solution around there. Um, ha outside of, I mean, this was, I think was asked before a little bit, but has there been any other kind of creative outside of the box problem solving besides the uh, attendant on every bathroom and the $2 million price tag with regards to just some other things. And it's okay, you know, I mean, this was a, a thing, but just wondering. No, but if you hear anything, let us know, please. Um, I think, again, we're looking at parks and recreation facilities tonight. I think big picture, looking at the downtown, I think if there's a broader inventory, uh, both city owned and publicly provided, and then, you know, again, a question, do we factor in like the restaurants and those things? Does that, is that part of that inventory? Kind of a master plan, if you will, of what's available, when's it available? Um, th that I think could be could be a first step, and then how do you staff that to support it? Um, but, but yeah, no, no necessarily, you know, innovative, um, ideas tonight. We'll work on it together. Thanks. And then uh, one last question. Uh, you mentioned the issue of needles. I mean, there was a bunch of stuff you mentioned with regards to like firecrackers and all this other kind of stuff, which is always unfortunate, but needles are a big uh, concern. Do you uh, and the Parks Department support the implementation or the installing of Sharps containers in all public bathrooms? Um, in all public bathrooms, no. No, uh, we've got really, uh, really detailed data and we're working with County Health Services Agency right now um, in terms of their litter reduction program um, that was part of the direction that we got from the Parks and Recreation Commission. There are places I think where they could be um, well used, um, but to put them everywhere, the, the data doesn't support it. I, I don't think there's necessarily reason to put them everywhere, but we do have really detailed data. Uh, we found approximately 4,500 syringes in parks um, beaches and open spaces last calendar year um, and expect to find that same number this year, but they're targeted in specific areas. So uh, my answer to your question would be no for all parks and restrooms. That's a wonderful uh, answer with regards to the the fullness of it, um, and I, would l I look forward to working with you on identifying those uh, hot spots for Sharps containers. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cummings. I had another question that's probably more for the city manager's office. Um, have there been any, what kind of issues have you all had any reports about with the portalettes that are around town? Because I see people using them um, when necessary and um, I just want to understand whether or not we see the same levels of vandalism that we find occurring at Loudon Nelson Center. You're referring to the ones that the the ones downtown in the parking lots. Right. We have we have three three sets of those. Uh, we do have um, you know quite a bit of high level service. Uh, Parks may have actually some some more data than than I do, and we do have incidents of, of vandalism uh, periodically at those. Um, we uh, work really closely with the vendor to get them replaced or fixed as quickly as possible. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we do have challenges with those. But however, those we do keep open 24/7. Uh, in addition to the two in the parking garages downtown that are uh, open uh, during the day uh, up until the early evening hours. Um, I don't know, if Tony, if you have any more information on the toilets, but, you know, we, in general, um, I think they, they, we do a really good job of trying to keep them open as much as possible or, or maintain them as much as possible, but we do have incidences, yes. Thanks. And then one more question. Um, are there... My understanding is that, that, you know, the Laurel Street Park, which I guess is adjacent to Loudon Nelson, that um, we have a wide range of people who use that park, including members of the homeless community. Um, so I just wanted to see, you know, what, in terms of people who are going there to recreate versus people who may be experiencing homeless who use that as a place to rest, if you can just speak towards the kind of ratio of people who are hanging out there and... Um, I, I, I don't, haven't run those numbers recently. Um, I would say we have far more individuals coming to the building to use the surface, the, the center for a specific pur purpose, but we do have, um, a f 
fairly regular set of individuals who are coming there for a, a safe place to sleep during the day and hang out and also socialize, I think. Um, on average, I would say there's usually about 10 individuals, 10 to 15, it kind of ebbs and flows. But um, in terms of like, you can count on them every day, there's about 10 that are usually there in, in the park um, hanging out. Do you have a question, uh, Councilmember Matthews? No. Okay. Um, I think we'll go ahead at this time now, uh, open it up to public comment. Thank you, and we'll probably have some more clarifying questions or discussion um, uh, after. I will uh, go ahead and see if there, I have, uh, I'll go ahead and allow the gentleman who's been waiting uh, uh, to speak first for up to two minutes, and then I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to anybody who wants to address the council very briefly in one minute. Um, and after that, we'll have our uh, group presentations and then uh, a two minute public comment. Right, so we'll go ahead and- Permission to talk for four minutes. Yeah, you'll have your uh, you'll have your opportunity as a group presentation to uh, present after people who want to speak briefly for one minute go first, and we'll start with you. And if you're up for, did you want the one minute or were you up for the? Uh, I could probably go? just make us brief. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I uh, really appreciate the director's uh, comments and and also the director of Loud Nelson. Uh, is, their report was thoroughly graphic, and uh, I think we can really see what kind of problems are going on there. Um, it's really important that you safeguard those participants. These are kids and seniors, and they cannot be subject to that type of tra traumatic and dangerous environment that's being imported into that center. Um, one thing I would say is you, you folks are incredibly lucky to have those people working for the city. Um, I was an employer for many years here, and one of the important things is if you're gonna give people responsibility, you have to give them the tools to be able to have the authority to deal with these things. They can't be coming back over and over to you uh, with, you know, going, what are we gonna do? Uh, you, you have to give authority along with responsibility, and they certainly are handling their responsibilities and they're asking for the guidance and the authority to deal with them and you really do have to cede them that authority to some extent by giving them proper policies to deal with these, these issues. So I'm Is there any other member of the community who would like to address the council in one minute briefly? I can do it in one minute. I think. So I have a huge concern when an innovative solution has been proposed and yet we still hear would you like to open the bathrooms? No. Um, I kind of think after this conversation, we might consider taking the word community out of the Loudon Nelson Community Center. It's not okay when I hear untruths being said as well. People who have small children at the park do not get to use the bathroom. Um, I personally have been told that my kids can't use the bathroom. When people have potty training children, um, that, that's an issue. When people have mobility issues, that's, that's an issue. It's not okay to call yourself a community center and then when somebody really needs to come in there and use the bathroom and they're elderly, you hand them a piece of paper directing them to, you know, a little less than a mile away. It's, it's unacceptable. Um, we need bathrooms because everybody goes to the bathroom. If you put an attendant in those bathrooms, it will be a lot less likely that they're going to be violated in some of the ways that you, that you heard, which we can't even prove whether or not they're true because there's very small data on that. Anybody else, briefly, um, you'll have one minute. If you're interested in speaking for one minute, can you're I have to longer if I wait longer? Yeah, you can. Okay, cool. Is there anybody interested in addressing the council within one minute briefly? Please come forward and you'll have one minute. I'm Mike Rios and I'm from Loud Nelson, uh, Meals on Wheels program manager. It is a safe environment now. The bathrooms are safe for everybody. And that's why I'm here to let, I know some of my folks will like it, but. That's what we're here for, a safe place for our people, and it is. Thanks. Um, so it seems like the uh, proposals today don't solve the problem, they just kind of redirect it. Um, it seems like some more long-term solutions might be safe injection sites, um, and obviously these kinds of policies are targeted at the homeless population, and we all know that the solution to homelessness is housing, so if we could at least spend the same amount of time discussing long-term solutions, I think that would be great. Thanks. Anybody else briefly? Do you want one minute? 
Uh, would you like to address the council in one minute? Okay. I want to say it's a complex challenge, like I said before, and that we can do it as a community. And <laughs> I respect park laborers being one in Watsonville for about six months as a substitute. Um, I think one idea uh, could have some type of rules and agreement sign in by time to hold people responsible if they want to use the restroom at Loudoun. Another idea in just uh, public restrooms around is uh, develop some kind of art uh, that can discourage inappropriate behavior inside and prevent vandalism and how art is very powerful in that way. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, seeing no additional members of the community wanting to address the council briefly in one minute, we'll go ahead and um, return back to the presentations. And I have um, the first presentation being Mr. Norris from Huff. Please come forward, you'll have up to four minutes. <clears throat> I hate to say this, but I have to use the bathroom. I'll be back. Okay. So we'll have the second presentation being um, Conscious in Action, and I believe we had Steve, uh, but it seems that we have um, uh, Phil Posner here. You can go first. And I have only three presentations, and the next will be uh, Jay and Brown. These are, these are, so. these are and you'll have four minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Phil Posner, founder and co-chair with Steve Pleitch of Conscience in Action. Perhaps you saw my letter to the editor in today's Sentinel, which is germane to some of the stuff we're talking about this evening. We are an activist group that addresses issues that have to do with justice and suffering in our community, including the need to increase 24-hour access bathrooms. In that context, last week we organized a petition to you, which I have handed to you just now, and those here assembled also have it. However, I do want to read the first lines as they are statements from individuals who stood at this very podium within the last year. I'm 81 and homeless, she said, standing before a city, our city council. And at night, I have no place to pee or defecate. I'm here asking for your help, close quote. I have a prostate problem, he said, and sometimes I pee in my pants. In three days last week, our three homeless activist organizations, the board of the Association of Faith Communities, Hadesh Menu Synagogue, the local ACLU, five downtown businesses, the United Service Agency, and the local chapters of Veterans for Peace, all signed on to the petition which you now have in your hands. Imagine how many more others we could have had signed if it, we had more time. We understand that the city is facing an ongoing financial crisis and that both council and staff are limited by time and energy in their efforts to address pressing community problems. And we understand that government alone cannot solve all of our community ills, as reflected in Tony's uh, sharing with you. However, we also believe that good government must prioritize issues that have to do with human suffering and discrimination. And I'm going to cut out the stuff that I gave, handed you about the state section. Our concern is discrimination. We understand that there are not nice people, but what about that lady, 81, who had no place to pee? What about that man who had to pee in his pants? In other words, why does the city, in this case, Parks and Rec, particularly with Loudon, prioritize uh, some bad individuals and therefore discriminate against all of the other innocent individuals who have no place to go to. And Tony, I respect you very, wherever you are. I respect very much his work. But Tony, we came to you, we met with you at least twice and we gave out of the box eight suggestions that we thought were pretty creative. Mm -hmm. And Tony said to us, I will get back to you. We never heard from him. Mm. And I said, you the other day said to me, we're considering some of your proposals. 
I didn't hear any proposal having to do with monitors, signing in, and other things that we have suggested now for over a year. Council persons, as you know, our community is replete with occasions when ordinary citizens and their government have to come together to create public-private partnership for the good of our community. We believe that the private privations, suffering, and lack of basic dignity caused by the presently existing lack of sufficient bathrooms in Santa Cruz is such an occasion. As our petition indicates, we would prefer that you direct Parks and Rec and other relevant city departments to open more bathrooms so that people don't have to pee. Okay. However, indicative of the your fact that the up. city has your a moral responsibility. Please. Okay, your I'll stop. You, you, you have the rest of my talk. Yes. I hope you look at it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Mr. Norris, it's an opportunity for you to speak on behalf of PATH. And you'll have four minutes. Please come forward. So, um, who will change city council's dirty diapers at Loudon Nelson and City Hall? Clearly not the city council, unfortunately. Uh, or maybe not. I mean, who knows what can happen. Uh, some activists have posted adult diapers around the city as an iconic and ironic reminder that bathrooms here at City Hall and at Loudon Nelson remain closed during business hours, and this has gone on for months or years. Hence, the Parks and Rec it, its claim that it wants to be accountable is, is not really accountable at all. It has, in, in fact, taken the choice of closing bathrooms here at City Hall for political purposes because there were protests here around the sleeping ban. And similarly, in the Loudon Nelson Center, the, these, those bathrooms became closed after the closing of the San Lorenzo Park when people had to move there or move to the different parks. And we had Supervisor Isaiah Thray, who you heard who spoke to earlier, she directed her staff to refuse access to these bathrooms. Even though Laurel Park is a part of the center, we're hearing this classist and, and sort of suspiciously racist aspect where people who are in the park, using the park, are conflated with people who are drug dealers or masturbators, or I don't know what else, but there are plenty of actual people needing to use this, who, use who play basketball, who can no longer use these bathrooms. Clearly discrimination. It doesn't, doesn't say black only, it doesn't say white only, but it says only people who are paying and coming to paying events or at the discretion of the staff because sometimes staff members let people go there, sometimes. It's ironic that Isaac Ray spoke out about the wretched conditions for renters and workers for herself and her family at the last city council meeting. She was right. And she should not be put in a position of having to force people to piss in their pants to do her job. And if she's initiating this, then I'm sorry to hear that too. We have ourselves, those of us who are concerned with opening these bathrooms, taken direct action, and we will take direct action again in order to make sure the community can exercise its true voice. City Council Bernal's memorandum attached to this whole issue, which you have, is a reprint from 2018. He hasn't presented you with any new data other than the verbal anecdotes of Isaac Ray and Tony Elliott. There is no series of stats, particularly, about particular abuses and, and costs, so-called vandalism in the bathrooms. You don't have any indication of what the real costs are Compare with normal upkeep costs elsewhere in the city. I also, of course, as was pointed out, the solution seems to be uh, the feces on the grass solution. There's no cost to what, what's the cost of cleaning up all that stuff? That was raised by, by Mr. Crone here. It's obvious, it's an obvious question, and there's been no answer to it from Mr. Bernal or anybody in the city because the purpose here is really more of a class notion that it's okay to exclude a class of people, in this case, people who are drug users, homeless, poor, wash their clothes in the sink, than to deal with those issues. The way to deal with them is to exclude them, to deny them, to lock them out. Well, I tell the community and I ask the community, we must resist this and not through this council unless they unaccountably take action tonight. We must resist it by getting those codes, sharing those codes with anybody who needs them, and using those codes. On September 3rd, we will be at Loudon Nelson a week from today at 1.30, opening those bathrooms to people who need them. That, I believe, is what's gonna happen. 
Thank you. And the last group presentation is, um, we have J.M. Brown coming up, and I think it's on behalf of the Parks and Rec Commission. And you'll have four minutes as well. Then we'll go to open public comment for two minutes and we'll see the light on the left. Good evening, Mayor, <laughs> members of the council. I'm J.M. Brown, chair of your Parks and Rec Commission. I'd like to acknowledge the other members of the commission who are here this evening, Vice Chair Locatelli, Commissioner Mio, Commissioner Don Scott Norris, and Commissioner Christina kincaid Glavis. Um, as stated by the staff, the commission unanimously passed two recommendations at our July 1st meeting. One is related to facilities closures and restrictions in general and a more specific recommendation around further study for the Loudon Nelson restrooms. I won't re repeat what's in your packet, but I do really appreciate um, the opportunity to provide you more information about the discussion that the committee had that led to those recommendations. In crafting these recommendations, the commission really sought to create a balance between the desire to make our facilities safe and accessible with the need for greater transparency about how those decisions are made. We felt it was important to preserve the discretion of our parks and recreation staff to use their best professional judgment about when conditions of a facility, be it a restroom or other portions of a park or open space, necessitate closure in order to reduce harmful conditions or address an emerging environmental need, such as restoration or fire prevention. We also felt it was important for the council and the commission to receive timely updates about those closures, as well as an estimated timeline for reopening. And that's why we structured our recommendation in such a way that would create clear guidelines for the Parks and Rec Director to use when deciding whether to close a facility, and then to create a communications protocol that provides notification to the Council and the Commission. This recommendation was specifically crafted to provide the Council with an opportunity to receive an update and provide direction no later than 21 days from the beginning of a closure or at their next regular Council meeting. And the Commission, of course, can be updated by email uh, and provide input every other month when we uh, actually meet here in person. I think I speak for all of us when I say that the Commission joins the Parks and Rec staff in wanting our facilities open to the greatest extent possible under safe and well-maintained conditions. It's clear throughout the city that staff are entrusted by the council to use their professional judgment to properly maintain other infrastructure, such as roads and water mains, and close them when conditions necessitate doing so for health and safety reasons. Parks and Rec should be no different. Our Parks and Rec staff provided testimony to the Commission, uh, much of which you also heard this evening, about some of the deplorable public health conditions that they and other members of the public have been exposed to in restrooms and other areas of our facilities. We also know that from time to time, uh, non-emergency conditions such as the need for restoration and repairs require restricting access. So we felt it was important that our staff remain empowered to serve the public by having a transparent process for temporarily closing facilities when conditions justify. Lastly, the Commission also discussed the importance of differentiating between behaviors that necessitate action to reduce harm versus the identification of any particular groups of people. We do not, as a Commission, support limiting access to our facilities based on any real or perceived identity or status, but rather as a result of behaviors and conditions. And we do not see a correlation between a person's housing status and behaviors that are in violation of our rules and regulations. As we all know, bad behaviors can come at the hands of people who have shelter and people who don't. We have a beautiful parks and open space system that we all want to be free of public health hazards. So we hope that the city can partner with the county's public health agency to address what really are countywide challenges around needle waste and human waste. With that, I thank you for your time and uh, I'd like to invite other members of the commission to share any individual comments they may have. I'll just echo uh, James and all of our uh, recommendation to you. And I felt it very important bec because <laughs> we, oh, is that done? You know what, what I think would be yeah. more appropriate if you wanted to add any additional comments that you can do so oh, individually. Oh, just well, I'll do it. I'm fine. We, yeah, okay. thank you. But I want to thank the commission for being here and thank mm -hmm. you for your service to our city in that capacity as well. Sorry, I guess there was confusion. We were told the commissioners would have two additional minutes They can afterwards. have two additional minutes oh, after. That time. Okay. That's right. Thank you yeah. for your time. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go ahead and have, uh, and you'll have up to two minutes. 
Uh, Keith McHenry, McHenry liked the library. I found it interesting and have always found it interesting that there's an open air drug market across from the police station. Um, I went to the, uh, um, I rented Loudon Nelson. I went to an appointment to do a sound check with the sound person. I needed to go to the bathroom. I have had prostate uh, operations. I had to go. I was not allowed to go. I asked, well, why don't you just give me the number like they do in other restaurants and places like that. They would not give that to me. So I had to pee in the bushes outside of Loudon Nelson. That's really inappropriate. Um, I think if you just have a policy where a person comes up to the front desk and asks to have the code, uh, it would probably work out just fine. And a lot of the problems that you saw when no, what, there was no code would disappear, because I'm sure no one really wants to go through that. It turns out that the state of California and the federal government says that there has to be um, um, five toilets and hand wash facilities for every hundred employee. I would suggest that that's probably, according to the um, a national, I mean, the California Association of Environmental Health Managers, a policy that should be adopted for people living outside. They um, assured me that that was probably a uh, public health crisis and that the city would um, be well advised to have five toilets and five hand wash stations per 100 people that live outside. I could not make it to the police station. It was already closed. There was no other places to go. I wasn't given like the uh, little letter telling me what other bathrooms were in the area, so I had to resort to the bushes, and I think a great many other people have to do that. There are many health issues surrounding going to the bathroom. When I was homeless, I had fibromyalgia and I had irritable bowel syndrome, and it was a huge crisis all the time. And it was, I felt really horrible that I had to go to the bathroom outside so frequently. Thank you. I too question uh, how much staff time was spent cleaning up non-bathroom human waste. Uh, we do know that last year 94 citations for public urination were issued. Uh, it's very likely that we need to have more public bathrooms available with uh, extended hours. We also need to account and plan for the reality that bathrooms will be vandalized and that illegal behavior is likely to occur in them. But rather than closing bathrooms or limiting access to them, let's plan a way to keep toilet facilities open while accounting for and mitigating vandalism and other illegal behavior. Let's investigate the best practices for bathroom management. Maybe open some new bathroom locations, maybe install some sharps containers, maybe maybe staff some commonly abused locations, maybe use volunteers or allow private organizations to pay for public facilities. If, bathroom, if, if paid bathroom staff are used, consider empowering them to refer people to social services. If the primary reason to hire bathroom staff is to reduce vandalism, it seems like hiring attendance is not necessarily the right solution from a pure cost-benefit perspective. Uh, according to the staff presentation in the, la in the last two weeks, um, uh, there were approximately 25 man hours per day associated for cleaning up the vandalism uh, spent on um, uh, citywide. Uh, the existing maintenance costs appear to be far less than a, far less expensive than hiring bathroom attendants citywide would be. Uh, if bathrooms are being closed primarily because of issues with public safety, then let's look at how we can address the underlying problem behaviors without limiting the public's access to an important public resource. Thank you. Next speaker. I hope we can all agree that these are important issues. It's a real balance, you know, the staff legitimately are saying this is really, really hard and the public is legitimately saying that public facilities should be open for the public. So, and you're the right body to hear this because you do represent the public in overseeing these facilities. So. The most important thing for me that I urge you to do is to adopt the policy where the council decides when to close a facility for more than 14 or 21 days or whatever. The suggestion to use APOs and council member handbooks, let me give you my experience with that as a council member. Um, it was huge, it had a gun on it, it was the Bearcat. So it turns out that when they, when the police applied for a grant to get the Bearcat, they were already supposed to have talked to the council before they applied for the grant. That was an APO at the time, but everyone had forgotten about it, right? I bet you if you had, you know, 600 hours, you could find 50 or 100 APOs or council member handbook policies that weren't remembered, not out of any kind of, you know, 
dereliction of duty just because that stuff is tiny and minutia and people don't remember it. And this particular issue, as you know, is not a minute issue. It's an issue that people care about. The staff care a lot about it. The public cares a lot about it. Homeless advocates care a lot about it. It's not the kind of thing you should put in an APO and assume that you will hear about it. If, if you want to, you have the responsibility to mitigate and referee and balance these concerns. And so the, the straightforward way to do that is to tell the staff that they can close the bathroom for 14 or 20 days, which is plenty of time to fix things or repair things, whatever. But if they're gonna close it as a policy act to reduce usage so as to protect a facility, that's a city council decision. That shouldn't be a staff decision. When these parks were open, no one ever imagined, no one ever imagined that the staff would close the facility to the public to protect the facility. That's not a staff level decision. So I hope that you'll immediately adopt the original language. And just to show you how hard it, it took seven months just to get this issue back to you. So you should adopt the language to say that they may not close facilities without going to the city council. I just had to come back. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the reasons that this is really important is for environmental issues too. As far as I'm concerned, the parks are and open spaces are going to be really important in view of the climate change. Park and Rec should have the possibility to close and protect an area when necessary. So also, I I think hearing from the city attorney in regards to how other cities and the state law is in regards to open public uh, public owned bathrooms will help this discussion. So thank you very much and that's it. Next speaker please. Hi, my name is Elise Casby and I'm furious and I don't have a lot of respect for any of the officials in this city. I'm sorry, but I was a respectful citizen for decades and as I slowly investigated the truth, the situation that homeless people are living in, not only in Santa Cruz, but in other cities and other aspects of our so-called burgeoning democracy, I, I have just become extremely dis disrespectful and it's because people have not earned my respect. And I just wanna start with these presentations. First of all, I wanna thank Tony for his presentation, especially the APO that he's in asking for on transparency. But this report was terribly, terribly biased and full of prejudice. By any sociological academic standard, both his and Lizeth's reports, they come up against a background of hate and amazing, awful prejudice against the homeless that is every day uh, touted and encouraged by the, not only Cynthia Matthews in this council, but also by people who run the homeless shelters in many instances, and I've investigated them and I have not written my report. I think I might have to do it when I leave the town because I think it's unsafe to tell the truth too much here. I applaud council member Glover's truth telling and patience. I can't understand how he has that much. And also council member Crone and Browns. But I just wanna say, Lizeth interestingly missed the fact that the Metro bathroom is very close maybe closer than the Depot Park. For somebody who's every day in the business of recommending close bathrooms, why did she miss that? Huge question mark, and I'll tell you why. Because that report is so lacking in facts, as she said, some data. How about police reports of some of these instances? I'm just disgusted by this entire so-called neutral report. It is not, it is horribly biased. It was stolen from up here. I want information on it and I want it back. Comment to Thank you. I'm Cynthia with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. Um, I was just listening to the um, ISEF and the um, head of Parks and Recreation's report, and it was very interesting. But I feel like there's two visions of Santa Cruz, but one of them sort of more real than the other. Santa Cruz is like a um, known uh, sexual trafficking hub. It's had an extreme drug problem for many years, and it has an FBI task force, you know, lodged here 
permanently with the sheriff's department. People who work for the city, they need to understand what kind of a place this really is and not try to concoct a, a kind of an image uh, of what they would like it to be like if only they could. And so, you know, I don't know how you're gonna to, to, to d d get to that, but, um, this, you know, it's not, I, you know, the city has 65% fewer children than Watsonville for a reason. I protected my son for a reason. I didn't become a drug addict for a reason. You know, it's, it's all around here. It takes a consciousness to live a healthy life here. And so people who work for the city, they need to understand that these are our neighbors and some of them are sick, some of them are mentally sick and there's nowhere for them to go and that we have a high percentage here because it's such a nice place. This place is not going to be kicking out all these people who, you know, aren't the, your ideal neighbors. They're going to be here. And I think maybe that the staff could use also some training on really just uh, a little bit more compassion. I mean, pregnant women, you know, old people. I mean, I take care of a guy who's in, incontinent. You know, these people need to be able to use the bathroom, as do I. There's a lot of pre-diabetic -di people around here. They have to pee every half hour. You know, you 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 just have to have a little more uh, broader look at uh, people. All right, I'm gonna get a sense of how many people still want to address the council. Okay, we'll have the three and then the individual on the on the end there as our last speaker. Yeah, I agree pretty much with everybody's been saying, and it's, it's, we need to go preemptive. And that should save us the money as well, and maybe solve a lot of other issues we have with drug problems or whatever. I came to this town. I was I did at least 50 big wilderness treks way out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody was to say where I could go, where I can't go to the bathroom. I came into this town and had a girlfriend here. We, she was nannying for a little girl. We used to go to Loud Nelson. This was 40 years ago. These are not new events. I don't remember all these years being closed down. Now I knew I also was like the stepdad to one of the boys that now is a man who worked at Loud Nelson for years and years off and on that had to deal with these issues. Same thing, he had to deal with the issues. But the center wasn't closed down for people like me who went to go ask to play basketball and I couldn't do it. Speaking of basketball playing, I don't go there now because I can't play basketball because I can't go wash, go to the bathroom there. So I'm punished. So you're punishing everybody else with some bad boys or bad girls do. That is not fair. We gotta keep looking for solutions. We can't push everybody away from what we need to do. You have to change the mission statement. You have to change that it's not a community center everymore because it's not taking all of the community. It's not taking the mission I'm gonna go ahead and pause you. People. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the comments. This is your opportunity to address the council. If you wanna address no. the council, you're welcome I'm to sorry, do that. I'm not gonna be rude, but. I'm gonna go ahead and cut off your time and you're gonna have to uh, go ahead and take a seat at this We're time. This of, is not the opportunity to address the- part of the community. You can address the council. You can address the council. To do that. If you wanna address the council, you're welcome to address the council. Feel free to address us and back. you'll have your remainder of time. Yeah, so I got my back to everybody else. You can see how back yeah, go ahead. If you want to address uh, the council, you you're welcome to do, do that. I can't. You can do it. You're free. I feel like he's talking to everybody. Mr. I'm Norris, trying to talk to I'm everybody because go we time. all govern go together, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful of you or anybody, okay. but it's disrespectful if I can't talk to everyone else, you and only you. Mr. Norris, I'm going to go ahead and ask that you please stop. That, you've been warned. This if there's another outburst, I'm going to go ahead and ask Here that you Here we go. Leave. It's just selective okay. again. Okay? I want, I'm okay, gonna, I'll talk to you. Okay. How much longer we'll do I got rest. then? Are you going to give it to me again? Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and take, if you can't, we'll go ahead and finish. Okay, hey, I'll we'll talk to you. How much more long are you going to give me? If you want to finish your comments, we can go ahead and finish the comments. Why can't you have people? Okay, well, we'll go. Okay, Mr. McHenry, you can, okay, why don't you go ahead and go ahead and leave, please? We'll go ahead and ask that you leave. I have given you a warning. The, the staff here, go ahead and ask them to leave. Okay. You're interrupting the ability for us to be able to do city's business. You can go ahead and go. Why are you so rude? You're the one that creates the acid. I do feel like you're the top in the middle of the 
Oh, you, see, you could like, go ahead. Why are you like that? Okay, you, you're. You know, you're to be okay. People. We'll wait until you're able to. Uh, um, we'll have uh, decorum back in the council, and it's just we'll very hurtful that you won't let me share with everybody in the room because everybody's the politician here. Everybody voted for these people. Everybody's part of this community, right? It's just not right that I have to turn my back and not be able to go back and forth to them and you. It's just not right. I'll have to say that. But like I said, it's just, and I used to bring my daughter to Loud Nelson 20 years ago. Hey, Watkins! And it was, it was not an issue. I brought my daughter to the mall. I've been hearing about that too, how dangerous the mall is. That's bull. I go down there all the time. There's kids there all the time having fun every single day, all day long. Just too much paranoia, too much control. Yes, my name is Alani Anadi. I did not intend on speaking, but I want to clarify one, the parks were closed for five to six weeks. The beach has been closed, the cow beach, the bathrooms, at least one of them has been closed at least three times because I'm there at least five, six days a week. I go by both the city park and Grand Street Park at least three times a day because I live off of Market Street. I am fortunate enough that I have not had a place as well as had a place. I'm one of the first 180, 180 recipients. I'm not a drug addict, but I have worked with addicts all my life. I'm a retired social worker, so I pretty much have an idea about a lot of these quote-unquote drug war politics. I love Santa Cruz. <laughs> to be honest, it's really kind of disgusting what's happening in Santa Cruz, because you're turning into San Francisco, and five years from now, you'll open all the bathrooms just like Santa Cruz had to, because you're so disgusted with all the headbang and all this stuff. But right now, you're in the process of training people to not have any common sense and decent humanity. And as far as Loud Nelson, my grandson and I have been turned away three times because when I go to do laundry downtown, which is not that often anymore because I have to bring my basket, you know, while our laundry's at the place, we bring our basket because I'm not going to leave it at the Speedy Wash to get stolen, we go over there to play. But since we're not using the facilities because the parks and the basketball court are not considered part of the facilities, Luckily, I know how to look people in the eye and make it clear to them how inhumane it is for you to tell me that I can't use the restroom more than my grandson can't. I have been allowed to. So if it goes against your policies, then you need to talk to your staff. Because it is inhumane to not let someone with a disability card or a child use a restroom. You know? Now, the fact, I also used to volunteer at the shelter. And when I caught somebody using, I remembered their face. Like I said, common sense is not that common for some reason. Now, unfortunately, when you have police officers, I don't call them, but I am the kind of person that when I bust somebody using in public, I do tend to go off because I feel assaulted. A needle in public is just like a gun. I have no sympathy for it. I have sympathy for the user, but not the needle. But when an officer says Your that everyone here has a needle, Your you can't count on them. Okay. Have you guys been going all day? I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, my name is Serge, and uh, I want to thank Parks and Rec too, and, and Tony, uh, and those guys. I enjoy uh, Poganip. I went running there yesterday. I got a tour of the Homeless Garden Project today, That what they're going to be putting out there. Had a hawk land on my windshield, on my windshield wiper. Got a picture, super cool. Um, saw some wild turkeys. Uh, I've enjoyed community centers my whole life, you know, as a kid taking classes. Loud Nelson, uh, winter shelter, 2017, 2018. I helped uh, run the winter shelter and we did intakes at Loud Nelson right about the same time that the bathrooms were closed and we had to walk people to the bathrooms and stuff like that. Um, I, people have to breathe, eat, defecate, urinate, whether you let them, you're gonna allow them to do it or not. Uh, if you don't want them public urination and public defecation, you have to give them bathrooms. If you don't want to leave trash on the ground, you have to give them trash cans. If you don't want to have needles on the ground, you put out sharps containers. Um, there have been votes before by city council of limiting those red uh, sharps containers around town because they didn't, they didn't want them seen. But there are very few of those things around. That's also part of the problem. It seemed to me that there was there wasn't really numbers on the loud Nelson of what the problems were. There were a bunch of anecdotes, a bunch of disgusting and gross things that people who clean bathrooms have to deal with, which is super true. Um, but that's bathrooms and that's the public and 
that's way cheaper than having an assistant too. It seemed more that it was the emotional response. Somebody had a horrible first day when somebody overdosed on their first day. Absolutely true. But to close the bathroom because of that, for which really mostly challenges the homeless who tend to not get the same medical care, who tend to have the elderly have the prostate problems and need the bathrooms, they're the ones that are going to suffer. I'm okay. proposing you send it to Your the time. catch Your time and is you up, keep, it, keep it open. Your time is till up, Serge. I, I thank you. Get some more Your data. time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I believe there's a state law that says that any public facility has to have open bathrooms accessible to the public, whether or not they're using the facility or not. Um, then the issue of people destroying the bathrooms, well, they have in prisons indestructible toilets and sinks and we could put these in the bathrooms if that's really an issue we could put these indestructible fixtures in and that way we would take care of that problem um, when i used to live in isla vista the parks district there for the cleaning problems ha would take all the paper products out or they had some uh, product dispensers that they could seal up and then they would hose off the bathrooms and they could you know spray it with disinfectant and hose it off yeah. it takes care of a lot of problems that way you know that way it's, you're not spending as much time cleaning and you you get the job done much quicker um, if there's an OD problem in the bathrooms at Loud Nelson why don't they have Narcon behind the counter. So that if somebody ODs in the bathroom, you can go spray some Narcan up their nose and the, the OD is over. It seems like a really reasonable idea. Um, as far as needles go, one of the main reasons people litter needles all over the place is because once they're dirty, they're illegal. They can get arrested and taken to jail for carrying a dirty needle. If they have a clean needle, they can't get arrested for that, but a dirty needle is an arrestable offense. So if you direct the police to stop arresting people for dirty needles, maybe they won't throw them all over town. Okay, your time is done. Okay, we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to go ahead and close public comment. I'll just remind the community that. It's my job to ensure decorum, and it's an opportunity when public comment is to address the council, and it's my job to also ensure that the um, language used is for the council and not necessarily uh, directed at any staff or any individuals. If we have questions for staff based on your comments, we can take that in and we can ask the staff for that. But to have uh, language and questions or uh, comments directed directly to staff um, is not appropriate for public comment. It's a time to address the council and it's my job to ensure decorum at that time. I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick pause. We're gonna have a two minute break and then we're gonna return back to council for action and deliberation. Story. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the council meeting back into session, if I could get your attention. Okay, so we um, are out of time, and I'll go ahead and... Um, remind uh, the community that we had an opportunity to hear from you. This is now the time for the council to have an opportunity to um, provide policy direction and to take in your input and other um, inputs and uh, decide what's best for our city as we move forward. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, bring it back to the council uh, for uh, action and deliberation. I think I heard uh, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then 
I didn't see any other hands. So go ahead, Councillor Matthews. Um, well, um, I want to thank everyone for being here uh, and particularly thank uh, the Parks and Rec staff uh, for their extremely um, personal and real life um, testimony about uh, the um, conditions that um, have presented themselves at Loudon Nelson and their mission to serving a very, very, very broad range of community members um, safely. Um, and I also want to thank our parks commissioners who are here. I think almost the entire commission attended. Um, uh, to my mind, uh, the Yes, the uh, testimony was very um, convincing. I do also want to say I, I, I appreciate getting a list of referral uh, restrooms and I, Metro's not on here. That's another one. I don't know what's not on there. But in, in any way, there, there are others in addition. Um, uh, they're actually, um, to my count, and I've been actually involved in putting a number of these facilities online over the years. Various parking garages, porta potties, garages, library. Oh, I'm sorry. We we um, had a microphone issue here, so. <laughs> um, um, I think the city has made a serious effort to provide uh, restroom facilities throughout downtown and other places, um, and that will be an ongoing effort. And the cleanliness and maintenance of our restroom facilities throughout the city in public places and particularly parks is an ongoing challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for our parks staff, it's a challenge for our parks users, and we will continue working on that. Um, specifically, um, I do want to say um, I want to move that we accept the recommendations of the Parks and Rec Commission regarding access and hours of public facilities and direct the staff to incorporate recommendations um, as, um, as appropriate um, um, by adopting uh, council policy uh, 7.1. Uh, that would be upholding the existing policy for Loudon Nelson Center, Laurel Park, and um, uh, other public facilities as described. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded um, by Councilmember Myers. Um, and did you have any further comments? I think that covers the basis, okay. yes. Um, my, Vice Mayor Cummings. I know that within the recommendations, I was wondering if we might be able to separate these because I would like to, or I can offer a friendly am amendment to some of the language um, around um, changes to uh, policy 7.1. So it's um, page 1.11 and it states that <clears throat> Parks and Rec Director shall notify members of the Parks and Rec Council, Recreation. Could you speak into the microphone? Sorry. We're having mic challenges. Today. Parks and Recreation Director shall notify members of the Parks and Recreation Commission and City Council within 24 hours after any emergency closure or facility to the general public or not less than within seven days before planned closure and provide an estimated time for reopening and shall during such period of closure provide status updates to members of the Parks and Recreation Commission. And the language change that I would suggest is uh, require the cons consent of the city council when the parks director intends to close a park or facility for more than 21 days. Um. And just to provide some context around that, um, the idea being that uh, oftentimes when parks get closed and facilities get closed for long periods of time, members of the public generally are curious as to why they're staying closed, why they haven't been open, and by providing the feedback to the city council for consideration, I mean, this is something that could potentially just go on the consent agenda and get approval by the city council and not be something that takes a lot of time. But if there's a lot of community um, inquiry as to why parks aren't being open, I think that providing a 21-day timeline actually allows for if there's work that needs to be done around maintenance or other issues that need to be taken care of, um, if it's going to take longer, it can just get communicated back to us and the public and we can provide the consent necessary for those facilities either to recommendations for them to open or remain closed. Um, that's not a friendly amendment. I, I think actually practice has been pretty close to this is if they're for for whatever reason if it's maintenance damage tree falls whatever um, uh, 
if there's an emergency. I, I think this has been a, a standard practice. I, I don't favor every closure having to come to the city council shall during a period of closure provide status updates to members of Parks and Rec Commission and Council not less than every 21 days thereafter. So the way I'm reading this is you will, you'll inform us, uh, us and the commission within 24 hours of an emergency. You'll inform us seven days before a planned closure and that would include a reason. Um, and for a closure uh, as well as a time for reopening. And um, so it's either one of those things. These, uh, the facilities are closed either for emergency or for planning. Am I, am I reading this language correctly? And hmm? or vandalism. Uh, vandalism would be an emergency if it's not usable. I mean, that's, it has to be maintained. And illegal activity, so. Yeah. Um, and you would provide an estimated time for reopening. And if the time is more than 21, goes more than 21 days, you would inform us, um, you would give us updates. And the council could at that, at any point, ask to have it agendized. And I, it's my impression that various facilities for various reasons are closed pretty frequently. And um, I don't think we need this level of um, agenda action. So maybe you could comment on the frequency and severity and reasons um, for the closures. Yes, so to clarify this, I think the intent really uh, behind the, the 21 days um, and I think it's probably worth cleaning up this language a bit. Our intent in proposing this was that for a closure expected to last longer than 21 days uh, or lasting 21 days that we would communicate to the city council we, uh, via a memo, mm -hmm. essentially, that we would communicate to city council that we expect this closure to go longer than 21 days or it has gone 21 days uh, in the form of a memo. And then the city council could say, well, in this case, it's... Um, um, environmentally related. It's uh, preservation of the tar plant or something. So we're supportive of that. Um, uh, no need to bring it to council. Or the council could say, uh, this is questionable as a, pol a matter of policy uh, and request that staff agendize that item to, to bring that back in for any closure longer than 21 days. Uh, I think what might be missing here too is just um, some kind of, and my guess is you do this, uh, a notice at the park, closed for maintenance, anticipated reopening, such and such a time. Um, so maybe some reference to public notice there, just explaining the reason for the closure. Um, but I really don't favor automatically bringing these to the council for approval. So that friendly amendment isn't accepted at this time. Correct. Uh, now I'll, tr I'll try and think of language about notifying the public. Just at the location. Does that make sense? It does, and I believe that's in the existing ordinance already. Oh. I believe that's in the existing language is one of the kind of subparts A, B, C. Do you guys mind toggling back to the, um, to the original? Thank you. Yeah, there already is a, um, a component to the existing ordinance that uh, requires that we, let's see, uh, part, so part B, yeah, notice of such hours of operation oh. shall be posted, cons conspicuously posted and maintained. Well, that's for the open hours, right? Uh, that we, yes, we that allows that you to establish by regulation hours and that you post the hours. And we well, would yes, do this. I see, and then yeah. the park shall notify facility closure shall be communicated to members of the commission. Oh, that's the same language there. Okay, well, let's try and work on that language. Okay. But okay. So at this time, it's not acceptable. Yep. <laughs> Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Um, so, well, I would support the motion with the uh, change in language proposed by Vice Mayor Cummings. So while that's not been accepted as a friendly amendment, it sounds like we may need to make that as a motion to amend and vote on it. Second. Um, 
Well, I was going to let the um, okay. person with the language in front make the motion, but it, it, what, however, we'd like to proceed there. But I also want to ask a clarifying question about um, other recommendations because I don't. I do want to make sure that we have an opportunity to um, provide some direction about some of the other um, items, including, uh, you know, bathrooms at Loudon Nelson. And so, and I believe um, you know I would like to take the um, some of the catch members off uh, up on their offer to refer some items to them. But I so I don't I just don't want to lose those. And I'm happy to make those as separate motions um, or hear other motions. But I just don't want to have because sometimes we close as soon as we get through this one motion. And I'd like to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't I sound like we may get through them all if we put them all together. So let's go ahead and um, try to then separate them out if that think, makes the most sense. I think sense. they're different, yeah. frankly. Okay. So we'll go ahead and acknowledge that and allow space for that after we vote for Great. the first motion. Council Member Glover. Thanks, yeah, so I would uh, not support the motion as it is currently worded. Uh, I would support it uh, potentially with the amended language as suggested by Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, simply for the fact that the reason why this initial issue came up was because of a lack of transparency in the process of the closure of parks and restricted access for people experiencing homelessness, or the community in general, but especially for people experiencing homelessness. And the logic around the coming to council for authorization for those closures is so that we can be aware of the closures and give thumbs up, thumbs down, and or come up with other solutions in the interim since that is important to be able to continually offer bathroom access even if there is the closure of a facility. Uh, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, also with regards to some of the statements, so, so also to echo Councilmember Brown, uh, I think it would behoove us to take the catch members up on their uh, interest in looking over the issue and coming back with recommendations. Uh, one of, or one suggestion that was made was that we uh, open up the bathrooms at London Nelson for a interim period of time while the catch reviews the information and the attendants collect data, because it was a really great presentation, no, no doubt, really great presentation, except for the data. So uh, there was the first two weeks of August with the 226, that wasn't specifically London Nelson though, right? That was all parks bathrooms. So. Uh, what is, what's the data? Um, anecdotal stuff is totally powerful and uh, definitely speaks to the emotional side of things, but what is, where is the empirical data that we're making our decisions off of and what is the collection process? I understand that the library has a rather uh, rigorous uh, data collection when it comes to situations and interactions with people, especially if they have specific needs or issues with the facility. So then the question that follows would be why is uh, the community center, which is claiming that it needs to restrict bathroom access, not collecting that data uh, to be used in uh, ways to potentially explore and expand our services to maximize the impact on everyone. Um, I'm also curious as to what the solutions or suggestions were that were brought forward by the Conscience and Action Group, which didn't make it into the presentation. Um, that's a little disturbing, uh, especially because we want to be thinking of creative solutions. And right now, which seems to be, some, I experienced it a lot when I'm up here, is an either or kind of uh, mentality, as opposed to a here are some multiple options, so let's talk through them all and get creative with the solution. Now, it's not talking uh, negatively against the, the the work of the staff or the, the presentation itself, but it seems to be something that is uh, a part of the culture. And so if we can work towards shifting that and getting more creative in the way that we address some of these problems, as opposed to exorbitant costs for um, universal bathroom attendance or locking bathrooms and keeping people out for uh, their ability to participate. So um, there's that. And then I'm also interested to hear the perception of the uh, city attorney because he, uh, in one of the presentations that was mentioned and in one of the documents that was given to us, it was cited, uh, Article 1 of the Health and Safety Code of the State of California. Uh, it specifically says, every public agency that conducts an establishment serving the public or open to the public and that maintains their and restrooms facility for the public shall make every water closet for each sex maintained within the facility available without cost or charge to the patrons, guests, or invitees of the establishment. Um, just looking at some of the language here, 
here, if we want to look at patrons, for example, the definition of patrons is one who buys the goods or uses the services offered, especially by an establishment. So that suggests that there is no need for purchase or direct participation in the uh, community center if it is in fact a part of Laurel Park, which is a open community space for everyone to use for free. So uh, in your interpretation, what do you think? I read the statute as distinguishing between public, as it references at the beginning of the statute, every, agency, every public agency that conducts an establishment serving the public or open to the public, um, skipping to the chase, cutting to the chase, shall make every water closet available without cost or charge to the patrons, guests, or invitees. So um, I think the, the, the latter part is a narrowing construction of the, of the term public as it's used at the beginning of that, of that uh, section. And the statute um, doesn't specifically define what a patron, guest, or invitee is. But um, you know, we consulted um, Black's Law Dictionary, which seems to be consistent with the interpretation given patron by the staff in in the in the current policy, and also um, you know, b based on rules of statutory construction, we believe the legislature would not have used the descriptive descriptive limiting terms patrons, guests, or invitees if it intended. The, policy, the statute to apply to the public generally, since it did refer to the public um, at the outset of that section. So, so I don't, um, uh, don't get me wrong, I think this is an important policy discussion for the city council to make. I don't think state law compels the outcome, however. Thank you. Um, just also with that, the definition of guest is a person whom hospitality is extended. So if we're looking at the mission statement of the community center and we're trying to be as hospitable to as many people as possible, that could be problematic with regards to uh, the services that we do or don't offer. So. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, my ultimate goal is to open up bathrooms for people that need them and to make them as readily accessible and available as possible while maintaining safety, but not precluding people's access for the fear of safety based off of uh, anecdotal evidence. So I would really like to figure out a way so that we can uh, get the bathrooms open, collect evidence, and then make our decision based off of data uh, as opposed to um, uh, anecdotes. And also, it's concerning because there's the, abil there's the ability issue of people with disabilities, uh, but then there are, have been multiple people now, outside of the people that have approached me individually, but two here tonight with small children that said that they were uh, barred or restricted from using the restrooms, which was a direct contradiction to a report we heard in the presentation. So uh, conflicting stories, weak data, uh, people not having access to public restrooms, and a public health issue with the defecation and urination on our streets, uh, I think we need to open the bathroom. Vice Mayor Cummings. Do you have a question or clarifying? Not anymore. No, I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. Um, any other, go ahead, well. Councilman Brown. Well, I have other comments about some of the other items, but I'm just wondering if where we're at with, we have a motion, we've made some comments. Um, sure. I, 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 yeah, we have a motion on the floor uh, made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. I'm move that there along. was a fr friendly amendment um, proposed by um, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings um, that the language didn't necessarily reflect what I think the intention, so it was not accepted at this point by Councilmember Matthews. And then there was an interest in moving some of the other items on behalf of yourself, Councilmember Brown. So that's where we're at with the process. We can go ahead and uh, move forward with the motion and then try to get to the other stuff at this point. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember I'm just Matthews. wondering if we, we can separate some of the different yeah. pieces yeah, of this that. so that we can yeah, vote absolutely. on. Because I think there's a lot of things that we agree on, there's some things that we disagree sure. on, and maybe we can let's use that as an approach to come to some kind of consensus on this. All for it. Okay, do we want to take your motion piece by piece? Well, uh, yes, and I'm going to ask the director to help me. So what I'm looking at here particularly is the uh, page labeled administrative policy procedure. It says policy, um, and then it quotes below the municipal code 
0.011. And then there's also another thing that says draft council policy 7.1. And you have told me that they accomplish the same thing, but much of the wording is kind of different. Am I? The and, and then let me just say my other yeah. question, because I know where I want to go with this. <laughs> and then there is a second page after the municipal code is quoted. And maybe that's quoted just as a reference there. I don't know. Then there's the procedure, which gives the operational criteria for closing. And that's important to um, incorporate. The policy says that the Parks and Rec director, and this is existing policy, am I correct? This is draft policy draft that we brought policy. to the city council tonight yeah. that we are committing to put forth regardless of what mechanism council uh, directs us um, uh, to codify, be it the, count, the council policy or the ordinance update. Okay. So the proposed policy is that Parks and Rec director and or his or her designee shall adhere to the following guidelines when exercising authority established by the municipal code regarding parks and facility hours. The director and or his or designee shall utilize the following criteria to assess the need to restrict hours and or close a park or facility. And then you go to the next page, which is the procedure and that gives the criteria, that's where it talks about um, they may exercise this authority after evaluating these criteria and then they notify us um, within 24 hours of an emergency, within seven days of a planned closure. Uh, we're discussing the uh, 21 days. Um, but this authority rests with the Parks director or their designee based on operational criteria, which can be capital improvement projects, it can be maintenance projects, it can be environmental criteria, criteria sensitive habitat, restoration, protection of watersheds, and then a whole bunch of public safety criteria, including um, um, pre preservation of public assets, uh, seize or prevent activities which cause damage or harm, protection of the general public to physical, environmental, and health hazards created by illegal activity. Those are the ones on which I believe you have closed the restrooms at Loudon Nelson based on these criteria for an indefinite period of time. Um, and um, I, I favor moving that policy and that procedure. And I think the, um, the top, the language at the top of the procedure says, if that closure is going to last for more than the immediate period, 21 days or more, then you would notify the council and the commission and presumably the general public. We can put that in there. Um, um, and as I would prefer it, then a council member has the ability to request that be agendized, but not every single time everything is closed, whether it's operational, environmental, public safety, does it get agendized. I think that would bog down our agendas, even on consent, unnecessarily. So I, I favor being notified with the option of agendizing it, but, but leaving okay. the jurisdiction to the officer. Uh, okay, Councilmember Brown. Um, is it possible to get any information, clarity on how often parks are, or facilities are closed for more than 21 days? Just asking because uh, my understanding um, is that based upon some con broader conversations by members of the community um, with parks maintenance staff, that 14 days seem to be uh, an amount of time that they considered generally to be able to get certain maintenance work done, particular work done, that that was a reasonable amount of time. We're talking about 21 days here. Um, how often, I, I mean, I just don't see us, I guess I'm asking, just in speaking to the question of getting bogged down, um, we're not <laughs> talking about every closure, we're talking about more than 21 days. I don't know offhand we could get that information though. I think it's been a, <clears throat> um, a couple of times this year uh, off the cuff, but mm -hmm. I can get that information. 
I guess I'll just maybe add that. I think I appreciate the intention behind the, the effort and I also kind of understand the concern with the potential, um, if, if, if it is a possibility of getting kind of bogged down or removing your discretion. I think, I think if there's a, um, a major decision in regards to a facility that's gonna be longer, I think that would be something that the council would want to know about and be able to do something about. So I think, I mean, I, I wonder how we can kind of, I come to a con consensus here to sort of move this along knowing that I think we want to be responsive to the community and make uh, decisions if we need to um, based on a potential closure while not having to um, kind of affirm everything that comes through that we know is your responsibility. So uh, Council Member, I'll go ahead and say, well, first we have Council Member Glover and then I'll go ahead and come back to Vice Mayor Cummings. Um. Do you have the information as to those alternative suggestions that were brought by the community advocates? Yeah, I don't have the list with me per se, but um, I was talking to Rabbi Posner a minute ago about the suggestions and we did meet, we met a couple times, they had a variety of suggestions. And one thing that we were discussing that we failed to put in our presentation tonight, but it was included in our presentation with the commission on July 1st, um, are, are those steps, the steps that we took um, even before I met with Rabbi Posner and Robert Norse and, and um, and uh, other folks, um, we took steps um, into account and put those in place leading up to the decision to limit access to the Loudon Nelson restrooms in 2018. And I don't want to speak out of turn, I'll invite Isis to come up to speak to this, but a lot of those recommendations, those creative recommendations about having a check-in and check-out process, um, having a restroom attendant, um, we have done these things at Loudon Nelson. And so it wasn't a decision where we got to 2018 and we said, oh, it's bad, let's close it. We took every possible step we could to address these issues, uh, offering services to people uh, who needed them at the community center, even bending um, you know, some of our typical policies about allowing people to keep things there at the community center so that they had um, uh, you know, resources or ability to help themselves in, in restroom. So we took a variety of tactics, a lot of which uh, were recommended uh, by Rabbi Posner, and we have done those and did not see success with those. And so that's what led us to um, what, again, is kind of a rare situation of, of closing or limiting access. And, and what we see is a pretty extreme uh, situation. But I'll have Isif uh, speak to that if, if you don't mind. Um, prior to my taking over the position, uh, Rachel Kaufman, who's now the superintendent, uh, was the supervisor and um, had taken measures uh, in response to this, the same type of activity and conditions that I described. Um, those actions included in the installation of security cameras, which were installed at both ends of the hallway to try to identify or see where the problems were originating. Um, unfortunately, that didn't. The, the cameras didn't go inside the restroom, so that didn't, that didn't prove effective. Um, we also, a, hot, a ranger was uh, assigned to the center um, Monday through Saturday, 8.30 to 3.30, which is kind of a bulk of our hours, not, not our hours entirety, uh, in entirety. Um, we also had a first alarm guard that was hired for a period of time that was there during similar hours, also going back and forth and being a visual presence of, you know, th this activity is not allowed here. Um, they had uh, staff, they had attendants, staff attending both restrooms at, at one point even doing sort of limited bag checks. Nobody was reaching into somebody else's bag, but kind of open and let us see what's in there. Um, that did not curb the behavior entirely. Um, and then also there were periods of times when they did close or restrict the restroom for periods of times in which it did end the behaviors, but as soon as the restrooms opened up again, the behaviors quickly returned. Um, so uh, limiting the access in the manner that we have um, with the keypads was sort of a last resort. And I should also mention, um, we initially closed the restrooms at the very end of February. I think it was February 26, uh, 2018. We didn't put the keypads in until June of that year. During that time, we had um, individuals who wanted access to the restroom had to come and get a staff member. That staff member had to stop what they were doing and go um, let the individuals in, keep the restrooms open, kind of hang out to make sure the activities weren't, weren't going on. 
um, which proved to be incredibly taxing on the staff, uh, taking away from their, their regular jobs, um, and also emotionally taxing for them um, as well. Um, and in, in addition, there, I, there was data I wanted to just mention, and, and that can be provided at a later date. Prior to my being there, Rachel had started a log that um, was, and I do have it here, I can reference it if you want it, but I could probably also provide a digital copy. But there was a log of all the, the illegal activities that were happening in the, in the center and the park um, with dates and times, and it captured about a year. Um, it was the winter of 15 to the winter of 16, um, in which many, many of the, the illegal activities were occurring in the restrooms. Um, that wasn't in, that time frame wasn't in. Um, Mr. Norse had, has done a um, public records request before asking for data on this sort of thing, and that time period wasn't included in his request. So I don't believe that document went out. Um, and it was a couple years ago. It was before I took over. Um, and then I unfortunately didn't realize that that log was, when I, when I started, I didn't realize that log had existed and it took a while for me to realize that that was a necessary item and would have been a great idea for me to pick up right away. Unfortunately, I didn't. And so there during, it was at the end of my first year there that that decision was made, but. Thank um, you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, then I would, uh, I would make because I don't, I just don't like where this is going with the language and stuff that was in the original motion. Uh, and my ultimate goal is to open bathrooms. And we have an organization or a group that's focused on analyzing and looking at issues like bathrooms and ideally could open up a larger conversation around it. So I'm really tempted to make a substitute motion, um, which I think I will uh, make a substitute motion, which would be to amend the uh, council policy 7.1 with the recommended language except for the um, change that was suggested by Vice Mayor Cummings, which would be that if there is a plan to close the bathroom for 21 days or more, it would have to come to the council for authorization first. Okay, so there's a substitute motion by uh, Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's a second by Councilmember Crone. We'll now go ahead and debate whether or not we want to accept the substitute motion at this time so we can um, tailor our debate and our conversation around that. Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Brown. So I actually had gone over item seven to make some, because I think that I found an area that might be um, an area of consensus for us, which would be that. Um, are you just, sorry, just to pause, are you discussing the first motion or the second motion? The or you first. have another motion? No, 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 it's the first, well, it's... The original motion the original made by motion. council. The original motion, yes, correct. Okay, we'll go ahead. That's going to be, if we don't uh, support the substitute motion, then we'll return back to, this, to the original motion for debate. I think then this would apply to the second motion since it's going to be based on the language that I provided. So would that be appropriate I'm to looking, discuss? Okay, city so attorney says yes. So in the... Initially, when I provided this, you know, it was broadly for um, emergency and when there's closures for more than 21 days. But I think more specifically what this was, this language was trying to get at, and I think would be most applicable, is for when there's emergency closures. Because when there's an emergency closure, if the park or facility is going to remain closed for more than 21 days after an emergency, then it should come back to the city council so that we can provide approval for, because if it's an emergency, ideally we would, the expectation would be that it would be something that would be resolved in a timely manner or quickly. If, it's, if they're unable to resolve it in 21 days, then I think that should come back to the council um, so that we can either provide approval on consent or if there's a need for discussion. For items that um, are planned, like if it's going to be a planned closure and we know that it's going to be for a long duration of time and it's more than 21 days, I think that getting updates and feedback on that is fine because if it's a restoration project that we know is going to last six months, we don't need to have to make a decision every 21 days as to maintain, keeping that program going. But I do think that, um, so I think that if it's planned, Having an update every 21 days is fine. If it's an emergency, I think it would be appropriate that if it's going to last more than 21 days, that it come back to city council for approval, whether that be consent or on um, public hearing. Okay. 
I appreciate your rationale. Um, Direct response. Well, I want to go ahead and um, I, I'm going to look to our city attorney here on this one. I'm a bit confused in terms of the interpretation that you have of his modification of the original kind of motion. We have a second motion. I thought what was going to be suggested was a friendly amendment to the substitute motion. So I, so I, I think we really should be talking now about the substitute motion. I agree. Okay, so if, if we could appreciate your rationale, uh, can you please repeat your substitute motion so we're able to understand what you're describing? If there's an amendment, then we could discuss that at this time. Substitute motion was to uh, adopt staff recommendation of amending policy 7.1 with the provided language with the change that if a uh, facility is going to be closed for more than 21 days and it sh uh, must come to council for authorization. Now, um, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, I, I can appreciate what you're uh, trying to do, except the only concern I have there is that uh, if there is a planned closure and we just receive a memo about it, but we don't have the ability to take action to direct staff to do something to provide additional bathroom services for the location, then it's gonna take an additional at least two weeks if we immediately put it on the next agenda after we receive that memo to then be able to give direction to provide additional bathroom services. Okay, we'll go ahead and have you respond and then I know Councilmember Myers has been waiting to have I was just gonna say that if we were- And Councilmember Brown as well. She if we res oh, sorry. Go ahead and you can respond. If we receive that memo from the Parks and Rec Director at that point in time, we can agendize it if it's worth mm -hmm. pushing against city staff. Point in time. Sorry? Which point in time? If we receive the memo, days or the if we receive time. the memo of 21 days, like there's a product that's gonna occur that's gonna be longer than 21 days. At the point in time when we understand that this, pro this project's coming forward, we can make recommendations or changes. When we get, receive any updates, we can, we can agendize it and make any recommendations or changes. So I don't see how that inhibits us from actually taking action on anything that might be coming forward. But if they have a planned capital project that is planned to take, I don't know, 21 days or something, and it's just a planned capital project that they've had on their calendar forever, and they're going to do it, and then they come and just say, hey, we're going to do this project with a 21-day closure, then it will require us getting on the immediately into the next agenda to be able to discuss and make that change. My experience thus far with getting things immediately on the next agenda is not very positive. So the, the re, I mean, it puts a lot of trust in the hands of those that are making the agenda and based off of the rationale that I have heard multiple times when trying to agendize things that are urgent and need immediate attention is that in adding it to the agenda, we're going to either knock other things off or we're going to uh, make the meetings go super long. So we risk that pushback if they come forward with that notice that's going to be 21 days or more when it's just a notice because then we have to go through the entire process of agendizing instead of requiring them to give us an agendized notice so that we can look at it and say, oh, they're gonna do a project for 21 days? Okay, it's a planned project, that's wonderful, but what are we gonna do to address it? So then we don't have to reactionarily knee-jerk response when it's just an emergency or a planned thing. You know, do you get what I'm saying? So it sounds to me like you're not accepting the friendly amendment. I think well, that's I'm trying to talk. I'm trying to talk it through with my colleague to make sure that we're on the same page before I accept it, or to see if he uh, shares my concerns about the potential uh, difficulty of getting something on agenda in a timely manner uh, when we receive the notice from the Parks and Rec Department. I'm going to go ahead and have Councilmember. You can think about how you want to respond if you want to respond. Councilmember Myers has been waiting, and then Councilmember Brown. Uh, I think I think I'm just gonna pass. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna pass. Okay, <laughs> Councilmember Brown, and then we can go ahead and see if we want to just take the vote on the substitute motion at this point. Councilmember Brown. Yeah. Uh, um, so I guess I I just want to, at least from my perspective, add a point of clarification in making, you know, in in say, saying that I want to support the. Um, the council receiving uh, a request when for these longer term closures in no way suggests that I, my intention is to want to usurp the authority of our parks 
director or the parks department. Um, this is simply a matter of wanting to have a, a built-in opportunity to weigh in. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to think of uh, an instance where I would disagree with the parks director's uh, recommendation on this. It's simply a matter of kind of, because as we know, it can be difficult to get things agendized. It can be, it, we also, I mean, it's not just a matter of um, it being difficult it's a matter of it being difficult for us to track these things and what if we're busy and you know it, if it just comes onto the consent agenda even i don't see why it's such a big deal to um just include that language that um uh vice mayor cummings initially included and i think um council member glover was picking up on and i i don't necessarily think the distinction between emergency and planned um will it makes that much of a difference. So I think it would just be, uh, I would, uh, my preference would be for it to be just a standard practice for closures of more than 21 days. Okay, I'll just say, I think that, um, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to see if the staff wants to weigh in in terms of their professional opinion on this, but my, my feeling is there are a lot of things that the council wants to do. And of course we want to be responsive when we need to be responsive and to balance um, the policy decisions that we want to make within a, a meeting and having a process with meetings that um, allows us to do that and have our discretion for our executives that we have in these positions to help us navigate that feels comfortable for me. I, um, I do have concerns that um, past council decisions or actions or mandates in terms of timelines or potential upcoming timelines will make it very difficult to, for me or anybody who's in this position, not necessarily myself, um, to have uh, ability to manage the meetings. So I, um, you know, I have hesitation. I know that we talked about that earlier. That's my opinion about it. I think I share the sentiment that we don't want to catch the community off guard. We want to be responsive. If there's something that needs to be attended to or there needs to be a different path, we want to be responsive to that. And um, I struggle with how to make that manageable given all the other policy direction and interests that I know we all share in wanting to accomplish to do city business. So I support the modified recommendation for an emergency personally, but the motion before, or the substitute motion before us is not to include that language, but to have all items before us. So I think we've heard, if there's any additional comments, we can vote on the substitute motion. I'll just make one, one additional comment is that, you know, since this is gonna be, I'm comfortable with leaving the original language and then just seeing how this plays out. And if we need to revisit it, then I think that that would be most appropriate. So I'm gonna um, accept the substitute motion and so we can continue moving on and we will see how this all plays out. What is the That's substitute motion now? The substitute motion, we'll have you go ahead and repeat the substitute. Oh, third time's a charm. The substitute motion is to move forward on uh, amending council policy 7.1 with the recommended language from the uh, Parks and Rec Department with the exception and the change that it would require all closures of 21 days or more to come before the council for authorization. Okay. Okay. And that was seconded by Council Member Cone, Council Member Matthews. And so let me just ask now, um, does that mean from this point forward? Uh, I, I definitely want to support the existing policy at Loudon Nelson. Does this mean, does this meeting constitute that action? Does it mean that we will now have a meeting on the closure of the bathrooms at Loudon Nelson and an open space here and a something over here that's gonna last for more than 21 days. And some of the closures last for a really indefinite period of time. Um, so okay, well, I don't I think have this a, is taking us down a path that's okay. not workable. We have um, Tony Elliott, we'll have uh, Drew, uh, Council Member Glover and then Council Member Brown. Yeah, just to add one other nuance and layer to this, I think the 21 days, um, I'm thinking back to the month of July when Council was on recess, I think, um, I'm gonna struggle to be a wordsmith here off the off the, the cuff, but I think some language like 21 days or the soonest council meeting or something like that so that we can have that flexibility to come back so we're not calling a, uh, an emergency meeting in July, for example. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes, um, I, I, I believe I have to look back at the original 
a gender report, but something along those lines, absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to uh, emphasize, since there was that question from Councilmember Matthews about uh, what does that mean for the community center, I just wanna acknowledge that uh, Councilmember Brown said before we move on past the policy language is addressing the issue of the London Nelson Center specifically with regards to the functionality and the policy that's associated with it, am I correct? Yeah, I was hoping that we could take care of this item, this piece of the action that we're gonna be taking tonight move for request for closures moving forward and then go back to, because we also have other recommendations from the Parks and Rec Commission that were not included in your motion, but were included in Council Member Matthews' motion. I mean, right. there's a lot more that, to get okay. through. Exactly. So, um, well, uh, this I th am seeing as for moving, for prospective. Council Member Myers, and then we'll go ahead and see if we can make, take them. So I, I, I'm trying to understand how this will work. Um, since it sounds like council will then be in charge of making the authorization for something that's gonna be 21 days or longer, um, what are our procedures? What are our reasons for closing or accepting or not closing a park? So I think the strength of what the Parks Commission, um, and we've had great uh, reports by commissions all day long, which we've approved, um, but I worry that we now, I don't know, Tony, if we would need to define a procedure for city council's um, uh, procedures in terms of how we are going to determine what a, versus the parks director, which is, uh, would be a typical pathway um, with the water director, the public works director, um, I'm just trying to think of sort of how we typically would, uh, you know, uh, allow a director to, to determine these things. So I'm just curious, um, for example, I'm not sure why, how I would determine whether a, a park should be closed or open after, on day 22. So that's one thing I'm trying to figure I, out procedurally. I, I think that's a good question. Um, just going back to the recommendation of the Parks and Rec Commission mm -hmm. was to create a set of health, safety, and environmental conditions under which the director has discretion. Um, to close a facility. I don't think that the commission was contemplating the, that the council um, create those standards at this meeting um, probably would be appropriate to direct staff to come back with a recommended set of conditions and, and uh, uh, under which the director would have that discretion. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. And Thanks. We'll just to them. address that, uh, just to address that last question, um, uh, I I feel like we as uh, elected officials on the dais are charged with uh, being representative of our community and taking into consideration the situations that are brought forward by our directors and our staff, weighing them against our own uh, compasses for lack of a better word, as to what it is that we need to do. And then, by all means, like I believe Councilman Brown said, I doubt that there will be a time when I disagree with Director uh, Elliott with regards to the necessity of closing a bathroom, but in having the awareness that there will be a bathroom closure for more than 21 days gives us the opportunity as elected officials to reallocate other resources to be able to accommodate the loss of that bathroom, as well as adequately communicate it to our uh, residents who may not have direct access to, say, a newsletter from the city council and communicate that to them. Say, oh, this bathroom's gonna be closed. Here is a, a emergency services area that was created by the city council so that you don't need to do this. It's no way questioning the validity or the professionalism of Director Elliott. It is to give us an additional tool because I believe that this spurs from a history, and this is before Director Elliott's time, of the closure, the sporadic closure of public facilities without explanation, without authorization from the city council, and that has had a detrimental effect disproportionately on people experiencing homelessness or the poor. So we're doing this to add a layer of security for our community members to feel that there is that transparency and the accountability for when facilities are closed. <laughs> All right, I, you know, I think this process is iterative. I think that we had a recommendation that was vetted by our um, staff and our planning commission, I mean, our um, Parks and Rec Commission that was supported unanimously. So I, I stand on sort of going in that direction and then hopefully 
refining along the way, not knowing that and kind of just jumping right into this new direction I don't feel comfortable with personally so that I won't be supporting the substitute motion, but we can go ahead and move motion, on. And motion to call the question. Or? Okay, there's a motion to call the call question. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we're going to go ahead and call the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings voted in support. Uh, Matthews, uh, Myers, and myself voting against. Now you may proceed to vote on the substitute motion. Okay, mo Okay. all those in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Brown, uh, Crone, Glover, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting in support, Councilmember Matthews, Myers, and myself. Oh, I am really against. concerned. Okay, wait, 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 we're going to go ahead and pause. We have Councilmember Brown, um, and then I believe we have Vice Mayor Cummings, and then we'll go to you. I just, I was hoping to clarify before, but since the question was called and, and there wasn't an opportunity that we're not just talking about bathrooms here, the, the policy is related to park and public facilities yeah. overall. So it's not specifically it's bathrooms. Any of these <laughs> criteria. Okay, so do um, Count, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Matthews. I was gonna move um, the other items that we didn't move in that go, motion, so. Go ahead. Um, creating a set of health and safety and environmental conditions under which the director has discretion to close either partially or entirely park, open space, or facility. Notify the commission and city council within 24 hours. And I guess that's part of the last motion. Um, work with the county health services agency on addressing syringe litter as well as public urination and defecation in parks and open spaces. Second. So, okay, so we have a motion for um, essentially item number four since items one through three in that list had already been previously addressed in the prior action. Is that correct? It wasn't clear if item one was. So, I mean, if. Okay. You, item one was. I'm sorry. One, two, and four were not. My understanding is that items two, two and three, and three have been already addressed. Mm -hmm. So you're making a motion to approve items one and four at this right. time. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember, Vice Mayor Cummings, second by Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion? Councilmember Matthews. Uh, we're talking one and four? One and four. I'm fine with those. I have a question about something else. Okay, so all those, oh, Councilmember Myers. I have a question. I just wanna make sure for um, Director Elliott, the operation of the criteria that's on the procedure, is that was that meant to address number one or? I'm sorry, please remind me what number one so, is. Oh, one is uh, creating a set of health, safety, and environmental conditions under which the director. And Correct. That would be this page so here. That is the procedure that is part of the packet on page one, one point ten. Correct. Yep. Okay. So I just want to make sure. Okay, all those in favor, please. Oh, did you have a further but question? I, I do just have a, a question because now it says create a, a set of health, safety, and environmental standards on which the director has discretion to close either partially or entirely a park, but we have just taken away his discretion. So it's, it's essentially item four is sort of what my understanding is, is that that's not necessarily applicable at this point. So we're gonna- Weirdly. Go, okay, so we're gonna go ahead with um, Councilmember Glover, but my understanding, if you want to modify the motion to be item just simply number four, since item number one is basically um, kind of already been discussed as most of those are going to come to the council directly. Uh, Which, the, um, so thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that the director only has to come to authorization to close things if it's going to be more than 21 days. So that means... Was I at? So that uh, that would suggest that the health and safety guidelines that are at his or at the director's discretion to close a uh, facility is between zero and twenty days without authorization. So I don't understand why there is a concern with regard to taking that ability away only after the 21st day or the anticipated closure of the 21st day is there to be a authorization granted by the city council. 
Yeah, and again, the APO is just the procedure. So we would use that guidance, whether it's zero to 20 days or 21 or more, we would use that same guidance. And what we could do is a follow up to, uh, since it's uh, an administrative procedure order, typically we would do those uh, in house. We would craft the, those criteria. And so what we could do to follow up on that. Um, and again, I mentioned that we're already committed to doing that to lend to the transparency. We could provide that back to the city council um, in the form of a memo or something, just so you're all aware of those criteria. Again, that would apply to zero to 20 or, or beyond. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cummings. My understanding was with moving item number one was that the, the APO, and I'm sorry, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but administrative, administrative, procedure. administrative procedure order, that that doesn't exist right now. And so creating that set of health, safety, and environmental standards is what we also need to direct that the Parks and Rec director do. Okay. So that's why I'm, I'm moving mm -hmm. those yeah. two items. One and four. Okay, Councilman Brown. I, since it came up, I, I mean, I assume that the council would use the same guidelines for making our decisions. Um, but to, for the sake of clarity, could we just say, create a, a set of health, safety, and environmental conditions under which the director and or city council has discretion to close either partially or entirely a park, open space, or facility for number one. Accepted. Any further discussion? Sorry, no, it's okay. So it's the director or the council. Or the council or would yeah, be the and I and or council. Yeah, or oh, council. Okay, that makes sense given the prior uh, direction. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, uh, council, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember uh, Glover, and the Councilmember Brown, I think. Okay, go ahead. I know that there's a lot of issues around bathrooms in the city. And so um, I think that we here at City Hall also need to do our part. And so I'm gonna move that we reopen the public bathrooms at City Hall during business hours, work with staff to address concerns and provide, have staff provide council with recommendations on what kind of support the council could provide here at City Hall. Second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor coming, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Um, did you have any additional comments you were next? Uh, my issue is uh, with bathrooms in general and especially Lendon Nelson, but not wanting to uh, disregard the concerns that were expressed by the teen center as well as the staff. Uh, so uh, I would, I mean, do we want to send it to review from the catch, which has been requested by some folks? We deal the first look we, we can do that. I mean, although we could add it, but either way, but um, okay, otherwise we'll do it separately. Okay, we'll go ahead and. Um, wait on that as a potential decision make, but we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Council Member Glover. Council Member Matthews? I don't remember. I've, did you have your hand up, Council Member Brown? No, Council Member Matthews. Yeah. Uh, would you, uh, we have been down this path before, would you um, be willing to put a um, fairly short timeline for report back on our experience? Sure. Um, this I would say a month. If it's a short. It's just a memo. There's just it's a short what, turnaround. Yeah. I mean, I think that we get report backs from the library on what they're experiencing. I think that it's fair that we get report backs on what's happening here at City Hall, and we can assess um, how the bathroom opening is doing. All right, Councilmember Brown. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just want to say that I I support that, and um, and I mostly because I really do, you know, and I want to acknowledge that this is, I do see this as a workplace issue, and I believe that, um, you know, that our staff should have the ability to weigh in about their experience, and and we need to take that seriously. Uh, we need to take that as seriously as we take any other um, expression of concern, if not more, um, because these are the people who actually keep these facilities running. So I, I just think that that it is a balance and I'm interested in trying to expand access to facilities. I know it's, uh, many people have talked to me about how it's an issue here when they come to do business. And so I support the motion um, and um, you know I just wanna be clear that the decisions that I'm making are I certainly not intended to um, put staff in um, difficult positions. And, and so we, we want to make sure, I want to make sure that we work with you to do it in a way that's 
acceptable. Okay. So we have a motion. I, um, I, I share that interest in hearing from staff. I, I prefer to hear that before making a policy decision one way or another, so I won't be supporting the motion before me at this time. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover in support. Matthews, Myers, and myself voting Actually against. Actually voted for it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Councilmember Matthews voting in support. Myers and myself voting against. Okay. Do we have any other potential... Councilmember Glover. Thank you. I'd uh, like to make a motion to refer the issue of bathroom access uh, with a priority at uh, Loudon Nelson uh, to the catch for review and report back. We have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? One second. Okay, second by Vice Mayor Cummings. I want to add, I would like to add, ask for a friendly amendment that we also have them consider additional locations in the downtown where porta potties, porta lets may be installed and a report back when appropriate. Absolutely, could we expand it from porta potties and porta lets to potentially permanently located 24 hour bathrooms like Portland Loos and stuff like that just to explore it? Oh. Excellent, uh, accepted. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I see, I don't know if city manager Martin Bernal wants to weigh in. Yeah, I was gonna say that the, I think it's anticipated that the cash will look at uh, both hygiene and storage sites uh, as a policy decision. So I think that would be appropriate to give direction to look at you know the issue of hygiene um, and all its various components as well as storage. Um, so you could direct that. I mean, it's anticipated the, the cash meets on Tuesday. Uh, and then in addition, um, if you wanted them to make it a, a, a priority as far as the uh, first phase of their work, that's anticipated to be completed by December. So that's direction you could also provide. Councilmember Myers, and then can you repeat? I'm. What's the was motion? There a, yeah, I don't know what the motion is. The motion is to refer for catches review the issue of bathrooms and hygiene, uh, and to explore the potential placement of porta potties, portalets, or alternative uh, hygiene facilities like the Portland Loos. And, and what was the friendly? It was that in? Was that in? Where is this in parks? Is this down? I, I, are we really voting on something that's actually agendized right now? Because is, is this just going to the catch? What is yes. going to them? Yes, the, the, well, I think the, the motion is intent is to have the cash look at the issue of hygiene uh, in the city uh, and hygiene needs, which How would How do include we get from a parks closure to, I mean, this seems like a, I'm confused on where we are because um, I'm trying to understand where all this is all going right now. Um, if I can, it yeah. seems that you're asking, are you asking a legal clarification question and I'll look for our city attorney to respond to that. Yes, I am thinking that the direction can be given to bring this back to the council for consideration uh, um, as opposed to referring it to the catch at this point. Because it's not on your agenda. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've gone into actually public hygiene and public restrooms, and our agenda item is not that. So, okay, I'm just curious. How so the clarification is that we are unable to make a direct referral as a policy decision before us tonight, but the potential solution or, or outcome could be that we have a future agenda item brought before the council for us to consider this being directed to the cash at a future time. Is that reflect what you, your legal interpretation, Tony? Yes. Okay. Okay, we have Councilmember Brown, Glover, and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, well, I'm definitely not going to dispute um, the advice of our city attorney on this matter, but in terms of how it's connected, my sense was because one of the items on this agenda was related to the Loudon Nelson bathroom, mm -hmm. the discussion, so I mean, we could make a motion to um, refer to the catch that's only the Loudon Nelson bathroom and we can't talk about others, and but that would be okay. I just wanna see, because to me it makes sense to just say, okay, Loudon Nelson and more broadly, and if that's not okay, then we'll, we yeah, can just I'm, do Loudon Nelson. I'm persuaded by that argument. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Matthews. Uh, Glover. Oh, Glover. Oh, sorry, Council Member. Vice Mayor Cummings and Council Member. That was gonna be my comment, was that 
I think the initial motion was to send the bathroom topic to the catch. And I was just adding that we consider other potential locations as well, so. Right. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and then just the logic to kind of riff off my colleagues and what they're talking about is, since it specifically talked about public facilities, I was assuming that public facilities meant all public facilities, uh, which included bathrooms and access to bathrooms. And since we're not talking about uh, bathrooms as a whole with regards to parks, because as Park says, that's not their purview, but there is the topic of bathrooms on here, then um, sending the topic of bathrooms to catch with some uh, specific areas of interest that we'd like for them to explore was the rationale behind the, the motion. Yeah, I understand. And I also, I, I think just, based on the discussions that the council's had with regard to park facilities over the past several months, um, the, the topic of access to bathrooms has been a big part of that. Thank you, so we'll stick with the same oh, I, motion. I, I, I stand motion, corrected. The motion okay, is. Okay, the motion, do you wanna restate the motion? Uh, to send the topic of bathrooms and hygiene to catch uh, uh, and ask them to explore potential solutions for locations for bathrooms in the downtown area, like port potties port loos or the portland Lou model of 24-hour access bathrooms. Was there a friendly amendment that was not? That's okay. That's a, okay. Okay, uh, Councilor Matthews. So there's no reference to Loudon Nelson in that? Not in that one specifically. Uh, I, we could prioritize the London Nelson Community Center for immediate opening with the solutions, but I'd like to have Catch give a holistic view because if they recommend giving uh, or establishing alternative bathroom places to deal with the concerns that are being uh, mentioned by the staff at London Nelson and the director not wanting to cross uh, young teens with potentially uh, to potential situations, um, then we, I, we should honor that and uh, not force the Loudon Nelson, London Nelson situation, but have a larger conversation about bathrooms uh, in the interim. At least we have the city hall ones open. I guess I'll just weigh in a little bit. One thing that I would say is that part of what I understand the cash's purpose is, is to explore existing documents that are helping them understand sort of the scope of what's been explored prior recommendations. And I believe that actually includes bathrooms. So I think this is within their existing scope of work. Um, so I think if anything, it's just sort of reiterating our interest in hearing their opinion on their existing kind of charge in regards to how um, the bathroom uh, challenges could be resolved personally. So it seems re sort of reiterating our interest in maybe making that a priority if they have any recommendations uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. I think that's appropriate for cash to deal with the bathrooms and hygiene uh, uh, needs and resources. Uh, I don't think it should be restricted to downtown. We've got Harvey West, we got Eastside, we got all over the city, we have these issues. So uh, I think that reference as a clean reference is entirely appropriate. Okay, so if, if, if you would amend your motion in that direction. I would accept that. Okay, okay, sounds like we have an amended motion to include all restroom access throughout the city. Okay, all those in favor, Councilmember Brown. Just a quick, um, request that one, um, I believe uh, that um, our city manager suggested hygiene storage. So the package. whole, pack, the whole yeah. package, yeah. is that okay? Bathroom's yeah. hygiene, yeah. And um, that, it, that we, and, and again, this may just be a reiteration, but I think it's, it's worth just saying, that letting the catch know that this is a priority for the council. Um, I see a hand up over there. No, I, 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 I can, no. Sorry, we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Um, but I, I, but I, the other point that um, our city manager made was um, suggesting that it be included in the first round of recommendations. So and I'm happy to include that as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, absolutely. Did you get that? Does that make sense? <laughs> can, I, can I get a, who was the second? Vice Mayor Cummings was the second. And we're looking for that to be, if they have an outcome or as soon as possible, that priority. That was sort of the last comment. Okay, all those, oh, Council Member Crone. Would you take it also as a friendly amendment that the catch looks into the use of volunteer, uh, you know, oversight of, of bathroom facilities? Yes, I think staffing in general and all creative uh, opportunities there, but 
uh, if you would prefer to include um, intentional uh, exploration of volunteer services, then we could include that. Thanks. Is that accepted by the seconder of the motion? Okay. Okay. Councilor Matthews? I prefer to keep it clean. There are all sorts of ideas. Okay. So was, the, but it was a friendly amendment that was accepted to also include them explore with volunteers, which is probably also within the scope, but that's, okay. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, no. that, okay that passes with Councilmember Myers voting again. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I'd like to know what's gonna happen at Loudon Nelson now. I feel strongly, so strongly, that the safety of the program participants at Loudon Nelson, based on decades of experience, um, needs to be preserved with the policies that are currently in effect, period. Do you want to make that into a motion? If that's a pending I question. don't know. We need that we, uh, at this point, endorse the uh, continuation yeah. of the ongoing uh, policy at Loudon Nelson. Is that a motion? It is. Okay. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. Vice Mayor Cummings. My understanding is that currently the policy is still in effect since this is all going to go to the catch for recommendations and so that we weren't going to do take any action on Loudon Nelson this evening. That was my understanding with the previous I, motion that I, we didn't, we're not going to do anything at this moment in time with Loudon Nelson and that. Does it hurt to just affirm it? I think there's a lot of question out there. Yeah. Ed's nodding, yeah, a lot of concern. We, yeah, sure. What was the motion? That we yeah. affirm the continuation of the current policy regarding the access to restrooms at Loudon Nelson. Okay, so that was the motion by Councilor Matthews. I seconded that. Any further discussion? <laughs> Councilor Glover. I'm just, you know, uh, I'll support it. It's just, uh, I'm just concerned because it doesn't address the issue of access to bathrooms that is currently being faced by people at that community center, but it's something that we're currently working on. We're making motion, we've, we're opening up the ones here, so it's good. I'm just going to just express it that I'm still concerned about the lack of bathroom access around the community center, but we can move forward with it. Okay, all those in favor? Can I, I'm Vice sorry. Mayor sorry, I just want to also express that um, I'm actually, I'm going to be really interested to see how the catch works with members of the community, folks at Loudon Nelson, Parks Department, so that we can understand whether or not there's gonna be creative alternatives to providing people with more access around bathrooms. But I'll be supporting this tonight. Councilmember Brown. And I'm just gonna make the comment that um, I'm reading the tea leaves in, from uh, back of the room there that um, there may be requests coming our way for more data to help them, uh, to help the catch members uh, make some decisions or, or kind of go through this process of investigation. And so um, if that request comes, I'd um, hope that we can put it on the agenda and support it or provide support however possible to get that data to them. Just there. Yes, Mayor Cummings. Last comment. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to encourage um, the use of discretion when it comes to allowing people with children, allowing seniors and people with disabilities the ability to use the bathroom because it was mentioned by some members of the public today that um, you know when people are, are unable to, well, when people really need to go to the bathroom and they might have um, medical conditions or they have their company with children and they're trying to take them to the bathroom, that some level of discretion should be used around allowing people to use the bathroom, um, especially in those kinds of circumstances, so that we're not um, putting those people at, in a position where they might have to defecate on themselves. Is that a friendly amendment? Can I speak to that? Yeah. Why don't you come on up? Um, I, I first want to address the situations in, in which parents have been turned away with children. Um, I, I've not been aware of that, but I do fully recognize that with um, new staff, substitute staff that we sometimes have when we're having staff meetings or other things that are, we're not able to have our regular staff up front. Um, or even staff who may be overwhelmed or over, um, 
discomforted by the, the, the situation or the person asking. I recognize that there have been, I'm sure there have been instances where um, somebody that technically should have been gained access wasn't. Uh, likewise, there's been individuals who technically shouldn't have been given access were. Um, it, is, it is extremely challenging for staff to be faced with people who are at times cussing them out, uh, questioning their integrity as human beings, whatnot, instead of just looking at them as someone who's doing their job. Um, but I will have the conversation again with staff, and, new, and we do have new recent staff in, um, and, and really enforce the importance of really sticking to the policy. And that's been my message from day one it's easier said than done with such a large staff, rotating staff, staff that's not even necessarily crossing over because of the length of our, our, our business hours. Um, but I am committed to um, communicating that to, to them again and, and um, getting the message across the importance of, of being fair to everyone. Um, in terms of giving, being able to discern who has a disability or a need greater than someone else, that becomes extremely challenging for, for my staff or anyone to determine. And that's why we do have sort of this um, strict policy about who, who can and can't. We can't look at one person and say, oh, you have a continence issue um, and, and you don't, um, or you have a disability, which we're, you know, we are, discouraged from making that assumption about anyone in the first place. But um, that kind of making a discretion on, on different people really is extremely challenging. And I, I um, while I am totally sympathetic to people that have different physical challenges, um, that is why the policy is so very restrictive is because we can't be put in the position of making those judgments or those calls or those interpretations about people's physical abilities. It sounds to me like until we change the policy, that it makes the most sense. Thank you. Councilmember Crum. But for children? It sounds like that that's something that they're going to look at, how they're going to onboard and train staff to ensure that that's resolved. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Are there any other elements that need to be addressed by the council? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time.